This is The Cowboy's Best Friend Sweetwater Ranch Western Cowboy Romance, Book One Written by Jesse Gussman Performed by Jay Dice Chapter One So, Ames, you gonna go shooting with me? Palmer Olson asked, hooking a thumb into the front pocket of his jeans, his eyes shielded from the North Dakota sun by his cowboy hat. Ames Hansen flashed a quick grin, her mind whirling, already thinking of the race and shoot targets course they'd always used. We racing? she asked. Of course, he replied with the corners of his mouth tilted up and a glance at the two four-wheelers he had out and ready. She needed a head start if she had any hope of beating him. His machine was bigger than hers, although her aim was better. It had been 18 months since she'd seen her best friend. He might fall for the oldest trick in the book. She gasped. Holy smokes, look at that! She pointed at the sky behind him. Is that a bald eagle? She chuckled as he turned, falling for her ruse. There wasn't a cloud in the sky, not a bird either. As soon as he turned, she spun and raced for the four-wheelers. He already had their rifles on the racks, the ammo strapped down beside them. She jumped on hers, started it, and gunned the motor. Behind her, she could hear him shouting, something about not being fair or some such nonsense. What wasn't fair was that he had more power under his seat than she did. That's what wasn't fair. But it was his ranch, his machines. He'd had the same one since before they graduated from high school 11 years ago. She'd actually had the same one as well, his old machine. She couldn't complain. Not every girl was blessed with a best friend whose family owned a thousand-acre ranch in North Dakota. Actually, in all her world travels, she'd never met anyone with that benefit. Palmer was a one-of-a-kind guy and she regretted all the time she'd taken their friendship for granted. He hadn't caught up to her by the time she hit the bend in the road where it cut behind the corral and angled up between two hundred-acre fields. The four-wheeler cornered the turn on two wheels. Ames hunkered down, lowering the center of gravity and leaning her body into the turn. The wide blue North Dakota sky soared above her as she came out of the curve, the road straightening and arrowing off into the flat distance. The ATV bounced back down. She pressed the throttle wide open. After a one-second lag time, the motor screamed and the four-wheeler jumped ahead. Flat rows of flax and a deep green carpet of wheat flew by as she raced up the middle. Tempted to turn and look to see if Palmer was catching her, she kept her gaze straight ahead. As fast as she was going, a little tilt of the wheel could make her spin out of control. Part of going this fast was knowing what boundaries she could push. The wind whipped through her hair and she couldn't keep the happy smile off her face. L.A. was great. Hiking in the Himalayas was fabulous, and winning two Olympic gold medals was awesome, but nothing compared to being home. She heard Palmer before she saw him. He might have a bigger machine, but he was heavier. Actually, now that she thought about it, it looked like he'd gained weight. Not around the middle, but his shoulders were much broader than she remembered, his biceps bigger. She always thought of him as this skinny guy from high school, but as she'd been living her dreams out in the world, he'd been here on the ranch, running it with his brother and sister and obviously doing enough physical labor in the process to add a pile of muscle to his lanky frame. The screaming of his machine grew louder and he crept into her peripheral vision. The road was straight, the ground flat, but at the speeds they were going now, it would be foolish for her to turn her head to see how close he was. Focusing on keeping the handlebars steady, she pressed the accelerator with her thumb, ignoring the burning in the side of her hand. The competitor in her couldn't give up. He was beside her now on the dirt road. She didn't have to turn her head to know what his face looked like. He'd be smiling, of course, but there would also be that little furrow between his brows, the one that he always had when they competed. She'd practiced for hundreds of hours to win the gold in the biathlon at the Olympics, but there was absolutely no question that Palmer was the main reason she stood on the top podium. His face was the one she saw as the flag was raised, and she had her hand over heart as the anthem of her country played. He never gave quarter. Always having the smaller ATV had caused her to become a better shooter. Flat-out racing had improved her concentration and ability to handle her rifle despite the adrenaline coursing through her body. 
What Palmer and she did here on the ranch in the summer wasn't close to an actual Winter Olympic biathlon race where the racers skied to each target that they had to aim at and shoot, although she and Palmer did race on skis when she was home in the winter. They didn't do the shooting the same either, but it didn't matter. Her competitions with Palmer had given her the grit she needed to win. Their makeshift shooting range was just ahead. She crouched behind the handlebars, trying to wring out every ounce of aerodynamics she could. She didn't give an inch when he locked the tires and fishtailed the rear end, stopping right in front of the range. She slid around to a stop right beside him and was only a second behind him, grabbing her rifle and ammo off the rack. They always shot this one in the prone position, wrists not touching the ground. On a good day, she could load her single-shot lever action 22 in 4.3 seconds. Palmer was about two seconds slower. Drawing herself in, calming her muscles and heart, she steadied her breath. At the Olympics, she was never the fastest skier on the course. This is where she made up her time. She could calm her body, and she never missed a shot loading her rifle faster and shooting more accurately than anyone else. She gently squeezed the trigger on the first shot. Fifty meters downrange, in the middle of the green wheat field, her first 4.5-centimeter target disappeared. Four more shots down the other four targets. This wasn't an Olympic race, and as she rose to her feet and raced to her four-wheeler, she gloated at Palmer. Ha! Eat dust, cowboy! Hooking her rifle on, she started her four-wheeler and gunned it toward the next makeshift shooting range. Again, Palmer caught her just before the range, and again she outshot him, this time from a standing position. The targets were slightly bigger, but it never mattered to her. She could hit anything she could see, the first time. The road followed the rectangular field, and she took the last corner on two wheels, heading back toward the barn. Halfway between the corner and the barn, she skidded to a stop at the last homemade shooting range. This time, she'd beaten Palmer there, and that almost guaranteed her win. She kept her concentration, though, as she yanked her rifle out and jumped off the four-wheeler. Palmer skidded to a stop beside her. Close. So close, she thought he was going to hit her, and she committed the cardinal sin. She looked at him. Normally, in any professional race, she wouldn't even acknowledge that she had competitors, she raced like she had blinders on. However, the competitors skied, or a few times she'd competed in the summer equivalent of a biathlon where the competitors jogged. She'd never had to worry about an overeager competitor hitting her with his ATV. Palmer didn't hit her, but the damage was done. It wasn't that she looked at him per se. It was more about what he looked like. His plain white T-shirt clung lovingly to shoulders as wide as cross members on electric wires. His biceps bulged as he grabbed his rifle. His long, jean-clad legs flexed with power and strength as he leaped off the four-wheeler and raced to get in position. He threw himself on the ground, stretched out, rifle ready. Broad shoulders tapered to a narrow waist, and his boots, worn and scuffed, pointed back toward her. He'd long since lost his cowboy hat, and his hair was only slightly longer than the stubble on his face. In those two seconds she looked at him, it hit her for the first time in her life. Palmer was rugged, tough, handsome, attractive. That thought was what made her stumble. It was a rogue. There was no way she could think like that. Palmer was her best friend. She flung herself down on the ground beside him, lifting her rifle, it would take him seven shots to hit the five targets. That meant she had nine seconds on him since she would hit all of hers, and he'd waste those nine seconds reloading twice more than she would have to. Except, she missed. Frustration rocked through her. She missed maybe 5% of her shots. Maybe. On a day she had the flu. Today, with the sun shining down and her in perfect health, she couldn't believe it. It only took her a second to set her jaw and adjust her grip on the rifle. She didn't miss again, but Palmer must not have either, because he rose when she did, his targets all shot down and raced to his machine. They took off together, side by side, and flew wide open the last short distance to the far corral gate, which was always their unofficial finish line. It wasn't enough for him to pull completely ahead of her. His body was even with her front tire, 
So, still holding the throttle wide open, she took her other hand off the handlebars and stretched out over her rifle, leaning forward as far as she could. Her fingertips just passed his handlebars as the gate flew closer. She yelled, I'm first, cowboy! As they flew by it, her fingertips just inching past him. He turned at the sound of her voice. His eyes widened at her position. She probably looked like a bird on a death dive, but it didn't matter because her fingers had crossed the line before any of his body parts. She straightened on her ATV and punched her fist in the air. Yahoo! she cried. Whatever little glitch she had had at the last range was gone, and she turned brilliant eyes to Palmer. His shining blue eyes smiled back at her, even as he shook his head. They hit the brakes, and their machines fishtailed in different directions, coming to a stop facing each other. How many hundreds of times over the years had they done this together? Maybe thousands since she had decided in high school she wanted to compete in an Olympic biathlon. Palmer had never wanted to be anything but a rancher on his grandparents' spread, but he had been more than happy to help her get better. I won, she said triumphantly, just in case he'd missed it. You did not. I was across the line well before you. Maybe, but my fingers broke the plane first, so that makes me the winner. All I had to do was scratch my nose and my elbow would have been ahead of your fingers. She tossed her hair. Maybe you should have had an itchy nose then. Fine. I'll let you say you won, this time. I win every time. No, you don't. I beat you once ten years ago, Squeegee. Oh, he had to break the nickname out. She slapped her handlebars and crossed her arms over her chest. That was the summer I had a broken leg and I let you talk me into racing anyway. I talked you into it because I had a broken leg too. He lowered his head. My broken leg was your fault, Squeegee. Okay, so that was true. She'd thought bungee jumping from the top barn beam was a good idea and she'd talked him into doing it with her, doubles. How was I supposed to know the bungee cords would stretch like that? After they'd been carted off to the hospital, both of them unable to walk, and after the pain meds had kicked in, he dubbed her Squeegee. She thought it was his way of combining squashed and bungee, but she wasn't sure. Sometimes with Palmer, he was better off not knowing. Anyway, he didn't use it all the time, but usually brought it out sometimes to remind her of her own stupidity. She wasn't falling for his mind games. Why did you go along with it? No one made you jump off the top of the roof. Seriously? I was a loyal friend, and now somehow everything is my fault? She tried not to react to the way he said, friend. She'd almost lost this race because of the inappropriate thoughts she'd been having about her, friend. As though he knew she needed a subject change, Palmer could always read her mind. He said, so, you really back for the whole summer? Yep. She kicked her legs up and propped her cowgirl boots on the handlebars, leaning back on her elbows and lifting her face to the big North Dakota sky. There's not a sky in the world that compares to ours. She heard him shift, but he didn't answer. He never seemed to care that she left for long periods of time since they graduated from high school. They texted all the time and FaceTimed weekly. They joked about their Saturday night FaceTime date. She'd been to the Olympics, to the Himalayas, to all 50 states, and to 17 different countries. She'd studied abroad, been runner-up in the Miss North Dakota contest, and worked in the corporate world as a marketing exec. All that time, Palmer had been a rock. Stuck on the farm. Content, apparently, with the short North Dakota summers and long, dark, frigid North Dakota winters. Working at the sea store? he asked after a few minutes of them lying with their faces to the sky. That was the nice thing about Palmer. They didn't need to talk. And it didn't matter how long she'd been gone, they always picked right back up as best friends and buddies. It was never awkward. She wasn't even as close to any of her girlfriends as she was to him. Yeah. Her parents owned the only convenience store in Sweetwater. After coaching the Junior World Biathlon team all winter, she'd applied for and was now on the short list for a plum broadcasting job at a sports channel located in L.A. She'd never lived very long anywhere since she'd left Sweetwater, and she was hoping to get that job and put down roots in the city.
Staying this time? He asked casually. She didn't open her eyes or sit up. They'd talked about it when they were younger, but hadn't had the conversation in a while. The one where he believed she would eventually come back and settle down, and she denied even liking North Dakota, let alone wanting to live here. No way. Her lips turned up in a grin, and she didn't even open her eyes. She knew what it took to set him off. Only he didn't take the bait this time. The silence between them stretched. For the first time ever, she was uncomfortable with nothing between them. Like if she didn't have words to anchor him to her, he'd drift off and she'd lose him. So she opened her mouth. I told you about that job I applied for in L.A. You ready to travel to California? The sun warmed her face and neck. She felt the heat through her jeans. But she felt the silence of her friend even more. Nah, he finally said thinking I'm going to get married. Her eyes popped open. Her heart thudded to a stop, and her lungs froze. She called on her Olympic training to keep from jerking up. Instead, she moved slowly, leveling her gaze at him before dropping her boots to the footrest and sitting up. We text every day, and you didn't mention you had a girlfriend? Why wasn't she happy for him? Her brain felt scrambled, and she couldn't dredge up any good feelings at all. Which was weird, because she'd had two girlfriends in the past ten months announce their engagements, and Ames had been over the moon for them. Why wasn't she happier for Palmer? He hadn't propped his feet up, but he was leaning back on his elbows. His thin white t-shirt allowed her to see, quite plainly, that his abs were well-defined. Her heart did that abnormal flip, and a thread of attraction wrapped around it. He lowered his eyes from the sky and looked at her under hooded lashes. I don't. Her stomach whipped back like she'd been hit in the midsection with a bowling ball. Oh my gosh, you're gay. He grinned, slow and easy, the grin she loved. The one he didn't use on anyone but her. You think? She ran her eyes over his face, down his broad shoulders and deep chest, down to his waist where his jeans sat low on his hips. Her eyes flew back to his. Why was she suddenly breathless? No, I don't. I guess we never talked about that, though. They never talked about relationships. She'd not really had any. One didn't become an Olympic-caliber athlete by hanging out at bars trying to pick up a date. Not that she'd even want to date a guy who didn't have anything better to do with his time. She decided to call his bluff. So you have a boyfriend? Her words didn't come out quite as confident and flippant as she'd wanted them to. He did the slow grin on her again, and her heart flipped twice. When had Palmer gotten so handsome and muscular? Nope. How long has it been since I've been home? Have we started a new tradition in Sweetwater where people just up and get married? It's been 18 months since you were here, he said answering her first question, but leaving her second one unanswered. It had been winter. Palmer would have had a beard, and she probably wouldn't have seen him in anything less than a flannel shirt and lined vest, insulated jeans and boots. And before that, she'd come back for a few quick visits, so it had been years since they'd spent any large amounts of time together. At least five years or more since they'd spent the summer together. And now he goes and ruins it by announcing he was going to get married. You're only 28. He shrugged. How are you getting married when you don't have a girlfriend? He shrugged again, the movements of his muscles under his t-shirt so fascinating she almost missed his answer. Figured you'd help me, Squeegee. Chapter 2 What was a best friend for if not to find a fiancé for him? Palmer grinned at Ames' shocked expression. Over the years, she'd been gone more than she'd been around. That didn't keep him from thinking about her. But he knew himself. He was as deeply rooted in the North Dakota soil as the prairie grass that grew to the west. His Norwegian ancestors had loved this land, worked it, and carved a living from it. He was destined to do the same. At one time, he hoped Ames would be too. Thought maybe she'd settle down after the Olympics. But she hadn't. 
She'd even worked a job in New Jersey for a while. When she quit that, he'd thought she was coming home for good. But she'd just landed for a little while, nursed her bruised feathers, and took off again. Of course I'll help you, she gave her hair a toss. I have at least four friends who will die when they see you. And I can get my college roommate to ask her sister. He held a hand up. Whoa. Her eyes danced, but she clamped her mouth shut. I have some standards, you know. Like I would set my best friend up with just anyone. He raised a brow. He really wasn't sure. Of course, she liked him as a friend, but she'd never cared about his relationships or lack of them. How could he have a relationship when no other woman measured up to his best friend? He grunted and straightened. Come on, I have a couple of cows in the corral I need to throw hay down to. I'll tell you about it then. She wasn't going to believe what he had to tell her anyway. She didn't say anything but started her machine. That was one of the many nice things about Ames. She was competitive, exceptionally competitive, but she wasn't constantly trying to beat him. They'd race, hard and fast. But when they weren't racing, she didn't make all of life into a competition. He'd worked with guys like that, and they were annoying. You only got to live once. Might as well enjoy it. They pulled behind the barn, parking in front of the big double doors. Sure, it had been years since Ames had helped out in the summer, but in high school and even into college, before she went to Germany or wherever, she'd been on the farm a lot of weekends and every summer, as often as she could get out of watching the sea store for her parents. She didn't hesitate, but walked with him to the door and waited while he slid it open. So, what are your stipulations? They're not mine. She laughed. You're getting married according to someone else's stipulations? Kinda. Okay, so now I'm really curious. She set her hands on her slim hips. He figured she'd gained a little weight back from the peak physical condition she'd been in for the last Olympics. Definitely, she wasn't as skinny as she'd been when she'd been runner-up in the Miss North Dakota contest. She had a few more curves. He didn't care. It didn't matter to him what she looked like although he did love her dimples. One in each cheek and they flashed every time she smiled. I got a letter. From an old flame? Yeah, like he had any of those. Her eyes got big. Not really, he grabbed the pitchfork. From a lawyer. That doesn't sound good. Kind of what I thought when I saw the return address. He stuck the pitchfork in the hay. But I opened it anyway. He'd been coming into the house after a long day of drilling wheat. His sister, Louise, had been there with her daughter, and they'd been taking care of his grandparents. The mail was lying on the counter, and he'd grabbed it, flipping through to see if there was anything urgent that needed his attention. And, she prompted, grabbing the other pitchfork that leaned against the far wall. What'd it say? And how does this have anything to do with you getting married? Did someone claim to be your wife? No, nothing like that. He picked up a big fork full of hay and walked over to the open doorway that overlooked the corral, tossing it out. She tossed hers and grabbed his arm as he went to move by her. It burned, and he shifted away on the pretense of setting his pitchfork down. Stop, just tell me. If you can't work and talk, just work. She rolled her eyes. Man, your grandmother used to say that all summer long. Yeah, while we were in the pea patch picking peas. She exchanged a commiserating look with him. The most boring job in the world. For you, maybe. I liked it. Because she was with him. You couldn't have. There's no one on this earth who actually likes picking peas. He shrugged. I do. She shook her head. Just tell me about the letter and what this has to do with you getting married. The dim interior of the barn didn't allow him to see her face like he wanted to, but there was a tone in her voice that stirred a flutter of hope in his chest. You remember Mr. Edwards from Sweetwater Ranch? Of course, the local billionaire. 
sold his ranch in the eastern part of the state to the oil industry and made billions from the investments. Ames stared at him. You know nothing that you've said so far has made any sense. I'm going to make less sense from here on out, so if your delicate sensibilities aren't up for the challenge... His voice trailed off. Oh, I'm always up for the challenge. Actually, Squeegee, I'm not sure even you are up to this challenge. Would you just spit it out? He laughed and started back to the hay. Why would I do that when it's so much fun to frustrate you? Ah! He came stomping behind him. One of us has patience and one of us doesn't. I don't poke fun at your weaknesses, she huffed. Really? Hmm. He pretended to think before sticking his fork in the hay. I thought I heard someone who sounded a lot like you saying, take that, cowboy. He imitated her voice pretty well, if he did say so himself, drawing out the cowboy. He picked up his fork full of hay, but she stood in his way, hands on hips. Spit it. Mr. Edwards died. His lawyer sent me the letter. It said he left me a billion dollars in his will. Ames blinked. Not the kind of blink where the eyes go shut then open again, but the kind of blink where the eyelids go shut and kind of flutter there like the person blinking was too shocked to blink and process information at the same time. Did you say billion? With a B. Billion. Yes. One billion dollars? No, one billion rupees. Her eyes narrowed. Oh, that makes a difference. I don't think they're worth as much with the exchange rate. One billion dollars, Ames. One billion dollars. He put the tongs of the fork on the floor, emphasizing his words. One billion. But, he held his hand up. There are conditions. Of course. He nodded, leaning against the fork handle. There was silence in the barn. Well, what are they? Ames finally burst out. He shrugged. I don't know. Okay. She stepped back, and he swiped the hay back up on his fork. How do you find out? I have to drive to Fargo to meet with them. When? I don't know. I haven't made an appointment yet. He had known Ames was coming home. For some reason, when the letter mentioned marriage with other requirements, he'd not wanted to move forward without Ames. Who all knows? I got the letter last week. You're the first person I've told. There's one billion dollars sitting in an account for you somewhere, and you haven't done anything about it? You're just sitting here waiting for... for what? His lips turned up slowly. She snorted and rolled her eyes. No, don't even look at me like that. Like what? I don't know. Whatever that look is when you curl your lips up like a walrus about to sneeze. He threw his head back and laughed. Seriously, Palmer, go get your money. What are you waiting on? The letter didn't say much, but it did say I had to be married. No point in rushing off to the lawyer's office when I know I don't qualify. Well, there's like three eligible women in Sweetwater, and one of them is your sister, so I'll invite a few of my friends up, and you can have your pick of them. Have my pick? You make it sound like I'm buying a tractor. Well, in some ways, it's very similar. It's not, and you know it. I'm not really into the lovey-dovey romantic stuff, but I've been around women. He gave her a wicked smile. You, long enough that I know it's not going to be as easy as picking her out. When they hear the word billion, they will line up and let you pick. He rested his wrist on top of the handle. I don't see you lining up. She tossed her head. Marriage would ruin our great friendship. Money ruins everything anyway. He thought of his grandparents and how they wanted to stay on the farm. But it was running his sister Louise ragged trying to take care of them and her eight-year-old daughter as well as work the second shift at the diner. 
He helped out, taking care of everything at night and in the evenings. But both Louise and he were going to wear out at some point as their care got more involved. That billion dollars would pay off the second mortgage on the farm and pay for a caretaker for his grandparents, too. Without it, his ranching days were numbered. They'd have to sell in order to pay for a nursing home, and his grandparents would hate it. Not everything, he said. Ames didn't look like she believed him, but she shrugged anyway. He shoved his fork into the hay and picked up the pile of hay. This should do it. Come in for a bit. My grandparents would love to see you. Although you've been gone so long, Graham might whip out a guest book for you to sign. Ames grinned at his jab at North Dakotan's odd habit of having a guest book everywhere. Outsiders always teased that they had the highest guest book to resident ratio of any state in the Union. Palmer didn't ever recall signing a guest book until he moved to North Dakota. Ames wrinkled her nose. Your parents are still in Florida? Her tone was concerned, but she didn't need to be. His grandparents had helped fill the hole his parents left. He made his tone casual. Nope, Arizona now. Talking about trying out New Mexico. You hated that. He had. His dad was in the Army and never stayed in one place very long, which his mother had loved, but his older brother, Sawyer, and Louise, and he had hated it. Three years in a row, they'd gone to two different schools, each year. They'd never spent more than two years in one place. It had been a real blessing when his parents spent the winter in North Dakota. That was his ninth grade year. When they'd gotten ready to move to Montana, Sawyer, Louise, and he had begged to stay with their grandparents, where they loved the farm life and also the close feeling of family and community. His parents had been absent-minded and very close to being neglectful. With Graham and Pap, they had adults in their life who were actually interested in them. After that, his parents visited once every few years, almost like their own kids were more like distant relatives. He couldn't even say if his dad was still in the Army. It had worked out for the best. We landed here, no better place in the States, and I ought to know. I've been around, too. She had. He prompted. And? That's true. North Dakota is heaven in a freezer. Chapter 3 Ames followed Palmer up the old farmhouse porch steps. He left his square-toed cowboy boots on, so she did, too, although she'd lived in enough places to feel like she should take them off. It's what the rest of the world did not on the farm. Hey, Pap, Palmer said as he opened the screen door. He stepped back, holding it for her. Look what I found hitchhiking along the driveway. She snorted. The driveway? Seriously? She said under her breath as she passed him. He shrugged. I'm the brains in this relationship. He smacked her on the head. You stick with me, kid. She thought it was a line from some film, probably from the black and white era, definitely pre-1980, which was all Palmer and his siblings had been allowed to watch at their grandparents' home, when they were allowed to watch TV. Which wasn't often when they were in school. No cable. They probably still used their VCR. Who's that? Pap asked gruffly. Is that Bernice? He peered closer at Ames through extra thick glasses. Ames laughed. At least Pap's stroke hadn't messed with his sense of humor. He put his arms around Pap, giving him a hug before saying, It's a vagabond that wants to mooch off us. Where's that bucket of pig slop? Think your gram usually keeps it under the sink. Pap motioned her over with the hand that didn't hang limply at his side. Come give an old guy a hug. Ames went over and hugged his bony shoulders. He still smelled like Old Bay and outdoors. She loved her parents, but they'd been older when they had her and she felt stifled at home. Which didn't mean that she didn't do her duty. She'd helped them in the store since she'd been old enough to make change, and whenever she came home, she always took the early morning shifts. Her parents loved her. She knew they did. But she always felt like they were vaguely disapproving and slightly disinterested in her. Versus being here on the farm, where there was always a smile and something to do. 
Maybe if she lived on a ranch, with every day providing a new challenge and constant business, she wouldn't have such a desire to roam. She didn't have time to think about that anymore because Louise flew into the kitchen. Oh, great. Palmer, you're in. Then she saw Ames. She beamed. Ames, it's been so long. She threw her arms up and enveloped Ames in a lilac-scented hug. Louise didn't look like she had aged a day since she was 16, still wearing a T-shirt and jeans and boots. Her long brown hair was pulled back in a ponytail, and her face was free of any makeup. The only difference was that in high school, Louise was quiet and shy and would never have walked across the kitchen and hugged someone she hadn't seen in over a year. Having a child had matured her in that area at least. Louise threw an arm around Palmer and gave him a side hug before squeezing Pap. I'm closing tonight, so I'll be late. But Sawyer's coming to town and he's going to take Tella back to his place for the weekend. Ames remembered that Sawyer had bought a huge spread to the west, huge in land, but, if she recalled correctly, none of the buildings had been habitable, at least not in her opinion, and her standards for habitability were not nearly as high as any of her friends. Where is Tella? Ames asked, looking around. She and Graham were out in the garden. Louise opened the oven and checked the hot dish inside. This should be ready in another thirty minutes. I can cook, Louise. Exasperation laced Palmer's voice. And you do. Today I did, she answered without looking at him. We'll get Tella. Palmer motioned to Ames before he walked through the kitchen and out through the pantry and mudroom. Sorry about that, he said when the pantry door had shut behind them. I warned you about Pap's stroke. They'd FaceTimed enough that she knew. Palmer didn't talk about it a lot, though. It's fine. They were so good to me when we were in high school. Cognitively, Graham is fine, but she doesn't get around well at all. It kills her not to be out in the garden and to see weeds in it. Oh, I know how she feels about weeds. Yeah, nothing makes Graham more angry than weeds daring to trespass on her turf. Unfortunately, she can't bend down, and even the scooter we got her is getting to be too much this year. They stepped outside. The garden doesn't look bad. That's because this cowboy's been a plowboy all spring. Ames laughed at the annoyance in his tone. He'd never minded doing the garden work much, but, probably like all boys, he'd rather be out in the field. Really, we need to hire help, but we just can't afford it. You have a billion dollars. She smacked him lightly on the arm. He grunted. I don't have it and although the lawyer's office that the letter came from was legit, I still am not sure it wasn't a scam. I thought of that. It sounds crazy. I mean, I know Mr. Edwards was rich. Maybe a billionaire, I don't know. But did you even know him? Not really. He always had a winter feast for the ranchers in the area, usually around January or February. That's really the only time I saw him every year. I don't know why he'd single me out. She didn't want to be a wet blanket, so she hadn't said anything, but she still wasn't sure that the letter, wherever it was and whatever it said, was legit either. Palmer, you brought Ames, his Graham called from the other side of the garden. It wasn't as big as it used to be, at least as far as Ames could remember, but it was still plenty large. You're reading this? She asked under her breath as she waved to Graham. Tella, dressed in a hockey jersey that Palmer said was all she ever wanted to wear, walked slowly beside her as Graham stepped and moved her walker around the garden. Sawyer's been around, although I should really be helping out him. And Tella helps. She's very mature for an eight-year-old. Louise was always very serious. Quiet. That must be where Tella got it. Yeah. That was something else that Palmer and she never talked about. Actually, no one ever talked about who might be the father of Louise's little girl. Whoever it was had better not show their face back in Sweetwater. The whole town would lynch him after he got her pregnant and, apparently, left her high and dry. They strolled around the garden and met Graham and Tella at the end. Come here and let me get a look at you, girl. Graham set her walker aside and opened her arms to Ames. 
The familiar scent of apple and cinnamon wrapped around Ames' heart as Graham's arms wrapped around her shoulders. Tella, do you recognize Ames? She's the one we talked to on Saturday nights. Tella blinked serious brown eyes at Ames. Yes, sir. It's good to see you, Miss Ames. She sounded like a miniature adult. Ames gave Tella a big smile, trying to coax a little one out of the girl. Her lips twitched up, but it didn't even begin to be a full-blown smile. Palmer had said the only thing she really got excited about was hockey. Tella, Louise called from the side door. Let's go or I'm going to be late for work. Okay, Mommy. Tella put a hand up in farewell, then jogged off to Louise. I'm leaving, Louise called. Be careful, Palmer called after her. That little girl is too serious, Graham said as she continued to walk slowly toward the house. Palmer shrugged. She's around adults all the time. She acts like us. I'm sorry, Palmer, but she's more mature than you are. Graham didn't even look up as she said that. Palmer met Ames' eyes over Graham's head, and Ames stuck her tongue out. Immature, sure, but it made him smile. You two were racing again. Graham accused. I'm a professional. It's completely safe, Ames said. More to defend Palmer than herself. I'm old, not stupid, Graham said with a sideways glance at Ames. This time, Palmer was the one who stuck his tongue out over Graham's head. And I don't know why you two think I can't see you with those appendages hanging out of your mouth. Graham's walker finally hit the cement step at the bottom of the back stoop. Palmer hopped up and opened the door. I'm sorry, Graham. Ames started it. What are you, three? She shook her head. Tella is more mature than you, which is what started this conversation to begin with. Graham stepped up and stopped, maybe to take a rest. But she lifted her hand and turning, patted Ames' cheek. You breathe life into this old house. When you're gone, Palmer starts acting old and serious. You just accused me of being immature, Palmer cried in exasperation. I can't win. Graham's old, gnarled hand patted his cheek next. She had to stretch up to reach it. There's a fine line between happy and immature, but that's okay. We've had some serious times lately. It's good to see you smile. Graham's walker made thumping sounds as she walked through the pantry. Ames stopped by Palmer as he held the door. Serious times? Anything I don't know about? Palmer squirmed a little, moving his shoulders like they were itchy under his shirt. Not really. His eyes finally landed on hers. His voice was pitched low enough to keep Graham from hearing. Just pap and what to do about him and how to pay for it and the fact that all the available labor in the state is off making big money on the oil wells. No one wants to work for peanuts doing seven days a week manual labor on a ranch. But I can't work as much as I need to because when Louise leaves for work, I have to stick around the house with Graham and Pap. You haven't said anything about this to me. Ames, he said in exasperation. It's been a year and a half since you've been here, and longer than that since you've actually spent more than a couple of days at home. There's nothing you can do, and I don't want to ruin our time together worrying about stuff we can't change. But that's what friends are supposed to be for. I've told you about my problems. Right, and I'm not knocking your problems because they're significant, but I honestly don't want to talk about it. I don't see any solutions other than selling the ranch. Right now, we're holding on by our fingertips. The ranch is supporting itself, paying the taxes, keeping the mortgage current, but there's nothing extra to use for care for Pap. To put a ramp in so he can get in and out of the house without two people helping. We can get government help, but the ranch is in their names and the state will sell it first. Won't they put it in your name? It has to be out of their names for so long. That's not right. Palmer shrugged. It's the law. What about Sawyer? He's probably worse off. He tries to help, like taking Tella for the weekend, but his mortgage is higher and he's basically starting from nothing. 
He doesn't even have a house. I honestly thought he'd freeze to death last winter. But he wouldn't give up, and he wouldn't come stay with us because someone had to feed and water his cattle. Stubborn as a mule. Stubborn like his little brother. I am not stubborn, otherwise we'd never get along. Someone in this relationship has to give in. She rolled her eyes, but Palmer was right. She was as stubborn a person as anyone she'd ever met. She could admit that. Although she liked to think she was determined. Once she decided to do something, heaven helped the thing that stood in her way. And right now, that's what Palmer needed. Someone to push him into figuring out this inheritance thing, and if it was really legit, he needed someone to find him a wife. The thought of Palmer married to someone else didn't sit well with her, but it was probably because she was used to having his undivided attention. She'd just have to make sure that the woman she introduced him to wouldn't mind him keeping her as his best friend. She stuck her chin out and opened her mouth. Palmer put a hand up. No. She tilted her head. Huh? I don't know what you're thinking, but I recognize that look, and I'm saying right now, no. That look? The stubborn one. The one where you've just decided to go after something and now there's nothing in the world that will stop you. You had it on your face the day you decided to be a biathlon Olympian. You also wore it when we discussed beauty pageants, and I very reasonably pointed out that they were probably a lot like football. In order to play in college, you probably had to play in high school, in elementary school, in preschool, and if you were on a team in nursery school, it could only be to your advantage. In fact, prenatal football is probably a thing somewhere. You know nothing about football, she pointed out logically. You're missing the point, he threw a hand out in frustration. How can someone go from beauty pageants to prenatal football leagues? How can there be a point in that? He took his finger and put it on her nose. You didn't care that you'd never participated in a beauty pageant in your life before. You got that look, that stubborn look, and went and almost won the thing. I would have won the next year, but I couldn't do the beauty pageant while I was at the Olympics. Of course, Ames. You're patronizing me. You're getting stubborn, and I'm not sure what it's about, but I didn't like the way you were looking at me. She shook her head, knocking his finger off her nose. Then she put her own finger right on the tip of his nose and tapped it to punctuate her point. We are making an appointment for that lawyer. You're going to it, and I will have you married by the end of August. Chapter 4 Palmer stood at the window of his bedroom and stared out into the moon-drenched fields. Louise had gotten home twenty minutes ago, and he'd listened as she'd come in and checked on Graham and Pat before heading up to bed. It had been quiet in her room for the last five minutes or so. He could go to bed now. But he shoved his hands in his jeans pocket and leaned his bare shoulder against the window frame. He hadn't been sure he was going to tell Ames about the letter, but part of him had hoped she would say something like, Oh, Palmer, we can get married. I've secretly wanted to all my life. Ha. Huh. No, she was going to match him up with one of her friends. Fabulous. That way he'd sure to be tortured for the rest of his life as his wife invited Ames to birthdays and Christmases. Just great. He supposed he needed to decide if he could give up Ames in return for saving the farm. Then he needed to find a woman who could settle for a man who made such a decision. And the billion dollars. That money might soothe hurt feelings, although then he got into the question if he really wanted to spend his life with someone who was influenced by money. But who wouldn't be influenced by a billion dollars? He'd have to be honest with any woman he met for that purpose not honest to the point where he'd tell them that Ames was the only woman he ever wanted to marry. His brain jerked to a stop. Was that true? If he couldn't have Ames, he didn't want to get married? Not even to save the ranch. It sounded right to him, but it wasn't about him and what he wanted. There were more people involved, and he couldn't make decisions based solely on himself. That was selfish. His grandparents would be devastated if they lost their home. 
That was the whole reason he was fighting to keep them on the ranch to begin with. Then there was Louise, Antella. This was their home, too. Louise had help with Tella, and they were surrounded by family. If they lost the ranch, everything would be split up. Plus, he loved it. His roots were sunk in so deep and solid that selling it might kill him. That was his dilemma. Maybe he hadn't articulated it, not even to himself, but he'd known in his heart for a long time that he didn't want to marry another woman when he loved Ames. He sighed and turned back toward his bed. Yeah, he knew he wasn't much to look at. In high school, Ames had been the only girl who'd ever talked to him. Even her popularity with everyone else hadn't prompted any girls to even acknowledge him. Of course, he'd been skinny and lanky. New. And in a place like Sweetwater, where everyone knew everyone else, new was looked on with suspicion. Even now that he'd lived in Sweetwater for over half his life, he was still not a native, even though his parents and grandparents were born here. But he loved that about this town, the culture and the heritage. The sure sense of identity. The feeling that the whole town would pitch together to help their own. It took them a while to accept an outsider, even an outsider like him with parents and grandparents who'd been born in the town. But once they did, the sense of community was strong. He didn't want to leave. He didn't want to sell. He didn't want to lose it. But he wasn't sure he could sacrifice the rest of his life to earn the money it would take to keep it. Not when there was a slim chance that Ames might wake up one day and realize he wasn't the gangly kid she'd known in ninth grade. As long as there was a chance that Ames might look at him the way a woman looks at a man, one billion dollars wasn't enough to convince him to let go of that dream. Heard the big hockey star might retire and settle down in Sweetwater. Benson, a fellow volunteer firefighter, carried a big bag of candy across the fire station. Palmer sat on an upside-down five-gallon bucket, polishing an aluminum wheel on the 45-year-old fire truck. The town's pride and joy. It was in every parade, and Sweetwater had a lot of parades. And, of course, it hauled the guys to the few fires they'd had over the years. It was more likely to show up at an accident for traffic control than an actual fire. And definitely the parades outnumbered anything else. It should be called a parade truck, not a fire truck, but Palmer was just a general volunteer, so he really had no say. Who? He asked Benson absentmindedly. Aside from polishing wheels that hadn't gone anywhere since the last parade, he was wondering about Ames. She was working the early shift at the sea store her parents owned. Then she was meeting him here and driving down to Fargo to the lawyer's office. Ty Hansen, you know him. He might have been a year or two younger than you, but he's Sweetwater's claim to fame in the hockey world. Oh, yeah. Palmer and Tella watched hockey religiously and with abandon on Palmer's old laptop. It was the only thing she got excited about. He hadn't heard anything about Ty retiring. They'd gone to school together, although Ty was younger. Since it was the off-season, Palmer would much rather sit in the recliner in the evening and study the cattle futures or, better yet, pour over the EPD and pedigrees of the American Angus Association than think about what was happening in hockey. It was a pipe dream for sure to think that he'd ever be able to afford such animals. Rumor has it he's retiring. Folks say he's coming back to Sweetwater and buying the old Sweetwater Ranch. Palmer's ears perked up. Mr. Edwards, the guy who supposedly left him $1 billion if he got married, used to own that. Palmer had wondered what was going to happen to it. Mr. Edwards didn't have children. He dipped his rag in the polish cream and rubbed it in long strokes on the wheel rim. He didn't give much credence to rumors. There was always hope that something exciting would happen. It got worse in the winter when there was nothing to do. Palmer didn't know how the rumors started, but more than likely, Ty wasn't coming back. It took a certain kind of hardiness to handle the North Dakota winters. When people found success in another area of the country, 
they seldom returned. He folded the rag and felt the burn in his back and arms as he rubbed the polish off. It was tradition that the fire truck be the shiniest thing in the parade. No newcomer ever believed that it was 40 years old. The town took great pride in that. It was Palmer's turn to do the polishing, and he couldn't let the townsfolk down, even if he could remember what the parade and celebration was for. Tractor days, maybe? Maybe he'll bring some money into the town, something to keep folks from leaving for the oil money. Benson walked back to the equipment rack. Palmer checked the time and gave the wheel one last swipe. Ames would be walking in any minute. He better get his hands cleaned up. He was at the sink washing them when Ames blew in. Hey, Benson, she called. Benson stumbled and mumbled something. Palmer grinned. Ames had that effect on a lot of men. She was so beautiful they didn't know what to say to her. But she was human like the rest of them. Palmer knew she had insecurities and faults just like everyone else. Just because her face made a man's heart jump to his throat and her smile could freeze his lungs didn't mean she wasn't as down-to-earth as anyone else. He thought, not for the first time, that maybe someone like her didn't belong stuck up in North Dakota anyway. Ah, you have the old girl ready to strut down the street. Ames stood back, hands on her hips, admiring the polished aluminum. She's the queen of the parade. Gotta get her makeup just right. She rolled her eyes. Would you stop already? My beauty pageant days are far, far behind me, and I don't fuss with makeup anymore. He squinted at her face. Looks like you slapped something on there this morning, covering up those awful blotches that I saw last night out at the farm. Shut up, Palmer. No one's supposed to know I have blotches. Benson's eyes popped wide open, and they whipped back and forth between Palmer and Ames. Palmer put a finger to his lips. Shh, don't tell anyone about Ames' blotches. No way, not me. The next person who came into the fire station would be hearing about Ty coming back to Sweetwater and Ames' blotches. If Palmer were a betting man, he'd put money on it. You ready? His heart twirled in his chest as he looked at Ames, fresh-faced and smiling, wearing a knee-length jean skirt, a pink fitted t-shirt, and some kind of strappy sandals. This wouldn't be the first time they'd driven to Fargo together, and it always stirred his soul with pride to have her by his side. Not necessarily because she was beautiful, but because she fit him so well. He felt like she was his partner and they made each other better just by being together. I am. He waved to Benson and they walked out to his old pickup. He opened her door. She held up her phone. I have the address in my GPS, but when I called yesterday, the man I talked to said just to show up after lunch. I couldn't believe we didn't make an appointment. I also got the feeling that he was the actual lawyer and not a secretary. Weird. Hmm. Sounds fishy to me, Palmer said. Ames always took the bull by the horns, and she'd gotten the number and called it herself, with his blessing, of course. She always got annoyed with him because he moved so slow. Her lips pursed. We won't know unless we check it out. He agreed. They were barely a mile out of town when she started with the things he didn't want to hear but didn't know how to tell her. So he sat there with his mouth shut while she talked. I was on the phone last night, most of the night, she laughed. I have two friends, Janelle and Mindy, who are taking a summer trip to Yellowstone, and they're going to stop in to see me. You probably won't be interested in Janelle, but Mindy is a real sweetheart. She waved her hand in the air. That's next week. This week, my former coworker, Katie, is coming for a short visit. We're not real close, but she has to go to the cities for work, and she took a couple of days of vacation to swing around here. She's a city girl living in New York City, and we've drifted apart since we worked together as marketing execs at Bionall, but she's single. She leveled her eyes across the seat. He pressed his lips closed and stared out the windshield, gripping the steering wheel tightly as Ames went on and on about how wonderful Katie was and all her amazing skills or whatever. Maybe if Palmer hadn't already decided who he wanted, he'd appreciate the information. 
As it was, hearing about a girl that would be perfect for him from the girl that he thought was perfect for him wasn't his idea of a great way to pass the hours to Fargo. She finally quit, but not until they were on I-29 rolling south. He had one wrist hooked over the steering wheel and one arm resting on the back of the bench seat. Ames had her feet curled up under her and her phone out, shooting off the occasional text. The silence was golden. He wanted to enjoy time with Ames, not feel torn about whether or not he should marry someone just to save the ranch and help out his grandparents and sister. Palmer, you're not fooling me. Great. She figured out that he wasn't interested in the girl she was talking about. I didn't figure I was. My problem is that I don't know what the issue is. I've been trying to tell you I can help you find a girl, and I mentioned the money, and that's not doing it either. What's the issue? He tapped his finger on the steering wheel, knowing he wouldn't have to answer because she wouldn't be able to keep from talking. Sure enough, she started again. I get that maybe you don't feel like you're ready to get married, maybe not ready for the responsibility, but surely for a billion dollars you can kick your clock into high gear and get with the program. What if it were you? She stopped. He could almost hear the gears in her brain screeching to a standstill. What if I had a billion dollars? What if you needed the money to save your home, but you had to get married to get it? You want me texting my friends trying to drum up a date for you? She sighed and caught her lip between her teeth. Tilting her head, she said, Is it that bad? He actually hadn't thought of it that way until just now. He'd been more upset that he wanted her when she didn't want him. He hated seeing her feeling bad. Listen, I know you're just trying to help. I'm sure I'll eventually appreciate it, but let's not jump the gun. We need to find out what the stipulations are first and if we even think the offer's legit. Okay, good point. She picked at her phone case. Should I tell Katie not to come? She's your friend. You want to see her? This weekend is... Is it farm machinery days or something? She grinned. Yeah, farm machinery days. Then the 4th of July, then a festival every week or so all summer. They laughed together. Anything worth celebrating and some things that weren't, North Dakotans did it with a festival and a parade. He lifted a shoulder. Anyway, you guys will have something to do. I'm only here for the summer. I was planning on spending it with you. If you're going to avoid me when Katie's here, I'll tell her it's not going to work out. Can it wait until we see the attorney? She looked at her phone. Her smile faded. Yeah, it can wait. She punched into it and clicked send, then took her phone and threw it into the drink holder. This attorney had better have some answers. Chapter 5 This attorney wasn't going to have any answers. Actually, they had to be in the wrong place. Ames blinked again and looked out the windshield, reading the sign a fourth time. It hadn't changed. Perry's Petting Zoo. Are you sure this is it? Palmer asked with the same tone in which he had said the exact same thing two minutes ago. She handed the letter over without a word. He checked the address against the road sign and his GPS. According to everything they had, this was the place. So, the attorney doesn't have an office? or we have to go in the petting zoo. Ames wasn't even sure what questions she wanted to ask. This just can't be right. You know, 97% of me agrees with you, but part of me says that Mr. Edwards was eccentric. Maybe he found the only attorney in the entire country that has his office in a petting zoo. It would surprise, but not completely shock me. Ames nodded. I can see your point. I only saw Mr. Edwards a few times in town. I do remember he had what looked like peacock feathers on the back of his hat. Maybe they came from his attorney. She slanted him a look. Yeah, maybe. She could admit to herself that part of her really didn't want the money thing to be true. 
After all, if Palmer had to get married, she could lose him. But that was selfish, and she knew it. She realized how much the farm meant to him, and if there wasn't any money, they could end up having to sell. Palmer would be devastated, plus his grandparents and sister and niece would lose their home. But Palmer wouldn't be forced to tie his life together with a woman other than her. Hey, what's that? Palmer squinted, leaning his head forward. He pushed his cowboy hat up. Ames looked in that direction but didn't see anything unusual. That sign on the gate. He grabbed the envelope and compared the return address with the words on the sign. Oh, yeah, it's green with purple and red letters. Yeah, that's the one. I'm pretty sure it says Peregrine and Associates. Now that you mention it, I actually think it does. Well, that's our guy. I guess his office really is in the petting zoo. We'll ask at the gate. Okay. She grabbed her phone and shoved it in her purse before opening her door. Beecha, she said to Palmer as he came around to open it. You're supposed to wait for me. Maybe you need to be a little faster. Maybe if I hogtied you and threw you in the back of my pickup, you'd wait until I got there before you got out, Squeegee. Okay, cowboy, I can rope a steer just as good as you. He snorted. Both of them knew that was an outright lie. She'd never been any good with throwing a lasso. She couldn't barrel race either. In fact, she wasn't much of a horse rider at all. That was fine since most of the work on the ranch was done on four-wheelers. They had more crops than cows. Come on, maybe we'll find someone in here that believes in fairy tales. She slammed her door shut and followed him over, trying not to notice his broad shoulders and confident walk. Palmer could make a trip to the dentist fun. There was no one else in the world that she felt more at ease with. When she was with him, she could be herself, no matter how many dumb things she did. Palmer settled his hat a little firmer on his head and leaned down, looking into the little booth that seemed to serve as the ticket booth. An older gentleman sat on a stool, several large books open on the counter beside him, and a yellow legal pad half full of notes beside it. He looked up at their approach. Two of you? he asked. Before they could answer, a phone connected to the side wall of the booth rang. Excuse me, he said very politely. Hello? he said, his gaze directed to a point over their heads. Oh, sure, Richard. Stop by any time this afternoon. Ames poked Palmer in the side. It was a hard side and didn't give as much as she expected. She was a little distracted until he whispered, What? His eyes looked down at her from under his cowboy hat, and she lost her train of thought. He raised his brow and she shook herself. That's the guy I spoke with on the phone. Really? The one who said to come in after lunch? Yeah. You thought he was the lawyer? Nothing he said exactly, just what he didn't say. Like, he didn't say, I'll check with Mr. Peregrine's schedule, or I'll see if that will suit. Just come in like it was his right to say it. Okay. Palmer straightened. The phone clicked as the man hung up. I'm sorry about that. He cleared his throat. There's two of you? We're here to see Mr. Peregrine, attorney. Oh, the man's face fell just a little. Well, okay. He blinked up at them. Come around this side and through the gate. He pointed to the opposite side from the large petting zoo gate. Around beside the shed, there was a small gate just like he'd indicated. Palmer opened it and held it open for her. She gave him a look as he said something under his breath that sounded suspiciously like hogtie and squeegee. Stuff it, cowboy, she said, not bothering to keep it under her breath. If you're a good girl, I might take you around the petting zoo later, Palmer said and tweaked her hair. I don't care about the zoo, and you're going to feed me later whether I'm good or not. Feed you to the lions, maybe? She smirked at him before walking through the door with a little sign that said, Peregrine Seitzler, Attorney at Law. 
They walked into a tiny room with two stools. A half wall separated it from the room at the front where Mr. Peregrine sat, now facing them. Go ahead and sit down, he said very graciously. Ames couldn't shake the feeling that she was in a children's daytime TV show from the 60s. She wanted to look around for a blue dog or a purple dinosaur, but she refrained. She was here for Palmer. She perched on the edge of the stool. Palmer sprawled down on his, setting his hat on the small ledge that separated them from the ticket booth. I'm Peregrine Seitzler, the man said pleasantly. Now that they were closer, Ames could see that his eyes were dark brown, maybe black, friendly, but also sharply intelligent. He reminded her of all the stereotypes of the absent-minded professor. Only he was an absent-minded attorney slash petting zoo caretaker? Palmer gripped his hand. Palmer Olson, from Sweetwater. The gaze sharpened. Yes, okay. The man slanted a glance at Ames. I'm Ames, and I'm his friend, she said before he could utter a word. She wasn't answering any questions about being a wife or fiancé. And you're okay with her being here and hearing this? The man asked, not unkindly. Yes, Palmer said firmly, sending warmth sailing through her chest at his confidence and belief in her. Okay, then. The man drew a folder out from under the ledge and set it down in front of them. This is quite unorthodox, but very cut and dried. Mr. Edwards was quite clear about what he wanted, and he didn't want any legal mumbo-jumbo, as he said, to get in the way of understanding. I will give you the simple version, and if you have any questions, I will go into more detail. Okay, Palmer said with a raised brow at Ames. She gave him a tentative smile. Mr. Peregrine set a pair of what could only be called spectacles on his nose. Ames did not laugh. He cleared his throat. In his will, Mr. Edwards is bequeathing you with one billion dollars. The taxes and my fee are yours to pay. He looked over his spectacles. My fee, in case you are wondering, is twenty dollars if you buy tickets to the petting zoo and one hundred dollars if you don't. Quite a spread. How much are tickets to the petting zoo? Ames couldn't help but ask. The man's eyes went to her. Ten dollars for adults, five for children eight and under. She and Palmer stared at him. They tilted their heads at the same time. Finally, Palmer said, Well, I guess we'll take two adult tickets to the petting zoo. Oh, you pay when you come out, the man said. Ames' lips twitched up. Okay, Palmer said. Mr. Peregrine cleared his throat again. He looked back down through his spectacles. Where was I? Oh, yes, my fee. Taxes, you'll have to see your accountant about that. Figure on 50%. So he's not getting one billion dollars, but 500 million? Right, give or take a couple of million. Okay. Here are the conditions. First, Mr. Edwards wants you to commit to living in North Dakota for the rest of your life. If you move out of the state, except for a doctor's order, you have to pay the money back. He looked over his spectacles. You have to have a signed order for that. Right, Palmer said a little drolly. Mr. Peregrine ignored him. Second, you must be married within six months. You can have the money now, but if you're not married in six months, you have to pay it back. Same condition applies to your wife as to you. She has to live in the state except for health reasons on a doctor's order. Mr. Peregrine looked over his glasses. When neither of them responded, he looked back down. And lastly, you have to be married within six months of meeting with me here today or your money goes to the petting zoo. Ames snorted. She tried to cover it with a cough, but from Palmer's look, she wasn't very successful. Is that it? he asked. Yep, Mr. Peregrine replied. As for the marriage, it's the date on the marriage certificate. Let's see, it's June. It'll be December in six months. Yeah. He nodded his head. 
If the weather's bad and you can't make it in right away, don't worry about it. Don't want you dying in a blizzard just to get me your marriage certificate. Is a copy okay? Ames asked. They could just email it. For a billion dollars, I'd like to see the original if you can manage it. Mr. Peregrine was as serious as he'd been the whole time. Ames found herself nodding in agreement. Palmer sighed. So, you can give me a check right now, but if I'm not married in six months, I have to return it. That's right. He tapped his fingers on the folder. He looked over his shoulder before lowering his voice. Technically, that's not entirely legal. However, Mr. Edwards was very clear. He wanted couples to settle in North Dakota, and he wanted ranches to prosper by ranching and not have to sell out to the oil like he did. So, while I can't exactly make you give the money back, Mr. Edwards left money in his will to a fund that is meant to sue anyone who tries to take the money without following the rules he laid down. The idea is to bleed you dry from legal fees, even if you are never told by a judge that you need to write a check out and send the money back. Of course, Mr. Peregrine took his spectacles off. There's always the possibility that the court would side with Mr. Edwards' estate and decree that you need to give the money back. Why me? Mr. Peregrine smiled. Who said it was just you? There's more? That is a stipulation on me. Once you're married with the money, I can tell you who else is married with the money. Of course, nothing is stopping you from taking out a big ad on national TV and announcing to the world that you're set to inherit a billion dollars as soon as you marry, but I suspect Mr. Edwards figured you had more intelligence than that. Can you tell me how many others there are? Mr. Peregrine scratched his chin. I believe so. Eight others. In Sweetwater? Mr. Peregrine got a sly smile on his face. Let's just say in North Dakota. That's where Mr. Edwards' heart was, here in North Dakota. Mine too, Palmer said, and Ames almost said, Amen. Maybe that's why he chose you. Palmer narrowed his eyes. Really? The old man shrugged. Maybe. Palmer sat still beside her. On impulse, Ames reached out and put her hand on his arm. He turned his face and their eyes met. She was conscious of his chest going in and out, the powerful shoulders, and the hard forearm under her fingers the heat that ran up her arm and pricked her heart. Her own lungs seemed to be working extra hard, and she couldn't move, couldn't take her eyes away from his. The seconds ticked by, and neither one of them looked away. Excuse me? Ames jerked her eyes away from Palmer. A customer stood at the window. Mr. Peregrine said, One moment, please. He turned toward the customer and told him how much he would owe when he and his family left the petting zoo. Palmer's jaw was square, his eyes on the folder on the ledge in front of them when Ames turned back to look at him. She moved her hand away. A muscle ticked in his jaw, but he didn't look at her. For some reason, she was very aware of her heart thumping in her chest. Odd. The man and his family walked in the gate. Their steps crunched on the gravel path, growing fainter as they walked away. Sorry about that. Mr. Peregrine turned back toward them. Do you have any other questions? Palmer studied the folder like it had all the answers in the world. I guess it's tempting to leave today with a check. Can we walk around the petting zoo and let you know what we decide when we get back? Of course, take your time. Mr. Peregrine stood, and they stood with him. You can go right out that door. He indicated the door on the opposite side from where they came in. Just follow the path. It goes in a big circle and will bring you right back. Thanks. Palmer grabbed his hat and reached around, opening the door for Ames. Oh, wait, Mr. Peregrine called. 
He reached under his side of the ledge, grabbing a thick book and slapping it on the wooden counter. Sign the guest book, please. They exchanged a glance before Palmer picked up the pen and signed. Ames signed on the line below his name. I love North Dakota, she said with a smirk at Palmer. He grinned back. Mr. Peregrine thanked them. Palmer held the door for her before following her out. He jammed his hat down on his head. They walked in silence for a while, neither of them paying much attention to the goats and sheep that lined the path. A rooster and a couple of fluffy white chickens scattered in front of them. They met the family that had arrived earlier and passed them. Palmer shoved his hands in his pockets. He didn't even look at the cow with a newborn calf by her side. They walked around a corner and passed a couple of low-hanging trees. Finally, he stopped on a footbridge. I can't do it, he said, lifting his hat and running his hands through his hair. Relief made Ames' chest lighter. If I take the money today, that's like signing my death warrant for six months from now. How so? Even though she really figured she knew what he was saying, she also figured it would help him to talk about it. He leaned on the railing, his hands clasped, looking down at the still water below them. A turtle lay on a rock in the sun, while a mama duck and seven ducklings swam over as though expecting to be fed. If I take it now, what if I can't get anyone to marry me by December? Oh, that's the least of your worries, Palmer. Huh? I thought that was the biggest one. You'll have your pick. Girls will crawl all over themselves to get you to marry them. She was absolutely certain that was the truth. Oh, sure, if they know I have money. Maybe you ought to get out of North Dakota once in a while, cowboy. Girls in the real world would consider you a catch, without money. He gave her a look she couldn't decipher. If you say so, for the last 28 years, I haven't exactly been beating them off with a stick. Are you fishing for compliments? His brows drew down. No. Are you trying to tell me I should take a check home? No. He shook his head. So we're really not saying anything? Do you need the money urgently? Pap and Graham could use it today. Louise won't want to take anything, especially if she finds out what I have to do to get it. You make it sound like you have to sell your soul. He turned to her and grabbed her shoulders. You don't understand. I have to marry some woman I barely know and who doesn't love me. And I have to make her agree to live in North Dakota for the rest of her life. And you know how hard that could be. People who are born here have trouble with our winters. And if she leaves me, I have to pay the money back. He gave her a little shake. I might as well sell my soul. Ames bit her lip. She didn't want to give her best friend bad advice. Sometimes life is about risk. You know that. You have no idea when you plant that weed if there's going to be rain or if we're going to get a hailstorm two days before you plan to harvest it. You could end up losing the whole crop. You just don't know. But that doesn't mean you wring your hands and say to yourself, I don't know whether I'm going to plant wheat this year or not. You do the best you can, and you leave the rest up to the Lord. He studied her, not saying anything. Finally, one of his lips tugged up. I want to plant wheat. But you don't want to get married? His lips flattened and he didn't say anything. She wasn't sure what that meant exactly. Maybe progress, since he hadn't seemed to want to get married at all the last time they talked about it. I'm not taking any money today. That's a good choice. You're not any worse off if you don't than you were yesterday. His face relaxed like he decided not to worry about it anymore. A teasing glint came to his eye. You'll have to eat fast food. She laughed. 
Some of us aren't dirt poor farmers. He squeezed her arms. Yeah, the day I let you buy my supper is the day I hang my cowboy hat up for good. Maybe it was her imagination, but he seemed to drag his fingertips down her arms before dropping his hands to his sides. Come on, all this talk about food is making me feel the need to find a good steakhouse. Chapter 6 Palmer gave the one-inch nut a couple more turns with his wrench. Hand me the short hose, please. He held his hand out, and Ames grabbed the hose he'd laid out earlier off the four-wheeler seat and handed it through the fence. This one? she asked. Yep, thanks. He started the threads and twisted with his gloved fingers until it was too tight to move. Then he finished tightening it with the wrench. Several of the more curious cows had come over with their heads down, sniffing and blowing beside him. Where's the bull? he asked. He only had this last end to attach before making sure it worked. There's a cow in heat over there. He's still over with her. I'll keep an eye on him. Thanks. It was growing dark. He'd seen this water trough was leaking when Ames and he had made the rounds earlier, but he didn't have the right hose and nuts to fix it. They'd eaten with the family before they'd come back out, so Louise could make sure Graham and Pap got to bed. Thankfully, she had tonight off. Looks like we've got a storm coming, too. He could hear the worry in Ames' voice, and he sought to soothe it. Nice. That ought to take care of the humidity. It'll be nice if we get back to the house before it starts to rain. One of the cows stuck her nose on his hat and tilted it. He straightened it before feeling for the threads on the ground pipe. Where's your sense of adventure? If I wanted adventure, I'd buy a lottery ticket. Hmm. <laughs> You have more chance of being struck by lightning than of, I know, would you hurry? I feel like my chances are going up. Hand me that last nut. It came through the fence with alacrity. He tried to attach it the same way. It's funny that you've traveled all over the world. Heck, you even want to move to L.A. where you don't know a soul. What's the crime rate there anyway? I don't know. I don't think they have thunderstorms in L.A. I think you've got L.A. mixed up with Antarctica. No thunderstorms in Antarctica? Her voice sounded more thoughtful than scared, and he considered it a win. He pushed his finger around, searching for the connector that had come loose. I think you need heat for thunderstorms. No, you need heat for tornadoes. Heat makes the air rise. It was pretty hot today. She looked around like there was a tornado on the horizon she'd missed five seconds ago when she scanned it. No tornadoes in Antarctica either. He tried to sound cheerful. You're changing the subject. Ah, there it was. He grabbed the end of the hose. If you know what I'm doing, why are you fighting me? Because I don't want to be struck by lightning. I'm too young to die. You don't always die. I'm too young to turn into Frankenstein. He stopped and leaned around the large black cow's head that was obscuring his view of Ames. Isn't there a feminine version of that? If I say yes, will you work faster? I think you look kind of cute with bolts coming out of your neck. I'm going to take the four-wheeler and leave. You're the one that ran over a nail and flattened your tire. Why are you punishing me? He gave the wrench one last jerk. There, let's see how we did. He turned the lever, and after a hiss and a sputter, water gurgled into the tank. All right, I'm thinking there's going to be a crowd here for a while. Let's get out of here. What a great idea, Ames said somewhat sarcastically. He stood up and got his first good look at the western sky. Holy frig! Angry black clouds billowed and rolled in a sky that was an eerie orange and green. I've been trying to tell you. Right. Here. He handed the wrench and the broken coupler through the fence. Checking to see where the bull was, he headed down the fence to a spot between two posts where the fence would be easiest to cross. They should have come up through the field, but the bull was in this field with the cows that had spring calves 
and he hadn't wanted to worry about Ames. He bent the fence down, hopping over and straightening it back up. If Pap were here, he'd yell at him for weakening the fence that way, but it was worth it to him to have Ames safe. Although, those clouds didn't look safe. What'd the weather say? he asked. Ames' forehead was wrinkled with worry lines. Thunderstorms. I haven't watched the radar since before I came out this morning. You've been working me too hard and I haven't had a chance. Plus, service is spotty here. Funny, the cell phone company doesn't want to put a tower in just for our little ranch. Maybe if they find oil here. He swung a leg over the four-wheeler and Ames got on behind him. He pushed his hat down and started the ATV. She wrapped her arms around his waist. He'd almost slash her tire himself to ride like this. He hadn't. Fixing it was on his list of things to do. Tomorrow. Ready? He asked as a gust of wind whipped the grass around them and loosened his hat. He pushed it down. I was ready 30 minutes ago. It was almost full dark by the time they got home. Bright flashes of lightning raced across the sky, chased by loud claps of thunder. He parked the four-wheeler in the shed and climbed off. How about you hang out here a little bit? We never got dessert. We can sit on the porch and eat it. I know you're tired. Stay. Wait until the storm goes by. Okay. Palmer went into the house, and Ames followed him in, as familiar with his house as she was with her own. The light over the stove was still on. Otherwise, it was completely dark. Like most families in Sweetwater, they went to bed early and got up with the sun, unless there was a water line to fix. Ames got plates out while Palmer pulled the gelatin salad out of the fridge. She tried to be quiet, knowing that his grandparents slept downstairs. Even though they were both hard of hearing, she didn't want to wake them up. He scooped two pieces and set them on the plates, while she pulled the silverware drawer open and pulled out two forks. They grinned at each other like they were fifteen and sneaking dessert off the windowsill, which they had done, and not responsible adults coming in from saving the cows from dying of thirst. He put the gelatin salad back in the fridge and she grabbed both plates, pushing the screen door open with her hip. Shutting the stove light off, he followed her out. We'll see the lightning better if it's out, he said in the near pitch black darkness. They sat on the porch swing and watched the lightning flash across the sky while they ate their salad. Funny how Ames felt at home and comfortable on Palmer's back porch swing. Occasional hard gusts of North Dakota's famous wind whipped around them. They weren't touching, but she could feel the heat of his big body close to her somehow comforting and disconcerting at the same time. Several sharp cracks of thunder made her jump, and she swallowed the last of her food with a gulp. Here, I'll take your plate. She handed it over, and he leaned over and set it on the small stand that sat flush against the house. The springs creaked as he rocked them gently. He had one arm stretched up, hooked on the swing chain, and one arm behind her, not touching, but sitting on the backrest. This is my favorite part of summer, he said softly. I know. She loved the storms, too, as long as they weren't out in them. They were fun to watch from the safety of the house. There's nothing more beautiful in the whole world than a North Dakota thunderstorm. She could admit it. How about a North Dakota triple rainbow? That was pretty, wasn't it? She asked wistfully, remembering. Yeah, wish we'd gotten a picture. Of course, somehow pictures of rainbows are never as beautiful as the real thing. Have you ever seen a triple again? Nope, just that summer after we graduated. I used to wonder how you could live in such splendor and want to leave. He spoke easily, and she knew he wasn't judging her, just commenting. Yeah, sometimes when I come back, I wonder the same thing. 
But then something always calls and off I go again. He didn't say anything. She knew it was because he didn't understand, but he respected her choices, just as she did his. Hey, here comes the rain. Hear it? He smiled and tilted his head. Yeah, she said softly. It'll hit the barn roof next. We'll really hear it then. A few seconds after he said that, the drumming of the rain on the roof reached them. There it is, she said. Suddenly, lightning hit so close they could hear the crackle. Thunder followed immediately, shaking the house and making the air vibrate. Ames yelped and jumped toward Palmer. Hey, it's okay, he said softly. She laughed, a little self-conscious, a lot nervous. She put her hand on his chest, solid and strong and warm. His arm came down from the back of the swing, going around her shoulders and keeping her close to him. You want to go inside? He asked just as the rain reached them in torrents, smacking the house, blasting the porch roof over top of them and beating into the ground. No! She shouted over the noise. She felt safe and comfortable against Palmer. The strange excitement that built in her chest because of the storm still buzzed, twisting her heart and making her restless. But not restless enough to move. She leaned her head against Palmer's chest, and she felt his cheek rest against the top of her head. The dark and the rain, the warmth coming from the chest under her cheek, all combined to make her feel like this was one of those times in life she wanted to cherish. Just relax and enjoy, then tuck it away in her heart for safekeeping and occasional enjoyment. For the rest of her life, she could pull it out and remember the smell and the sound, but most of all the feel of the cowboy beside her, holding her and keeping her safe and warm. The rain kept falling and the lightning still flashed, though each crack of thunder sounded farther away. Finally, the downpour slowed to a drizzle and stopped completely. Only the drip of water falling from the roof broke the silence. Palmer's familiar rugged scent mixed with petrichor combined to form the most delicious smell on earth. Ames breathed deeply of the sweet mix. She didn't know how long they sat there like that, snuggled together. She and Palmer had done many things over the years, but she had never ended a day snuggled up next to him. She liked it. But the longer they stayed like this, the more she worried that it might impact their friendship, make it awkward. After all, she didn't snuggle on the porch swing in the dark with any of her other friends. Because of this, she was extra reluctant to move, not wanting to break the spell and face the consequences. She should have known Palmer wouldn't let it be awkward. I'd better head home, she finally said. Yeah, it's late. He took a slow breath like he, too, didn't want to move. I'll follow you. Give me a minute to put these plates in the house. She straightened, grunting. I'm a big girl, Palmer, and you need to shower yet before bed. You saying I stink, Squeegee? He asked, and she could hear the smile in his voice as he reached back and grabbed their plates. Yep, like a man who's worked all day. A good, honest smell that she loved. Oh, and I thought I smelled like yesterday's trash. Not as tangy, she said lightly. He didn't need to know that she had been enjoying everything about their position, including his amazing scent. It should be illegal for a man to smell that good, like wind and sun and honesty and character. Hard work and easy relaxation when it was done. Nothing better in the world. She ought to know. She stood, stretching, wishing she didn't have a 30-minute drive back to town in her parents' house. Did you let your parents know you're okay? I did, but they weren't worried since I was with you. She hadn't needed to. After all, it wasn't like she hadn't been gone since high school, but out of consideration, she'd texted them. 
I'll see you tomorrow. I have to open at the sea store, but I'll be out around dinner time. Sure, Squeegee, we'll feed you, he said before stepping into the kitchen, holding the screen door so it didn't slam. The plates clinked in the sink. Funny. Go to bed, Palmer. He came back and pushed the door open. I'm following you home. You ready? She huffed, but honestly, she wasn't mad as she stepped down off the porch and walked to her car. Sure, she'd been out on her own, lived in different countries and cities, and taken care of herself for a long time. But Palmer wasn't following her because he thought she was a baby who needed a nanny. He was doing it because he cared about her, and that's who he was, a protector who wasn't going to sit around chewing his nails wondering if she got home okay. He was going to make sure of it. From her travels, she knew there weren't many men like him left in the world. His was a dying breed that was disappearing with churches and chivalry. And she was lucky enough to have him as her best friend. She stopped with her hand on her car latch. Hey, Palmer? Hmm? He stood with his pickup door already opened, the dome light shining dimly behind him. Thanks. He didn't say anything for a moment, and she wondered if he was going to ask what for. But Palmer understood her better than anyone else, and he just shrugged. Drive safe, Squeegee. She smiled and got into her car. He followed a short distance behind her the whole way to town. The roads were flat and straight. The same roads she'd driven on since she got her license years ago. The roads that her dad and Palmer had taught her on. The storm was completely gone and the clouds had dissipated. The air was cool now and she turned the heater on low. There was some water reflecting the moonlight in the fields, but it would be gone by morning. Some small bits of debris lay scattered across the road. As soon as the wind dried things out, that would blow off. And the whole ride home, she was comforted by Palmer's lights in her rearview mirror. His solid presence behind her. Wherever she went, she'd always known he'd be here, waiting. Maybe it hadn't been a conscious thought, but was more of an awareness, an unseen tether or anchor that would never let her stray too far from her roots and the values she'd been brought up with. Because Palmer was as solid as an oak tree, with roots just as deep. He had been up at dawn, maybe before, and had worked all day, and would be doing it all again tomorrow. Yet, he didn't even ask if she wanted an escort, just assumed he'd be one for her. Palmer was the kind of man a woman was blessed to find and keep. Too bad he was her best friend. It wouldn't be hard to fall in love with him. Chapter 7 Friday evening, Palmer helped his pap button his favorite blue plaid shirt. Pap got frustrated with only having one hand that actually did what he wanted. Therapy was helping, but the improvements were slow. Graham was already in her good clothes and standing with Tella by the door. Louise pulled their hot dish out of the oven. Can you grab the gelatin salad from the fridge, please? She asked Palmer as she slipped the casserole dish into the insulated carry bag. He grabbed the plasticware container out of the fridge. This it? Louise glanced up from taking Pap's arm. Yes, thank you. Can you carry this, hon? He asked Tella, who wore her favorite thing, the hockey jersey she'd gotten for Christmas. Ty Hansen's jersey, the pride of Sweetwater, even if he hadn't been home since he graduated high school and his father died. She nodded and he handed it to her. Hold it level. Yes, sir, she said softly. He smiled at her before he grabbed the door, opening it and holding it while Louise helped Pap out and Graham clomped along behind in her walker. When they were younger, Louise was quiet and shy, always with her nose in a book. Very much like Tella, except Tella seemed more sad somehow. Honestly, Louise was the last woman on the planet he would have expected to have a baby in high school. 
it had shocked the whole town of Sweetwater. Heck, he'd never even seen her talk to a boy. Not in school, not out. He'd have beaten any boy to a bloody pulp who touched her. He'd have to wait in line behind Sawyer, who was the oldest, for his turn, which may or may not have been the reason she wouldn't tell anyone who the father was. He had no idea where she'd even met him. Had she slipped out at night? She really wasn't that kind. It had happened the summer before her senior year, and the closest he could figure out was that whoever the father was had met her on the ranch, somewhere she had taken her book and read. The only thing she'd told them was that it was consensual, so they knew there was no rapist on the loose. Regardless, he'd tried to be a father figure and tell his life, but he had a feeling that in the last year or so, she had realized she was a little different than the other kids at school. Their community, like most of North Dakota, was a small, conservative one where people still got married before they had children. Tella was definitely different in that regard. Louise was still quiet, but not as shy, and still never breathed a word of a father. Someday. Louise drove with Graham and Tella. He took his pickup with Pap and the cherry cream gelatin squares that Louise had made. They arrived as the crowd was beginning to thicken, but he was able to find a parking space close to the stands and food tables. The tractor driving contest was later that evening, and Palmer would be a competitor. Pap would want to see it, even if he couldn't compete. Come on, Pap, let's set these squares down and help Louise with Graham. He took a hold of Pap's arm and led him to the table. Louise must have found an even better spot than he did because she was already there with their hot dish. She put it with the rest of them. Hey, you guys, sign the guest book. Harriet Powell, his elementary school's Sunday school teacher, held the book out to them. She'd been old when he was in first grade. She looked about the same now as she did then, as far as he could remember. Sure thing, Miss Powell. He reached for the pen. How high's your wheat? It's up about four inches and looking good. I did a nitrogen treatment last week and it greened up nice. Of course, the sprayer stuck on that corner that borders your farm and I burnt the dickens out of a quarter acre. It happens. She lowered her voice and leaned over the table. Who's that girl running around with Ames? He didn't bother to play dumb. Everyone knew if Ames was in town, she'd been with Palmer. Ames said her friend Katie was coming up this weekend. I don't know anything else about her. He would have if he'd been paying attention on the ride to Fargo. Ames is quite a looker, but this Katie isn't too shabby either. She reached over the table and lightly hit Palmer's arm. You make sure you introduce yourself to her. She winked. Wouldn't hurt Ames to have a little competition. Palmer stared at Miss Powell. His mind twirled. Ames was so competitive. She thrived on competition. Was it possible that he could spur her into feeling something for him if he gave Katie attention? He realized Miss Powell seemed to be waiting for him to say something. Yeah, I'll do that. Looking around, he realized Pap had hobbled off without him. I better catch up to Pap. You come back and get some food later. You're looking a little thin. Yeah, bro, you're looking a little thin. You know she was talking about your brain. Sawyer clasped him on the shoulder. Palmer turned, throwing an arm around his back and smacking him a couple of times. Actually, if anyone needed fattening up, it was Sawyer. He wore a full beard, but it didn't hide the hollows in his cheeks. He'd always been slim, but despite his broad shoulders, Palmer would bet his ribs were sticking out like a starving dog's. Sawyer was never a very good cook, but the way he was living on the farm, with no house and just a small shed, it'd be harder than ever to stir up a decent meal. You actually are looking like you haven't eaten in a week, Palmer said, his eyes leaving Sawyer to scan the crowd. He finally saw Pap sitting on the bleachers. Don't let me lose Pap. Figured I'd sit with him for a while. You and Ames will probably be into something. Heard she was back in town for the summer. 
It didn't surprise Palmer that Sawyer knew. Small-town gossip traveled quicker than the flu. Yeah, I don't know if she's going to do the haystacking contest or not. She swore she wasn't ever going to do it again after she swerved so sharp she tipped me out last year. Sawyer laughed. That was funny. I wonder how much she charged me to do it again. Is Ford showing up? Palmer asked about Sawyer's best friend, even though he figured he knew the answer. No. Miss Donna had a daughter and two boys. Ty, who'd left to become a professional hockey player, and Ford. Ford had gotten caught in a grain auger right after he came back from college. It took the bottom part of his leg, and the way he'd lost his balance, it had taken about half his face, too. The girls had considered him handsome before that, but his fiancée broke it off with him, and he pretty much became a recluse. Ford had developed some kind of gaming apparatus and built a massive tech company. The guy had millions, but Palmer hadn't seen him in years. He doing okay? Sawyer shrugged. He's making money hand over fist, but he's being eaten by bitterness, and honestly, he's turning mean. Georgia keeps house for him, Sawyer said, referring to Ford's sister. But the way he treats her, I wouldn't be surprised if she leaves. Louise told me the church community committee has been out to see him numerous times, but he sends them away. I know Miss Donna appreciates their efforts because even she can't get through to him. Yeah, I don't know what to do for him. He needs a good woman. Now that's not happening. After Shauna broke up with him because of his face, he hates women. Sawyer adjusted his cowboy hat. Where's Louise? I should do more to help you guys with Graham and Pap. Looks to me like you're working yourself to the bone. Literally, man. He expected Sawyer to laugh, but he just shook his head. It was a hard winter. Is there any different kind in North Dakota? Sawyer grunted. Here comes Ames. He smacked Palmer's shoulder. Go have fun, bro. I'll be the man of the family tonight. Which meant he'd watch Pap and take care of Louise and Tella. Not that there was any danger in the local town festival. Although, with the oil wells and workers moving in, it had gotten more dangerous in some areas, which made the locals even more suspicious of outsiders, which was anyone not born in North Dakota. Sawyer walked off toward the bleachers. Palmer turned around, searching for Ames. He spotted her coming toward him with the tall, dark-haired woman beside her. Remembering what Miss Powell said, Palmer grinned and walked toward Ames. Palmer, hey! This is Katie. I told you she was coming up for the weekend. He held his hand out and she shook it. Nice to meet you, Katie. Where are you from? You mean Ames didn't tell you about me? Nope, not a word. Palmer hid his wicked grin over Ames' outraged look. She'd said plenty. He'd just not paid attention. So, are you from Texas? Since she had what sounded to him like a New England accent, he said Texas just to get Ames' ire up. It worked, too, because she narrowed her eyes and crossed her arms over her chest. Katie, standing a little in front of Ames, couldn't see her reaction and answered enthusiastically. No way! I'm originally from Maine, but I'm living in New York City right now. Palmer had felt a little bit of hope when she said Maine. Their winters weren't nearly as severe as North Dakota, but if she was living in New York, she most likely wasn't going to be interested in moving to a ranch in Sweetwater. Still, it didn't hurt to be charming, although mostly he didn't want Ames to rip into him next week because he didn't try hard enough or some such other nonsense. I need to go talk to Louise. I'll catch up, Ames said. Katie barely looked at her. She slipped her arm through his, and he forced himself not to move away, like his first reaction would have him do. Rather, he bent his head and tried to focus on her words as she talked about how amazing New York City was and how she loved the atmosphere and the action and how culturally deep it was. He didn't see the value in what she obviously loved, but he tried to look thoughtful and nod at the proper moments as they strolled to the exposition building. Katie looked up when they reached the door. What's in here? She peered inside while he answered. Antique tractors. 
steam power tractors, steel wheels. Usually there's a short paragraph about who donated it and what relevance it had to our country or their farm. She wrinkled her nose. Sounds boring. I won't make you walk through it with me. She leaned her head toward his and laughed like they were sharing a joke. He actually really enjoyed walking through the expo building. This was equipment his ancestors had used. It was hard enough to pull crops from the ground with modern equipment. He always felt a stirring of pride and respect for the men and women whose shoulders he stood on. But he forced a chuckle and allowed Katie to guide him away. Oh, wait! Mr. Zyset called from the building entrance. Sign the guest book! Katie had a slightly baffled look on her face, but she walked back and picked up the pen. She slipped her hand out of his arm. He took the short reprieve to look around for Ames. Chapter 8 Ames watched Palmer walk away with Katie hanging onto his arm. He wore his typical good outfit, clean jeans and a button-down shirt. The sleeves were rolled up, exposing his tanned and muscled forearms. The cowboy hat and boots were a given. When she'd pointed him out to Katie, Katie had gone gaga over the real cowboy. She'd marveled at his strong jaw and broad shoulders and winked, saying something about riding the cowboy. Ames had stared at her with her mouth open. Not that Katie had noticed, because she was drooling over Palmer, but a black, ugly horror had stolen over Ames. What had she done? It hadn't been that long, but Katie had changed since they'd worked together. Maybe it was the effects of living in the city. Katie wasn't interested in marrying Palmer. She just wanted him for a good time. And Palmer, although he worked hard, wasn't afraid of anything, and could survive a North Dakota winter with nothing more than his rifle and a box of matches, wasn't wise in the ways of a worldly girl like Katie had become. She'd make mincemeat out of his heart. The thought of Katie wrapping her arms around Palmer made the black feeling erupt in a putrid mess. Palmer was perfect just the way he was. He didn't need the kind of education Katie would give him. It was all Ames' fault. She shouldn't have guilted Palmer into at least giving Katie a try. Normally, Palmer wouldn't have given Katie a second look. But if Ames were being honest, she'd never really seen Palmer give any girl a second look. Which is why she'd known he'd need help and pushed him to at least give Katie a real chance. Now, he'd think she was ridiculous if she walked over there and tried to take Katie away from him, not to mention Katie would hate her. She chewed her nail and tried to think of what to do. Hey, Ames, what's wrong? Louise held a plate of food in each hand and two bottles of pop and two napkins with plasticware under her arm. Here, let me help you. Ames took the pop bottles. Thanks, this is my first trip for Graham and Pap. Where's Tella? Louise looked around. Saw your hazard. I think they were going to enter the pig wrestling contest. Ames forced a laugh she hoped sounded genuine. Hope you brought a change of clothes for her. Yes, ma'am, don't leave home without them. They laughed. Ames helped Louise as they handed the plates of food to Graham and Pap and got them situated with their drinks and utensils. Now a trip for me. She eyed Ames. Where's Palmer? Usually you two are joined at the hip. I've never seen you fight. No. She drew the word out, unsure of how much to say. Palmer hadn't told his family about the letter and money. I have a friend visiting from New York City, and he's showing her around. A woman? Yes, a former co-worker. Really? Louise looked around like she needed to see it to believe it. Palmer really didn't spend time with girls other than her. There weren't that many single girls his age in Sweetwater anyway. Yeah, I was kind of thinking they might make a good couple, but... She hesitated. Louise's blue eyes, so much like Palmer's, seemed to search into her soul, and she found the words tumbling out. I kind of thought about setting them up, but Katie is different than I remember. So much more worldly than Palmer... 
I'm afraid he won't be able to handle her and she'll take advantage of him. Maybe even break his heart. Palmer isn't a one-night stand kind of guy, and I didn't realize until Katie saw him that's all she's looking for. So you think she's going to force Palmer to... Louise spoke slowly, like she wasn't quite sure she understood the issue. Ames tried not to twist her hands together. Well, I know Palmer is able to make good decisions. I'd trust him with my life, anywhere. I know he's an honest man with character and integrity, but... Then what's the problem? He's going to see through Katie right away. She shrugged. And he doesn't want that kind of girl, so he'll be ditching her and probably running to you, begging you to get rid of her. Louise's voice trailed off. Um, or maybe not. Ames snapped her head around. On the far side of the food tables where they were making the homemade ice cream, someone had roped Palmer into cranking the handle. They must have already had a batch made because Katie held a bowl and laughed as she fed Palmer a spoonful. Palmer had taken his button down off and his muscles bulged in his t-shirt as he turned the crank. Katie had his hat on her head and his shirt tied around her slim waist. As she held the spoon out, Palmer opened his mouth, but just as the spoon came to his lips, he twisted his head, jerking forward, and caught her finger in his teeth, never missing a beat on the crank. Katie squealed and jumped and laughed, putting her hand on Palmer's shoulder and her head down next to his. They looked for all the world like they didn't know another person was within a mile of them and they were having the time of their lives. Hate for her friends surged through Ames, and she closed her eyes. She couldn't hate Katie. Anyone who saw Palmer would want him for herself. Just, Palmer had never even looked twice at another girl. Not that Ames could ever remember. So, never mind, Louise said. I guess Palmer is as dumb as dirt, and all it takes is a pretty face, and he forgets everything he was brought up to believe. Ames looked at Louise. There was more than a little bitterness in her tone, and Ames figured whatever she was thinking had more to do with whatever had happened that had produced Tella. Louise shook her head. Sorry, I thought Palmer was better than that. Me too, Ames said distractedly. She knew something she could do to get them separated, but it was probably too little too late. A sadness, deep and strong, pulled at her heart and for some reason, she felt like she had missed out on something special. I signed us up for the haystacking contest. Palmer glanced up from where he and Katie stood watching the horse-pulling contest. Ames stood with her hands on her hips, looking at him oddly, which he didn't appreciate because he'd been trying his best to be nice to Katie, since he didn't want to hear Ames telling him he didn't try hard enough when he told her, after Katie left, of course, that he felt less than nothing for Katie, although she was a nice girl in a city slicker kind of way. You're doing the haystacking contest? Katie asked Ames in disbelief. Sure, I'll drive the tractor and Palmer will throw the bales on the wagon and stack them. Whoever does it the fastest without having their hay bales fall off wins. Palmer and I have won a bunch. Not the last time we did it, which was a few years ago. Well, no. Ames had the grace to duck her head and look a little ashamed. As well, she should. What's that about? Katie asked, looking between the two of them as though she'd find the answer on their faces. It's about Palmer falling off the wagon, Ames said. Really? Katie's eyes opened wide. You want to finish that story? Palmer asked with a lifted brow. He loved seeing her squirm. And it wasn't his fault he fell off the wagon. Right, so they have some obstacles like what you might encounter in a real hay field, and it's possible that I ran over a gopher hole just as I was cornering, maybe too fast. Maybe, he asked, just to rub it in. Okay, I was going too fast, but really, it's not like it mattered. I don't think you'd be saying that if you were the one who fell off the wagon, holding a hay bale, I might add, so I couldn't twist to keep from landing on my shoulder. To top it off, another bale fell off and hit me in the head. Did you get hurt? Katie asked with a hand over her mouth. 
Nah. He had a brush burn on the side of his head for three weeks. Can't believe it didn't leave a scar. I can't believe I'm still talking to you. And I can't believe you signed us up again. No, what I really can't believe is that they let you sign up. You should be banned from the sport for life. Some people around here appreciate an Olympic-caliber athlete, Ames said with her nose in the air, but a smile tilted her lips up. Haystacking is a sport? You can be banned? Katie blinked her eyes at him, wrapping her hand around his bicep. She'd taken his hat when they were making ice cream and never gave it back. He felt mostly naked without it, but he hadn't wanted to upset her by grabbing it off her head. He'd actually tried to inconspicuously knock it off a couple of times, but he'd missed. It was just as well. No, he was just kidding about that, Ames said. She bumped his shoulder with hers. He caught her light scent. Something wild that reminded him of summer picnics and Fourth of July fireworks. So much different than the heavy, sweet smell of Katie. Are you going to take another chance on me this year? Ames asked. Before he could answer, Katie said, I'll do it, let me. He met Ames' eyes, hoping his expression wasn't as horrified as hers was. They both laughed. What? Katie asked. Palmer's grin got bigger. Sure, you can ride on the tractor with me, and we'll have the Olympic-caliber athlete in the back stacking the bales. Chapter 9 This was the dumbest idea anyone had ever had. Ames shoved another bale of hay on the wagon. At least they didn't make the bales heavy. Not nearly as heavy as the ones Palmer had in his barn. Most of his bales were big round bales, but they usually did a couple hundred small square bales every summer. But his were longer and tighter, and she could barely lift them. These were loose and light. Still, she'd always driven the tractor on the farm in the summer and in the competition. She'd stacked hay maybe twice in her life. She wasn't good at it. Palmer made it look easy. He was making the tractor driving look easy, too and Katie looked good sitting next to him on the fender, her hand braced on his shoulder. He still wore just his T-shirt. Katie still had his cowboy hat on, which had garnered more than a few second looks. Katie and Palmer would be the gossip of the town this weekend. The thought should make her happy if she really wanted Palmer to be serious about finding a wife. Hopping off the wagon, she threw another bale on, then hopped back on to move it into position. Palmer kept the tractor at a smooth pace, slowing down without jerking and working the clutch like he was born in the seat. His blonde head and broad shoulders looked good next to Katie's dark hair that hung down her back and her slim figure. Somehow, she managed to look like a supermodel on a big city parade float, rather than like she was sitting on a tractor in the middle of Sweetwater, population 500, counting pets as well as people. Ames fitted the bale with the other five she'd already put on and walked over to the side to hop back off. Palmer seemed to be able to anticipate her movements and adjusted the tractor speed accordingly. He also missed the holes that were designed to imitate gopher holes. She picked the next bale of hay up and tossed it onto the wagon. Only her fingers got stuck in the twine, and she jerked the bale back toward her face. She stumbled back, Hayseeds falling in her face and hair and down her shirt. Frustrated, she yanked her hand out. The wagon stopped. Palmer shouted. Glancing up, she saw him set the brake and hop down, jogging back. She closed her eyes for a second. He was switching places with her, thankfully. Moving quickly, she headed up toward the tractor. Katie had gotten off and was walking out of the course over to the spectators. Because of Ames' clumsiness, they had no chance of winning, but she still hurried to the tractor. When she passed Palmer, he grabbed her arm and leaned down. You okay? Yeah, she said, brushing down her shirt. Just mad that I'm covered in hayseeds. He stuck a hand on her head and ruffled her hair. It's cute. It's itchy. A 
partner that doesn't complain is hard to find. He let go of her arm and slapped her back gently. Go on, get up there and don't hit any holes. Thanks. She turned toward the tractor and got on, pushing the clutch in and hooking second. She glanced back and Palmer was already on the wagon, the hay bales stacked, and he was firming up the stacking she'd already done. She let the clutch out slowly, trying not to jerk it. She'd never be able to drive as smooth as Palmer had, but at least she could keep from jerking the guy off the wagon again. A long cat whistle broke through the rumble of the crowd and pierced through the belching of the tractor. Ames looked over to see Katie, still wearing Palmer's hat and just pulling her fingers out from between her lips. She screamed something at Palmer and waved her hands. Whatever she said made the crowd laugh, and Palmer waved his hand. The announcer, who was just a rancher with a megaphone, said something about Ames' tractor-driving skills and Palmer's bravery for getting on a wagon pulled by her again. She quit looking at the crowd and focused on where she was going. Every second that she had to watch Katie flirt with Palmer was torture. She didn't want to examine why. It was all her idea, after all. She just hadn't realized how wrong Katie would be for Palmer. But as she thought about the other two friends that she had invited to spend time with her, she couldn't think of one of them who would be right. Palmer needed someone fun, but to be able to withstand the hard work of ranch life. Someone who could handle the monotony and harshness of a North Dakota winter, and who wouldn't hesitate to bundle up and head out to feed and water the stock. Someone who would appreciate Palmer for the great guy he was, understand his love of the land, and not look down on the pride he had in his heritage. Katie definitely wasn't the one. She didn't think her other two friends were either, but it was a little late to uninvite them. Palmer needed someone more like Ames. Which one of her friends was the most like her? She'd have to think about that before she made a recommendation to Palmer. He'd take her advice, she was sure of it. Especially about this, since he would admit he really wasn't proficient in picking out a future bride. Not that she'd ever chosen a life partner, either. That was if Palmer didn't hit it off with Katie to the point where he didn't want to see anyone else. She needed to convince him that he had to test the rest of the field and not settle for the first one that came along. Shouldn't be hard. It was going to be hard. Ames blinked and looked again. Sure as heck looked like Palmer, his hand against the back of the expo building, Katie leaning against it, still wearing his hat. Palmer said something low, and Katie laughed. A pain, sharp and hot, pierced through Ames' chest. This wasn't supposed to be a problem. But Sawyer had driven home with Louise and said he'd help put Graham and Pap to bed, and Palmer had stayed, helping the committee to clean up and get ready for the festivities tomorrow evening. Everyone else was clearing out, and Ames had gone looking for Palmer and Katie and found them behind the expo building. Palmer practically had his arm around Katie. She wanted this, right? Only if Katie was thinking marriage and not a nice North Dakota distraction. Even then, Ames wasn't so sure. Palmer was too good for the person Katie had become. There you guys are. Katie jumped, but Palmer didn't even twitch. Almost like he had known she was behind them, which was impossible unless the man had eyes in the back of his head. But he still wasn't moving, like he wanted to finish what he had started here and was waiting for her to give him the privacy to do so. If that's what he wanted, too bad. Come on, Katie, it's time to go home. We're opening the sea store tomorrow morning. You're opening the sea store. Her voice held enough flirt to sink bubble wrap. I've been trying to talk Palmer into taking me out to see the ranch. Tonight. Ames blinked. Of course, she knew what the rest of the world did, but not Palmer. Ames forced her tone to be light. Palmer needs to get up early and tend to his stock. I think he said something about spraying the flax tomorrow, too. I was actually going to plant sunflowers in the West Hundred Acre piece. Oh, wow, that sounds so exciting. I would just love to help. 
I've always wanted to plant sunflowers. Now Katie was just sounding stupid, like she was drunk. Ames narrowed her eyes. She'd never known Palmer to drink. At all. Katie, I need to talk to Palmer. Alone. Ames put her hands on her hips. Katie stuck her lip out. Ames' phone buzzed in her pocket, but she ignored it for now, waiting to argue with Katie if need be. Palmer said, you go on over there and sit down at the picnic table. We'll be along shortly. Katie stuck her lip out even farther. She crossed her arms over her chest, and that's when Ames saw the brown paper bag she held by the neck of the bottle inside. Ames rolled her eyes. Feelings she couldn't even begin to name surged and rolled through her. She hadn't realized that finding a wife for Palmer was going to be so hard, or so frustrating, or that it was going to turn her into a jealous green monster. Palmer waited until Katie disappeared around the corner of the building before he turned to Ames. In the glow of the pole light, she could see the tired lines around his eyes, the droop of his shoulders, the slight downturn of his lips, like he was tired and discouraged. She forgot what she was going to say about Katie. I'm sorry that we didn't win the haystacking contest. I know how much you hate to lose. He shrugged and she almost smacked herself in the forehead. Palmer wasn't competitive like she was. Sure, he played to win every time he played, but he didn't get his ego wrapped up in it like she did. What's wrong? She asked. What'd you want to talk to me about? Are you angry that I interrupted you and Katie? You guys looked kind of cozy. His eyes widened. He looked over his shoulder, then leaned closer. I'm relieved. I've spent the entire evening with her, and it's worse than babysitting a two-year-old on his worst day. You look like you were about to kiss her. There was a note of hurt in her voice. She hoped he didn't notice. He blew out a breath and slapped a hand against his leg. I couldn't keep her hands off me. If I crowded her space, she seemed to get coy. It was the only thing I could do. Palmer wouldn't lie to her, but it was hard for her to wrap her head around the fact that he'd had a horrible evening. But you guys look so happy. He made a sound suspiciously like a growl. There is never going to be anything between Katie and me. But I knew if I didn't give it my best shot, I'd hear about it from you, and I didn't want you to be upset. You were laughing and cozy with Katie all evening to keep me happy? For some reason, part of her needed to hear him repeat it. Yeah. Did I do a good enough job? Can you keep her away from me the rest of the time she's here? She's expecting to plant sunflowers with you tomorrow. Relief flew fast and cool through her, and Ames couldn't help teasing him. I've never asked you to lie for me, but could you tell her I had to make an emergency parts run for the tractor? To Mexico? You would melt in Mexico. She touched his shoulder, needing the contact. Katie doesn't know that. You're the only one who knows that. He put his hand on her head like he was going to ruffle her hair, only he smoothed it down instead, running his hand down, watching it like he'd never seen it before. Are you okay? He said, his voice low and rough. She nodded. All her words had deserted her. I saw that hay bale hit you, and I about knocked Katie off the fender in my rush to get out of the tractor seat. She snorted. I mean, I knew it wouldn't hurt you. Those things weigh about three pounds each, but... They weighed more than three pounds. Ames put her hands on her hips. It didn't hurt so much, but I got hay seeds all through my hair and down my shirt. He chuckled, low and deep and the sound sent a thrill through her soul. Her eyes opened a little wider as an awareness straightened her spine. She put a hand on his chest, not sure whether to keep him away or to bring him closer. His lips curved up, and for the first time in her life, she wondered what those lips would feel like on her skin. 
Her eyes dragged up his face, noting the stubble on his strong jaw, the fine lines at the sides of his eyes, the deep blue, almost black in the dim light of his irises. He moved closer until there were only inches between them. She wanted him even closer. Something inside of her, something small and very distant, shouted that she needed to back off, walk away, that Palmer was about to kiss her and it would ruin everything. But ever since the night he'd held her on the porch in the rain, she'd wanted to be closer, and she wanted this now. His hand came up, rough against the skin of her neck as it slid behind her hair, his thumb by her ear. His eyes had lowered. Her hand had slid from his chest to his hard shoulder. Her fingers dug in, urging him closer. He didn't resist her. Her breathing felt shallow and fast. Suddenly, her lips were dry, and she used the tip of her tongue to moisten them. Palmer growled. She couldn't mistake that sound for anything else, and lowered his head, touching his lips to hers. It was lightning all over again, with the crack and boom of thunder flung in. She reeled from the impact, pressing closer to the dependable man before her. She was hot, flushed and dizzy. Her nails dug into his shoulders, and she let out a growl of her own, frustrated that she couldn't get closer. Forgetting where they were and that Palmer was her best friend, her buddy, her pal until, with another flash, she remembered it all. She pulled back. He let her go. She pressed against the building, one hand hovering above her mouth, a finger on lips that thrummed with heat and nerves. She'd never been so aware of her lips before in her life. She panted. The man in front of her was winded, too. They stared at each other, the same thoughts that started to rip through her head showed in his eyes. How could they have done that? Why? After all these years, they'd had such a great friendship. But one kiss didn't have to ruin it. They could pretend it never happened. Palmer recovered first. I'm walking Katie home. To your house. Okay she managed to squeak out. I'm not leaving till I watch you walk in. Okay, she said again, a little firmer this time. I'll make sure she knows that I'm not interested in anything with her. Okay. Palmer stepped closer and put a hand lightly on her upper arm. Say something besides okay. The last time that was all you could say, I found out later from your mom that your dog had died during the night. His lip tilted up. I don't want to find out anything died tonight. Oh, man. She hoped their friendship hadn't died. That would be the worst thing that could happen to them. She tried to unlock her tongue. I have to get the bag of tablecloths and mom's casserole dish. I'll be five minutes behind you. Any longer than that, and I'm coming back to look for you. Okay. This time, she said it to be smart, and his teeth flashed. His eyes probably crinkled, but she didn't know that because her gaze was hooked on his lips. You keep looking at me like that, and I'm gonna forget the frig about Katie and not care how drunk she is and let her find her own way home. Aim slid against the wall until she was out from in front of him and scurried, yes, scurried away. Chapter 10 Palmer plucked his hat from Katie's head and helped her stand up from the picnic table. Everything in him wanted to be with Ames right now. Kissing her, preferably, but just being with her would be enough. Talking to her would be better. Making sure that he hadn't ruined everything tonight that the kiss that had catapulted his world into a different dimension hadn't destroyed 15 years of friendship. Give me your hat, cowboy. Katie slapped sloppily in the direction of his head. He dodged out of the way easily. 
Get up. I'll make sure you get home. I'm going home with you, cowboy. He didn't like hearing her call him cowboy. That was Ames' nickname for him, and it felt all kinds of wrong coming from another woman's lips. She needed to find her own cowboy. This one was taken. He snorted. Ames hadn't taken him, no matter how badly he wanted her to. The empty bottle sat on the table. The balled-up bag lay on the ground a few feet away. He picked them both up, but volunteers had already emptied the garbage cans, so he kept them in one hand and helped steady Katie with the other. There was no heat in her touch, just a faint sense of revulsion. Like he wanted to lift his fingers up and only touch her with the necessary appendages. Not like Ames, where he couldn't touch her enough. The skin on her neck had been so soft and warm, and her scent had been just right. Everything about her was perfect, from her sassy grin to her long toes and pointy elbows. Finally, Katie was on her feet and moving towards Ames' house. He looked around for Ames, but didn't see her on the deserted street. At nine o'clock on a normal night, Sweetwater was pretty much dead. Because of the festival, folks were out a little later, but it was pushing midnight, and most of the houses were completely dark. Ames lived at the opposite end of the street from the park grounds. Her parents' two-story traditional house had the white picket fence and a big maple tree in the front yard. It sat right next to the sea store, which was the last building on the edge of town. It was an hour to the next small town. The road between was scattered with farms and ranches, a few houses. It was a hard and desolate life, but it made the sense of community stronger. Palmer couldn't imagine living anywhere else. But he couldn't imagine living without Ames, either. He helped Katie through the gate, unsure if she was as drunk as she seemed or if she were deliberately falling into him. You gonna kiss me goodnight, cowboy? He did not flinch. Okay, maybe he backed up a step. Katie, I'm glad we got to spend some time together tonight, but I think you probably agree with me that there's nothing between us. I wouldn't say that. She smiled. Then her eyes got real big, and she stumbled to the bushes beside the house. Palmer winced at the retching noises that came as she doubled over. He hoped the alcohol that was coming up didn't kill Mrs. Hansen's plans. When she finished, he made sure she got up the walk and in the house without falling over. Then he walked over and threw her trash in the sea store dumpster, looking at the container and trying to figure out exactly what kind of liquor she'd been drinking. Surely it wasn't beer. Must have been something a little stronger, but he didn't recognize the name on the bottle. By the time he'd come back to their house, he could see Ames walking down the sidewalk, carrying a big bag. He leaned against the maple in her front yard, his hands in his pockets. Everything in him wanted to walk to her, take the bag, and kiss her again, but he still didn't know how the kiss had changed things. She came in the gate and stopped in front of him. I'm home. Now you can go home. He didn't move. Said I was staying until you got in the house. You know, when I'm not here, I manage to take care of myself just fine. Her words caused a shock of pain to ping out from his heart to his fingers and toes. He wanted the right to take care of her all the time wanted it like he wanted his next breath. He kept his hands shoved in his pockets and his shoulder against the tree and his mouth closed, just to be sure he didn't do or say something stupid. I just got a text from Mindy, my friend from Seattle, confirming that she and Janelle are coming in next weekend. His heart slowly fell to his feet, like a three-day-old helium balloon. It hovered there, just waiting for her to kick it. It didn't take long. Listen, I think with the festival and with Katie here and everything that things just got a little crazy. She paused. 
The bag crackled as her fingers twisted in it. I think we ought to pretend that tonight never happened. She looked up at him with eyes filled with confusion and uncertainty. He wanted to argue. He wanted to insist that they move forward, not back. But he didn't want to lose everything. Finally, she braced her feet and lifted her head. Palmer, you need to get married. I talked a little with Louise tonight, and of course she didn't complain, but she's worried about Pap. He needs better care, more therapy, but she's worried that it will kill Graham to sell the ranch. She was born on that ranch. She's lived on it for over 80 years. But she can't do everything necessary to take care of Pap. She paused, then said, You can fix this. It was on the tip of his tongue to say, Just marry me, to her. But her next words stole his. I told you I applied for that job in L.A., I should know in the next two weeks if I'm going for an interview. If I get it, I'm moving. He gritted his teeth, shoving his jaw out against the pain. You can keep the ranch. You can pay for your pap's care. You know what you have to do. Her words cut him, scraping his chest and bruising his heart. He'd been worried about ruining what they had, and that was a distinct possibility but she could be leaving anyway. And he couldn't imagine it, but if he got married to someone else, then nothing would be the same again. He pushed off from the tree, pulling his hands out of his pockets. He stopped right in front of her. I don't want to pretend that nothing happened tonight. To me, that's the coward's way out. From the tree, he hadn't seen the pain in her own eyes. But now it was clear, as were the tears that filled them. Then I'm a coward. She turned and jogged to her house, taking the porch steps two at a time and fumbling with the bag as she opened the door and slipped in. She didn't turn around and give him a saucy wave or a silly grin, and that hurt almost as much as anything else that happened that night. Ames texted Palmer Saturday around lunchtime to let him know she was spending the afternoon at the festival with Katie. By 11, the ground had dried out enough that he'd been able to plant sunflowers, and he didn't bother going to the house for lunch. He'd be taking over for Louise, who had to be at work by four, and he wanted to get as many seeds in the ground as possible. At 25 past three, he walked into the house, and Louise met him at the door. Tell us coming with me today. Miss Donna said she'd help keep an eye on her, and she can run around the festival while I work my shift at the diner. She'll be fine. You'd rather go to the festival than spend the evening with your uncle? He put a hand to his chest. That hurts. Ames wasn't out today? That's kind of weird. Are they short on help at the sea store? Louise asked as she put her phone in her purse and pulled her car keys out. No, Katie was still there and she was entertaining her. Tella opened the door and walked out. Louise looked after her for a moment before she said, You and Katie seemed to hit it off yesterday. Are you bringing Graham and Pap in and spending the evening with her again? Not really, and no, I'd rather pull weeds than spend five more minutes with Katie. Wow, you two were pretty cozy when I saw you. Did you fight? No, she's just not my type. Louise paused with her hand on the screen door. I didn't know you had a type. Whatever Ames was, that was his type. It's not Katie, I can tell you that much. But I had to be nice to her because she was Ames' friend, and Ames would have let me have it if she thought I wasn't trying hard enough to be sociable with her. Louise narrowed her eyes. Were you trying to make Ames jealous? He dropped his eyes and turned toward the sink, putting soap on his hands. Didn't work. Maybe it had worked a little. Their kiss flashed through his mind. He would remember it 
forever. Palmer? He looked over, his hands under the water, washing the soap off. Why don't you just tell her how you feel? She applied for a job in L.A. If she gets it, she's moving out. Go with her. The air pressed out of his lungs, and he felt the same, deflated. He lifted his eyes and looked out the window over the sink. Flat fields as far as he could see. Big blue sky. Over half the year it was covered in snow. Cold. Blowing. Miserable, to be honest. Why did he love it so deeply? You love the land more than you love Ames? His soul was here, standing in the wind, planted in the ground, walking the fields. But Ames had his heart. Louise put her purse on the table and came over, wrapping her arms around him. I hate the grown-up decisions. He shook his hands off and held her too knowing she'd made some hard choices herself. Despite his wet hands, he gripped her shoulders and pushed her back. She'd been prying in his business. Maybe he could push her a little. You gonna tell me about Tella? A cloud passed over her face, and he regretted bringing it up. But she had to realize there were things in a person that no one else might ever know. True for him as well as for her. To his surprise, Louise answered him. She's asking me, and I can't tell her. Tell me. His eyes burned into hers. He wanted to fist his hands. Tell me, and I'll take care of the slimy bastard for you. She sighed and shook her head. No, he doesn't know about her. Palmer stood, holding her shoulders, wanting to shake her, needing to help. Tell me. No, she met his eyes. Isn't it funny how the decisions we make ripple out, affecting everyone around us? We think it's just about us and our happiness, but it's never that simple. She could be talking about the billion dollars he could have if he could just find a woman to marry him for convenience and not love and be satisfied with that. And she'd also need to be happy living in a desolate land far away from anyone else who might love her, too. Spending her life that way. If he couldn't have Ames, he'd settle for that much. But he needed a woman willing to do the same, because he wasn't going to lie to her about it. One thing for certain, it wasn't Katie. You're right, Louise. He did shake her, gently. You know... When you're ready to tell me about Tella and her father, I'm ready to listen. I can promise not to kill him until you're finished. She laughed. <laughs> See? One more reason why I can't say. You still love him? He stood still because he knew Tella wouldn't be here if Louise hadn't fancied herself in love. It made him angry, though, because Louise also probably fancied herself real close to wedding bells and the guy was a snake to have run off. Louise just smiled and turned away. We close at nine, but there are fireworks at eleven, so we'll probably be really late. You know I'll be up. Something has to give. You can't keep staying up late, sleeping with one eye open in case Pap decides to take a midnight stroll and still get up at 4.30 in the morning to do the stock and take care of the ranch. A family can run this ranch and make a good living off it. You can't do it by yourself. A wise person once said, we do what we have to. I know you don't want to lose it. But if we sold it, Graham and Pap would be set for life. I could live in town with Tella, and you could follow Ames to L.A. You want to live in town? She didn't hesitate. No. Does Tella? She gave a little grunt. Definitely not. She cries when we talk about it. Graham and Pap don't want to leave either. And Ames? He steeled his heart. I'm not her lapdog. Never have been. She loves this land, too. 
but if she needs something else, then she can go for it. You wouldn't move to L.A. for her. The man inside of him wanted to say no. He couldn't be the follower. He had to be the leader. But he was afraid that it wouldn't take much for him to kick his pride to the curb when it came to Ames. Louise lifted her brows, then pushed the screen door open and left without another word. Palmer crossed his arms over his chest and leaned against the sink. Graham stood in the doorway to the living room. I didn't know you were there. Her face wrinkled as she smiled. I know. He wanted to ask how much she had heard. Tell us father left the area. I figured. He tilted his head. You know who it is? He looked just like her when he was a boy. Not as serious. So he's from here. He always wondered if it was an oil man passing through. Although back then there weren't as many of them. Graham nodded. But I can't say something until Louise does. He had secrets, and he didn't want anyone, not even family, prying them out of him. I was going to work in the garden some. Where's Pap? Sleeping. Her face drooped, and he felt a pang of guilt. There were things they could do for Pap. Build a ramp, widen the doorways to allow a wheelchair through. More therapy. Nothing they could afford right now. You want to come out with me? Gardening was mindless work, and he could stand to lose his mind in the mundane. Tomorrow would be soon enough to deal with his problems. Chapter 11 Sunday morning, Palmer sat in the family pew with Graham and Pap. Louise played the piano as usual, and Tilla sat in the second pew back with Miss Donna, who owned a ranch on the other side of town and a craft store in town. One of her boys was the hockey star whose jersey Tella always wore and who was rumored to be buying the Sweetwater Ranch. Palmer didn't believe it. Miss Donna's other children, Georgia and Ford, lived about 45 minutes away and probably went to a church closer to their place. Since none of Donna's kids were around and her husband had died years ago, Tella usually sat with her. The fact that Miss Donna always had candy in her purse probably helped. Ames' family always sat in the pew in front and to the right of Palmer's. They were there this morning. Ames had black circles under her eyes, and Katie wasn't anywhere around. Which didn't surprise Palmer, to be honest but only confirmed he was making the right decision about her. He didn't want to spend the rest of his life with a wife who didn't get out of bed until dinner time. Ames met his eyes square on as she followed her parents to their pew. He loved that about her, the way she grabbed life with both hands and wrestled it down, which was why he would never ask her to stay in Sweetwater. She needed to choose to stay because it challenged her and thrilled her, and satisfied her. Otherwise, she'd feel smothered. But at least he was fairly certain there weren't going to be awkward feelings between the two of them over that kiss. Actually, he didn't have any awkward feelings at all, and he was more than game to do it again, and again. But for Ames' sake, he'd pretend to be friends if that's what made her happy. The service started and they stood, singing the first hymn. Palmer shared a hymn book with Graham, even though they both knew all the words by heart. Pap sang too, and Palmer loved blending his voice with his family. Ames had pulled her hair up in a loose ponytail, and it fell down her back in light brown waves. Her slender neck was exposed, and Palmer caught himself several times thinking about how soft that skin had felt under his hands rather than focusing on the Pastor Hoops' message of putting others before oneself. They stood for the last hymn and the closing prayer. The amen had barely been said when Mrs. Hansen turned around and said, Did you get your sunflowers planted? Ames said you were too busy planning to come in for the festival last evening. 
Never knew a successful farmer who needed to plant at eleven in the evening, Mr. Hansen said. Now, Oliver, Mrs. Hansen said. What? The boy needs to... Mrs. Hansen gave him a look, and he closed his mouth. It had never been a secret in Ames' house that Mr. Hansen wanted her to settle down in Sweetwater, and he thought Palmer was his ticket to seeing that happen. Palmer wished he could make both of their dreams come true, but Ames needed to make that decision for herself. Are you eating dinner on the grounds today? Mrs. Hansen asked pleasantly, like Mr. Hansen hadn't just been shushed. Yeah, Louise made a hot dish, and Tella and I threw a jello salad together. It's in the fridge downstairs. Great, you can eat with us. Mrs. Hansen turned to Graham. You were planning on it anyway, Graham, right? Graham nodded, waving at the Larsons as they went by. We usually do. Palmer and Ames were more like siblings than friends through the years. Our families could almost be one. They patchwork them together nowadays, Mrs. Hansen said. I better go see how Katie is, Ames said. She had been quiet during their conversation. Mrs. Hansen nodded and Ames slipped out. Palmer almost said he'd go along, but Louise was still playing a postlude and someone needed to care for Pap. So he was at church this morning? Katie asked skeptically as they walked down the sidewalk toward the church house. I told you he would be. Ames adjusted the hot dish in her hands. It smelled delicious. Her stomach rumbled. But I didn't believe you. If he was so busy he couldn't make it to the festival yesterday evening, I didn't think he could make it to church today. Her voice sounded whiny, and Ames was glad she was headed back to New York City tomorrow. Katie pushed her dark sunglasses up. I have a headache. Didn't you take the painkillers I gave you? They haven't started working yet. They need to kick in soon. I only have today to impress Palmer. Did he say anything about me? Ames kicked a stone off the sidewalk. Katie continued. I was a little out of it Friday night, but Palmer said he wanted to talk to you, and you guys were back there for a while. What was it he was saying? Boy, she didn't want to go there. They hadn't been talking. Not much, anyway. If it weren't so sad, it'd be laughable. Ames had been concerned that Palmer wouldn't be able to handle Katie, but she had ended up with the opposite problem. Katie smoothed the hand down her loose sweater and pants. Maybe I should have worn jeans instead of these leggings. I should have borrowed a pair of your boots. Palmer probably likes a girl in boots. Ames wasn't paying too much attention, just thinking about what a mess she'd made. Ames, are you going to help me out? What did he say about me? Irritation laced Katie's voice. Ames tried to think of something she could say that was nice, but didn't give Katie false hope. On the one hand, Katie might be willing to leave the city and move to Sweetwater at the rate she was obsessing over Palmer. But she didn't put Ames in mind of the type of woman that would stay. I think Palmer moves slow. That was true, at least. It had taken him 15 years to kiss her. The wait had been worth it. Every second of it. She wouldn't mind more kissing like that. She tried to shut that thought down. Things had been pretty natural between them this morning. If they were going to salvage their friendship, she needed to push thoughts of kissing right out the window. Katie giggled. I think you're right. I hinted around a couple of times that I wanted him to kiss me, but he just gave me that slow, sexy smile and my heart pounded so loud and fast I didn't even care that he never got around to it. She adjusted the chain around her neck. I bet he's a great kisser. Ames' stomach tightened, either from fear that Katie would ask her if she'd ever kissed Palmer or the thought of Katie kissing Palmer. Either way, she needed a subject change. Palmer likes girls that can cook. I'm really good at ordering takeout. 
There is no takeout in Sweetwater. Oh, sister, Katie put her hand on Ames' arm. He is going to fall so hard and so fast for me that he's going to pick up and follow me to the city. She smiled the smile that was as old as Eve. Or as old as the serpent. It was hard to differentiate. I don't think Palmer would be happy in New York City. I think Palmer will be happy wherever I am. They turned at the church and walked back through the parking lot. The picnic tables and pavilion were in the back. Katie wouldn't understand about Palmer and his love of the land. Didn't he say anything to you when he walked you home? I was kind of drunk. I think I asked him to kiss me. and I think he was going to, but then I threw up. She shrugged. Bummer, but I couldn't keep running three blocks down to the bar to buy beer, so I had to get something strong enough to last me the evening. You could have just drunk Diet Pepsi like everyone else. The artificial sweeteners in that are really bad for you. Ames looked sideways at Katie. She wanted to ask if Jim Beam was any better, but she just let it go. There he is. Oh my gosh. I thought maybe I dreamed how gorgeous he was, but he really is gorgeous. How have I known you for so long and not known about the absolutely stunningly handsome man in your little hometown? The way she said little hometown seemed very condescending to Ames, but she knew Katie didn't mean it as an insult to her. She just truly didn't think that anyone with a brain would live in a place like Sweetwater. Maybe Ames felt a little like that at one point, although she loved the people and the town. Maybe she had just felt more stifled in Sweetwater when she was younger. No place that she'd ever been, though, had ever felt like home to her other than Sweetwater. Ames never answered Katie. One of the ladies that Katie had met at the festival yesterday stopped and asked Katie why she wasn't in church. Ames hit a smirk and held up the hot dish she was carrying, indicating she was going to set it on the food table. Palmer stood in the slow-moving food line with her dad and his pap, their backs to her. She'd better warn him about Katie. But as she drew closer, she couldn't help but hear what her dad was saying. The girl needs to settle down, I'm telling you. She just needs a man to put a leash on her. Soon enough, when she has a bunch of little ones running around, then she'll have to stay home and won't feel the need to prance around the countryside so much. Ames pursed her lips and waited for the old man in front of her to move. If she set the hot dish down now, she'd probably smash it into the table. She started forward but paused as Palmer's words came back to her. I have to respectfully disagree, sir. Just because you and I love it here doesn't mean that she does or ever will. She needs the freedom to choose. Then she needs you to support her decision. Most of all, I think she needs to know you love her no matter what she does. Well, of course I do. She knows that. I'm her dad. I just want her to be home. Palmer shook his head. Love means letting go. The harder you hold on, the more it seems you love yourself over her. Her dad turned from the food he was dishing out and stared at Palmer. I want the best for her. Palmer shrugged, watching as the man in front of Pap moved, and Pap carefully and slowly scooped a dish with mashed potatoes onto the plate Palmer held for him. When she was little, you could force those decisions that you knew were best for her. Now you can't. If she stays because she feels guilty, you're not really showing love. You're showing selfishness. Hmm. Palmer lifted his head like he was staring into the distance. It hurts like heck every time she leaves. You can say that again. To watch her walk away, it rips my heart out every time. Palmer held his hand out. But you see? Trying to get her to stay only eases our pain. It's not for her. A shock tore through Ames. It was odd that Palmer was being so open with her dad. 
but everyone knew they were best friends. His words could be taken like they were coming from a very good friend. Her dad didn't know that he'd kissed her last night. A thrill zapped through her chest at that thought. Her dad spoke. You saying she can't be happy here? No, I think happiness is a choice, he grunted. Which means, I guess that I could be happy in the city. But I get to live where I choose, and if you love Ames, you'll love her no matter where she chooses to live. He reached up and helped Pap grab a scoop of noodles, which Pap couldn't keep in the spoon. Her dad stood looking down at the dinnerware in his hand. He finally said, You love my daughter. Palmer pinched his lips together and blew out a long, drawn-out breath. Ames found herself holding hers. OMG, I finally got away from that old lady. She wanted me to sign up for the 4th of July decorating committee. Katie arrived at Ames' side, breathless. She reached up and rubbed Palmer's shoulder. I'm here, cowboy. The side of Palmer's face tightened before he turned his head to acknowledge Katie. His eyes lit when he saw Ames, and they stared at each other for several long seconds while the world faded around them. She didn't know what he was thinking but she was reliving every second of their kiss. The feel of his lips on hers, his rough hand on her skin, his fresh air, untamed scent. Her eyes fell to his lips. Suddenly, her own were very dry, and she touched her tongue to them. Heat flared in his blue eyes, darkening them, and a tension seemed to emanate from him, crackling in the air between them. Her eyes widened and she lowered her gaze. He glanced back at Katie. I see. Turning around, he helped Pap pick up plasticware and poured him a drink. Save me a seat, Katie said to his back as he took Pap's plate and ambled off beside Pap. He lifted an elbow in response. Ames watched him walk away, his shoulders broad, his hips narrow his head high. He'd defended her to her dad and her dad's age-old arguments. She didn't love her dad any less because she disagreed with some of his ideas. If she wanted him to respect her ideas, it was wrong for her to knock what he believed. He thought he was just as right as she did, but they'd never been able to find a middle ground. Palmer and she spent most of their time at the ranch, and Palmer hadn't been around her parents, who were busy with the sea store, as much as she'd been around his grandparents. She knew her dad respected Palmer because of his roots in the community, his steadiness. The fact that he hadn't been tempted by the grass on the other side of the fence that looked greener. It really wasn't. She knew that now, of course. It was just different grass. Not better, different. Still, she appreciated Palmer giving her side of the situation, helping her dad understand that they could love each other, even if neither of them were doing or believed exactly what the other wanted. The slightly ill feeling that had settled in her stomach when Palmer said she hurt him turned putrid. She took a small bite of one of the jello salads while Katie chattered in her ear. She always sat with Palmer and Louise and their grandparents and her parents, but she couldn't stand to listen to Katie flirt with him, especially while his words were ringing in her ears. She'd never thought about the way she'd hurt people when she lived her life the way she wanted. Palmer had painted her dad and him as being selfish for wanting her to stay, but maybe it was just as selfish for her to want to go? There was something wrong with that question but she couldn't figure out what. Would she be happier in L.A. than she would in Sweetwater? Even that question didn't seem right. Palmer had said we choose to be happy. She had to agree. It was all about attitude. For Ames, she liked the challenge, and maybe Sweetwater hadn't held enough of a challenge for her. Or maybe she'd taken it for granted 
assuming it would always be here and always be the same. But if Palmer sold the ranch, things would never be the same. Ditto if he got married. It occurred to her that she could save the Olson ranch. She could marry Palmer. The idea would have been preposterous just a month ago. She'd never had romantic feelings for Palmer. But seeing him through Katie's eyes? Kissing him. Her gaze cut to their table. Katie had walked over, and Ames hadn't even noticed, and now she sat across from Palmer, chattering away. Palmer had his head turned toward Pap, helping him with something on his plate, and, as Ames stared, his eyes lifted like he knew exactly where she was and was checking on her. Their gazes met. The expression on his face didn't change, but something big shifted inside of her. Could she be falling in love with her best friend? Chapter 12 Monday morning, Palmer ran the fence line and checked on the one cow who had yet to freshen. He made sure all the other calves looked healthy and that their mothers seemed to be taking care of them. The cattle were a smaller part of the ranch. They lived right on the divide between the good, fertile bottomland that was some of the best farming ground in the world and the prairie, which was more suited for grazing cattle. Which suited Palmer just fine. He loved both aspects of farming. He knew guys who didn't care to mess with the animals, and he knew men who didn't want the stress of planting and harvest. He liked the variety. He went to the house for dinner. Louise had made sandwiches, but Ames hadn't come. He hadn't talked to her enough yesterday to know what her schedule was at the sea store. Normally, when she was home, she worked the morning shift and came out to the ranch by dinner time, unless she was off and spent the day at the ranch. Back before the kiss, he would have shot her a text to see what was up, but now he shook his head. He hadn't wanted anything to change between them, but he was the one acting weird. Why not just text and find out what was going on? So he did. He dumped a cup of sugar in the tea and stirred it. You want to grab the jello salad out of the fridge? Louise directed Tella. She did what she'd been asked. Palmer watched her out of the corner of his eye as he stirred. So serious. How would you feel about going fishing with Pap and me this afternoon? He asked. Her eyes brightened. Yes? She looked at her mom. Sure. Louise smiled at him, and he felt a pinch of guilt. He should do this more often. But it always seemed like there was so much to do. And there was. However, the garden would be okay if he wasn't in it tonight, and the front window latch could wait to be fixed until another day, along with the loose step on the porch. How about it, Pap? You going fishing with Tella and me? Ain't going fishing unless all the work is done. Course, Pap. I wouldn't think of taking off if the work wasn't done. The farming and ranching work. Really, it was never done. But it was caught up enough that he could take an afternoon and spend it with his family. His phone buzzed. He pushed the lid onto the pitcher and set it on the table before looking at it. Had to take Katie to the airport. Sorry, forgot to text. I'm working at the sea store this afternoon, but I'll come out this evening. Maybe we can shoot? Sure, he texted back. He smiled, just because everything was right between Ames and him, and that made him happy. Even if she did want to pack up and leave again. L.A., seriously? We'd better take your shoes off. It's illegal to nap in North Dakota with your shoes on. Uncle Palmer, you say that all the time, but that's not really true. Tella lay on her stomach beside him. On his other side, Pap had his hat over his face, but loud snores still escaped. Nope, it's true. It really is a law. 
I don't know why they'd make a law like that, but someone really did. He winked at her. It's a good thing my boots are off. I can fall asleep any time now. She tilted her head down and raised her brows, the blade of grass she'd been shredding forgotten in her hand. He explained a little further. It's the kind of law that no one is going to enforce, but no one is bothered to change. She shook her head, her nose going back and forth over the blade of grass in her hand. I can't believe it. Well, believe it, girlfriend. It's true. She twisted the grass stem in her hand. Mom said you were planting sunflowers because the wheat price might go down. She tilted her head at him. Are we going to sell the farm? His eyes widened. He thought she'd been protected from all the adult talk. But maybe she had, and her question had nothing to do with overhearing anyone talk about paying or not paying bills. The wheat we grow is durum wheat. It's got a hard outer shell, and it's perfect for making pasta. But people aren't eating as much pasta as they used to, so the price of our high-quality durum wheat isn't much better than cheaper wheat that's used for animal feed. He shrugged and adjusted his elbows under him. Farmers have to grow what people want to buy. They don't want wheat. We'll grow sunflowers so they can feed their birds in the winter. What if they stop feeding their birds? Then we'll grow something else. Flax is popular right now. Maybe we'll plant more of that next year. The seed was expensive, and he liked diversity, not only because it was good for the soil, but it often proved good for his pocketbook, too. He looked out over the horizon. Straight ahead, he could see sky. You know, someone once said that North Dakota is the only place in the world where you don't have to look up to see sky. Tella's eyes followed his gaze. She smiled. I just look straight ahead, and there it is. Yep, we get all that great big sky all to ourselves. Nope, you're going to have to share it with me. They looked around at Ames' voice. Look who shows up after the work's done. He grinned at her, and she grinned back, like they'd never kissed and were still best friends. Lay down with us, Aunt Ames. We're talking about farming. I'm going to be a farmer when I grow up. Ames' eyebrows lifted, and she flung herself down on the ground beside them. That's a good thing. I don't think you'd make it as a fisherwoman. We could if we set our minds to it. Palmer held his fist up, and Tella knocked it with hers. That's right. We need to diversify. Fish along with sunflowers and flax. We're getting out of the wheat business. Well, diversifying your crops sounds good, and I hate to be a downer, but I think you better stick with being a landlubber, unless you want to move to Alaska. Why would we want to do that? It's cold up there, Palmer said with a straight face. Which got him a smack on the head by Ames. Sorry, Ames said, ruffling Tella's hair. Didn't mean to bump you, but Uncle Palmer's being a goofball. Why? Tella asked with drawn brows. I have no idea why he's an idiot, Ames said, deliberately misunderstanding. It's really not much colder in Alaska than it is here. We have hotter summers, Palmer said. That's why. He stuck his tongue out at Ames. Would you grow up? Ames rolled her eyes. You're the one that was calling me names. I was not. You called me an idiot didn't she tell her? That's one name, not names, Ames said. And I only stuck my tongue out once, Palmer shot back. Stop. Tella climbed to her feet, holding her hands out like a referee at a fight, as though to keep them apart. Just stop. You two are worse than the kids at school. She started it, Palmer stated reasonably. Tella put her hands on her hips and fake glowered at him. Uncle Palmer, that's enough. He rolled over on his back and crossed his arms over his chest. Well, she did. Out of the corner of his eye, he could see some hand motions going on. Then Tella jumped on top of him. You're pinned, she yelled. That's it. You were being perfectly nice to me until Ames showed up, and then you two ganged up on me. 
He got up, keeping Tella in his arms. I'm throwing you in the river. She laughed and screamed at the same time, twisting in his arms. No, I don't know if I can still swim. He walked closer to the riverbank. Nope, you were picking on me, and this is what happens when you pick on someone bigger. No, don't throw me in. Tella was still laughing, but there was a tiny note of fear in her voice. Ames grabbed his arm, grinning. Put the girl down and pick on someone your own size. Okay. He set Tella down and grabbed Ames. Her eyes opened wide along with her mouth, and Palmer couldn't stop his grin from erupting all over his face. She hadn't thought he'd take her up on it. Maybe his own expression matched hers, though, because she felt a lot different in his arms than Tella did. Better. Completely right. So he threw her in the river. Chapter 13 I can't believe you did that. You're still harping about that? You threw me in the river. That was like four days ago. How long are you going to hold on to this? Forgiveness is freeing. Palmer held his twenty-two up and sighted down the barrel at the targets that were in the wheat field right beside the barn. They had to stay close to the home place since they were waiting on her friends to arrive. Shut up, Ames said as he squeezed the trigger slowly. The target dropped. Hey, Tella pushed me in after you. He shrugged, reaching for another bullet. Yeah, and you took that opportunity to dunk me again. Look at it on the bright side. There's a bright side to getting thrown in the river and then dunked? She asked over her shoulder as she sighted down the barrel. Maybe you should try an Iron Man competition. She downed her target. That's sexist. Palmer rolled his eyes. I don't think we ought to have guns when we're talking to each other. It's too tempting to beat you over the head with it. She snorted, then laughed. Mindy and Janelle should be here any time. Yay, he said with a decided lack of enthusiasm. Why'd you tell them to come here again? He had reloaded and aimed at his last target, firing and downing it easily. Because I thought it would spare them from my dad's constant the city is Satan's playhouse stuff that he does with all my friends. Some people can't handle good preaching. She shot her last target, too. You say that, but I heard you defending me. I didn't. I was standing in line behind you on Sunday. Something that looked to be very much like panic crossed his face. But she didn't get to hear what he might have said because a red car drove out of the dust in the distance. Your friends are here, he said instead. Somehow, she wished that her time with Palmer wasn't being interrupted. Without speaking, they slung their rifles over their shoulders and walked toward the drive. She took a breath. Palmer had asked for her help. Of all her friends, she'd invited the nicest one, who happened to be the only one that might possibly not mind living in North Dakota. She refused to be afraid that Palmer might fall in love with someone else. That's what she wanted, right? Because Ames wasn't staying in North Dakota, and in order to inherit his money, Palmer needed someone who would. Janelle probably isn't what you're looking for, but Mindy is nice. She hooked her hand around the strap on her rifle. But, he said without looking at her. She couldn't read anything in his tone. But she's a city girl. Still, I know she's looking to settle down, and she really is nice. Palmer didn't say anything. He'd almost seemed irritated, but he'd asked her to help. They walked on in silence, arriving at the gravel parking area in front of the house at the same time the car did. I'm glad the roads are marked. GPS is buggy out here, a blonde said as she got out of the passenger seat. Service is spotty in some areas, Janelle. Ames walked over and hugged her friend. They'd roomed together in college and kept in touch in the years since, but Ames couldn't say they were great friends. 
Most of her friends that had wanted to settle down were already married. Janelle had never indicated that was her desire, but she was good friends with Mindy, and they'd been heading toward Yellowstone on a summer trip anyway. Janelle jerked back. Is that... She leaned around Ames. You're carrying a gun! She backed up. Ames touched the gun on her shoulder. It's just a twenty-two. But, like, you're just carrying it around in plain sight. Janelle looked horrified, like Ames had a missile launcher and three dead bodies strapped to her shoulder. I think he does, too. Mindy stood beside the driver's side, her door still open. She nodded at Palmer, who stood behind Ames. Give me that oozy submachine lady killer with the nuke tips, and I'll put it back in the barn. I mean, armory. Palmer held out his hand. Janelle gasped. Mindy looked confused. Ames wanted to smack Palmer and laugh at the same time. He didn't even look all that threatening. The little rifle he had slung over his shoulder looked like a slightly ridiculous child's toy next to his size and width. She handed him her rifle. Overreact much? He asked with a smirk. She ignored him. Palmer, this is Janelle, and over there is Mindy. She stepped toward the car. That's my friend Palmer. Some folks call me Rambo, he said under his breath. She didn't think her friends could hear him, and it was possible the movie reference was too old for them to get anyway. And some people watch too much TV with their grandfather, she hissed under her breath. He grunted and turned toward the barn. Ames watched him go. Sorry about that. Usually he's house-trained. Oh, Janelle narrowed her eyes. It seemed like you two had this undercurrent thing going on. Yeah, I caught that too. Mindy shut her car door, but her eyes followed Palmer. Hope, mixed with dread, warred in Ames' chest. So really, what was up with the guns? Janelle asked as they met at the front of the car. Janelle, you remember Ames won gold in the biathlon? Mindy's sweet blue eyes looked inquiringly at her friend. Janelle didn't seem to remember. Ames didn't want to get into a discussion that could derail her objective, so she said, we were exercising, which was true. They'd run to the three shooting ranges, which is why Palmer wasn't wearing his boots and hat. He had had on jogging pants and sneakers. Oh, we brought our yoga mats on our trip. They're in the car. I know you did it in college. What about Palmer? Janelle asked. After being in the car all day, I wouldn't mind a nice stretch. Mindy looked hopefully at Ames. Ames had done her fair share of yoga, and it was actually great exercise, as well as a fabulous way to keep her joints flexible and improve her balance and concentration. Palmer probably doesn't do yoga? Mindy finally asked. He loves learning new things. Ames gave her friends a sweet smile. It would serve Palmer right to have to do a little yoga after his Rambo and Uzi comments. She checked her phone. Louise took Graham and Pap to the doctors in Rockerton and wouldn't be back until supper time. She and Palmer were supposed to have supper ready for everyone, and he'd said he could wait to run the fence line until after they ate so they had at least an hour for a yoga session. We only have two mats, Mindy bit her lip. I have my mat in the car and Palmer can use a blanket, Ames suggested innocently. They looked at her like she'd suggested they build a volcano in the front yard. She sighed. There's a store in town 30 minutes from here, but it won't have yoga mats. So unless you want to drive two hours to Rockerton and two hours back, we're going to have to make do with what we have. Oh, okay. Janelle shrugged and walked around, grabbing her mat from the back of the car. What's going on? Palmer walked up and asked over Ames' shoulder. Janelle and Mindy are going to do some yoga. She managed to keep the smirk off her face. Just barely. That's great. You guys can have fun with that. I'm going to go do something manly in the barn. She raised her brows and lowered her voice. 
How are you going to get to know these girls if you're avoiding them? His expression said he already knew enough. But his lip flattened. Yoga? She unleashed her smirk. Rambo? He snorted a laugh. This is payback? Take it like a man, cowboy. She punched his arm lightly. He grinned that slow, easy grin that flipped her stomach like a hotcake. That's fine, Squeegee. I'm not sure anyone can take yoga like a man, but I'll try. What are you two whispering about? Mindy asked from over Ames' shoulder. Palmer has never done yoga before, and he's afraid he'll hurt himself. Ames slanted a glance at Palmer, who glared at her. We'll take it easy on you. Mindy gave Palmer a sweet smile and slipped her arm through his. So what in the world do you do out here all day? She asked as she led him to the porch. Chapter 14 Okay, Janelle said like she was the quarterback getting ready to call a play. Let's start with vinyasa yoga. Great idea. I love Surya Namaskara A. Mindy all but clapped her hands. I don't suppose that's how you say steak in Japanese, is it? Palmer muttered as Janelle's body began to twist like a lariat on a yearling calf. Aim snorted but tried to cover it with a cough. Palmer focused on not noticing how good her legs looked, no matter how twisted they got. The girls all knew what they were doing, and eventually Palmer found himself sitting on his blanket with his legs twisted in directions legs were never meant to go. At least, a man's legs. The ladies didn't seem to be having any trouble getting their legs to twist backward and up to their heads. Honestly, it felt like his whole butt was on fire and half of his thighs. Every once in a while, Janelle would look at him and say something like, Just relax into it. Which might have been meant to help him, but it only made him think about how much more relaxed he would be if he were lost and walking naked in a blizzard. But he wasn't going to quit. His legs might fall off, or, more likely, other things might fall off, but he didn't have any quit in him. Ames would say he was stubborn. He couldn't help resenting her a little as she sat on the yoga mat he didn't know she owned. In North Dakota, everyone carried blizzard kits in their cars year-round, but apparently Ames now carried a yoga mat as well, with a blissfully serene look on her face and her hands folded in some sort of teepee-type way. Actually, she looked even more beautiful than she normally did, and in a way, he was glad she'd tricked him into this. It gave him a glimpse into a part of Ames that he didn't normally see, which wasn't good for his heart, since it seemed to fall a little deeper for her with everything he learned about her. Okay, Janelle breathed. I think we lost Palmer. Let's do something simple. Eagle pose, Gari Dasana. He watched as she twisted her legs and squatted. He could do that. He just needed to look like he needed to sit down on the porcelain throne. He bit his tongue before he asked for a Beef Today magazine to read. Ames' face was serene until she glanced over at him. He didn't have the magazine, but she choked on a laugh anyway. After a painfully long time, Janelle said, Forward bend into Uttanasana. By this time, Palmer didn't even bother to make a joke about magazines or food. His stomach was growling, or maybe it was crying, as he watched Janelle bend forward and shove her forehead into her kneecaps. Palmer made a sincere attempt, but couldn't help mumbling. Here in North Dakota, if we want to look behind us, we just turn our heads. I think Palmer's tired, Ames said. There was a smile in her voice but he couldn't see her face since her body was folded in two like a saddle blanket. One more then, Dracula, <clears throat> Janelle, said. Jump back into Chaturangana Dandashana. One more, yes. 
Maybe Palmer jumped a little too enthusiastically, because he hadn't even landed when he felt white-hot pain shoot up his thigh into his back. Stars exploded into his head, and he saw white. The pain twisted and pulled, tightening. Oof, duh, he said, pressing his forehead into the blanket and focusing on breathing through the haze. It would subside. Pain always did. He just had to wait until his brain figured out how to block it. Palmer? Ames was on her knees beside him, two furrows between her eyes. She knew he wasn't faking. He took two more deep breaths. Then he twisted his head, carefully, and looked up at her. Yes? He asked in as bland a tone as he could manage. The pain had subsided into a low throb. The lines in her forehead deepened. What's going on? Nothing? The lines didn't disappear, but her lip tugged up. Are you hurt? No, not at all. It was a flat-out lie, but his manly pride would not let him say, Yes, I do believe I hurt myself doing yoga. You're lying. The pain had faded to the point where he thought he could get up. Janelle and Mindy had their mats rolled. Want us to take yours to the car? Janelle said to Ames. Sure, Ames replied, not taking her eyes off Palmer. Looks like Louise is back with Graham and Pap and Tella, he said as he slowly and carefully righted himself, indicating the dust in the distance while trying to do everything with the leg that felt the least like it was going to fall off. The one that didn't feel like it had been shot up with acid. Actual acid, not the drug. He wouldn't have any idea of what that felt like. They're expecting lunch when they get here. I better run in and throw those sandwiches together. Ames gave him a steady look. Are you sure you're okay? Yeah, I'll come in and help you. His legs still throbbed, but he'd bailed a thousand bales of hay on a sprained ankle and checked the fence line with a broken leg. And that time his knife had slipped while he was trying to pry two insulation panels apart, he'd tied a bandana around the six-inch gash and finished putting the rest of the panels up before he'd driven two hours to the clinic to have it stitched. He could definitely stand in the kitchen and make sandwiches after suffering an injury doing yoga. His back teeth pressed together like vices as he tried not to limp past Ames into the kitchen to the sink where he washed his hands. I'm going to make tea. How about I make tea and you run out and grab some spinach and lettuce from the garden? Ames stopped with her hand on a pan. He always went out to the garden. She'd done it enough times with him that he was sure she'd be able to tell spinach from the beets and radishes, but the request was odd enough that it gave everything away. Palmer? He turned as fast as he could with the pain in his leg and put his hand up. Maybe there were thunderclouds on his face. Maybe she just saw the lines of pain. Whatever it was, her expression was half compassion, half laughing. Okay, okay, your secret is safe with me, but you are never living this down. Never. Her eyes shone. Her cheeks glowed with health from the sun and wind of the country he loved. Her hand sat on her slim hip emphasizing the curve of her waist, and he wished with all his heart that he had the right to close the distance between them and pull her close to him. As it was, he said more than he should. That might make it slightly easier to watch you move to L.A. Immediately, her laughing eyes sobered, and the smile dropped from her lips. The loss hurt, and he moved forward. Hey, I'm sorry, I was kidding. She looked down. I know, but you all act like it doesn't hurt me to leave. He touched her cheek with his hand, hoping to draw her eyes back up to his. Why do you then? Her face came back up, and they stared into each other's eyes. The kiss they'd shared came back and simmered between them. Palmer searched for a sign any indication that she'd welcome his lips on hers, 
but he couldn't read that in her expression. So, with everything in him, he stayed planted where he was, his fingertips touching the soft skin of her cheek, moving just a bare fraction of an inch, loving that sweet friction. His heart pounded, and the pain in his leg faded as he lost himself in her eyes and the soft touch of her cheek. Janelle and Mindy stomped up the porch steps, breaking whatever tension hummed between them. Ames moved her face away from his hand before stepping sideways and moving around him. I'll take him out with me, she said as she walked past. He managed to move around the kitchen, grabbing rolls, mayo, and leftover chicken from the night before to make the sandwiches. The tea bags were steeping on the stove, and the sandwiches lay in a line with their tops off, waiting for the spinach and lettuce when he heard his sister's car pull in. He limped out, helping Graham then pap in, and ignoring the burning pain in his leg as he climbed the steps each time, before making more trips out and helping Tella and Louise carry the groceries in. You're limping, Louise said after the second trip. Yeah, he replied. She gave him a look, but he shifted the groceries he was carrying and changed the subject. How did Pap's appointment go? Louise sighed, then looked over her shoulder as though to make sure Tella wasn't around. They said we need to keep him active. He recommended we put him in a home that has all the handicap accessible things he needs. When Pap and I told him we'd like to keep him home, he gave me a list of things he said should be done to the house. We knew it. Yeah, expensive stuff that we can't afford. Basically remodeling the bathroom, expanding the doorway so a wheelchair can fit through, paving the walk around the garden. He says the more active Pap stays, the better for his physical and mental health. He said taking him for a couple of months of physical therapy before winter would help get him in great shape for when he can't get around as much because of the snow and cold. Did you call Sawyer? No, Louise said. There's nothing he can do, and we basically knew it all anyway. I'll call him this evening when I'm sure he's in for the day. She bit her lip. I hated it because the doctor really acted like if we loved Pap, we'd either put him in a home or make all these expensive changes. I felt like a failure. And selfish because we're trying to keep from selling the ranch. Normally, I love Pap's doctor, so maybe it was just me. Her voice trailed off. Palmer put his arm around her, dealing with his own guilt. He could have a check yet today one big enough to make every change the doctor suggested. But he'd have to give up any hope of ever being with Ames. He determined to resist the feelings that burgeoned in his chest every time he was with her. Both of the friends she'd brought here this time seemed like nice girls. He couldn't neglect his work on the ranch, but he could try harder to get to know them. Ames had been standing at the sink, washing the bugs and dirt off the lettuce and spinach, when Palmer and Louise stopped on the walk and talked. From the expression on Louise's face, the news she'd gotten at the appointment hadn't been good. Lunch seemed to go well, with Palmer showering Janelle and Mindy with attention. Ames tried to force herself to help, but it was hard to picture either Janelle or Mindy, as sweet as she was, at the ranch full-time, and even harder to try to picture either of them kissing Palmer. Her brain refused to form the picture. She had been concentrating so hard on trying to overcome her reticence and push her friends toward Palmer that she almost jumped out of her seat when her phone buzzed in her pocket. Everyone at the table stopped talking as she held her phone up and looked at it. Normally, she would never get her phone out at the table, but she was expecting a call from the station in L.A. It's an L.A. number, she said, bouncing a little in her seat and glancing across the table until her eyes caught Palmer's. He was happy for her, she knew he was. But there was a shadow on his face, too. You can go upstairs and take it, Louise said quickly. Excuse me, she remembered to say as she pushed her chair back and rushed out of the kitchen. 
She needed to answer quickly or she'd miss the call, so she'd swipe to answer on her way up the stairs, grateful she could stay in the house. The constant wind always made it hard to talk on the phone outside, and she didn't want to miss anything. Hello, she said, hating that she sounded breathless. She'd been upstairs a few times, not many, in the years that she'd been at the ranch. She'd helped Louise and Graham clean a few times she'd come out and Pap and Palmer had been gone. So she knew exactly where his room was, although it had been years since she'd been in it. It faced south toward the nearest cell tower. The woman's voice on the other end was clear as a bell when she said, Hello, may I speak to Ames Hansen, please? Speaking, Ames said in her most cultured voice. Miss Hansen, this is Rissa Myers. I'm calling to congratulate you on being one of five candidates for the sportscaster position who are being called in for an interview. Thank you, I'm thrilled. Her voice didn't squeak, and she managed to sound professional. We can schedule you Wednesday morning next week. Would that work for you? Yes, that's perfect. Rissa went on to note the time and place, saying that she'd send an email and check to make sure she had the right address. Ames went back down the stairs, feeling like she was levitating above the ground. Her dream job, covering sports, which would almost definitely lead to a spot on the Olympic press team. She couldn't believe she was down to the final five. As soon as she reached the doorway, everyone stopped talking and turned to look at her. They could see the happy glow on her face, she was sure. You got the job, Janelle exclaimed. She shook her head. You got a different job that's better? Mindy guessed with a smile. She shook her head again. There was a beat of silence. Then Palmer spoke. His face smiled. If she didn't know him so well, she might have missed the little point of sadness in his eyes. You're going to L.A. for an interview. Yep, Wednesday morning, so I'll need to fly out on Tuesday. That's great, but too bad for us. We were going to stay until Wednesday. Janelle tilted her head, her lip coming out in a little pout. You can hang out here on the ranch with Palmer. I don't think anyone would mind, and he'd enjoy it, I'm sure. Ames looked around the table. Graham and Louise were both nodding. Guests were never turned away or made to feel like an inconvenience here. And it would be good for Palmer to spend more time with Janelle and Mindy. This way, Ames would be completely out of the picture. She couldn't have planned it better herself. Too bad the thought made a deep, black hole open up in her heart. I thought I was going to L.A. with you. Palmer's voice cut through her thoughts. As she met Palmer's eyes across the table, she wasn't sure who was more surprised, her or Palmer. Oh, I'd forgotten about that. She was pretty sure she hadn't forgotten anything, but she would back Palmer even if he said the earth was flat, which from his house, it really did look that way. They talked about her interview and the job she'd applied for as they cleaned up the table. Graham and Pap went to take a nap, and Louise and Tella took books out back to read by the garden. Do you have time to sit on the porch for a bit before we head back into town? Ames asked Palmer. He hadn't suggested doing anything, and he'd been kind of quiet. She remembered his words, how watching her leave was hard. It hurt her heart to think that she was hurting Palmer by leaving. What if it was him that was leaving? If they sold the farm, it could very well be Palmer that left. He'd talked about the big ranches in Texas where you'd never need a coat. And he'd also spoken of Oklahoma and Nebraska, where miles stretched upon miles of rows of corn and beans. He'd grown some corn through the years, but it wasn't a crop that did well in their climate and he'd seemed fascinated with being able to grow corn and other crops that took warmer weather. He might go. Even if she were in L.A., her life would never be the same. A pressing sense of sadness pushed on her chest, 
and she shook the melancholy thoughts away. They walked out on the porch. Janelle and Mindy took the swing, and Ames sat on the rocker. Palmer sat on the top step with his back leaning against the porch post. Despite her gloomy thoughts, Ames was still thrilled about the interview, and she silently tried to decide what clothes she should pack and what she should wear, while Palmer sat with his face upturned toward the sun, soaking in the heat. She felt a little guilty because she knew he always had work to do, and he had already taken time off this morning to shoot with her, then do yoga. But he didn't mention that he was a busy man with a ranch to run, and she didn't either. Did you see the latest episode of Mary the Movie Star? Janelle asked. OMG, I did! Can you believe what Amber did to Jade? Mindy asked. If Ryan even falls for her tricks, I am so over that show, Janelle said with a fake shudder. Oh, you'll watch. You're right, I will. But I'm going to the next casting call, even if it's in Australia. Janelle pursed her lips and crossed her arms over her chest. Ryan's not going to get married anyway. He said too many times that he can't trust that the women aren't just after his money. They'd be fools not to be. Janelle said. Well, yeah, who wants to marry a man who makes less than she does? Mindy asked, looking around for confirmation. Ames studied the North Dakota sky that shone blue and bright straight out from the porch and didn't meet her eyes. Had Janelle and Mindy been like this all along, or had she been the one to change? Of course, when you get married, you want to feel like you moved up in life. Janelle crossed her legs as the swing rocked gently. Still, I wouldn't scheme the way Amber is. That's just wrong. Yeah, scheming is okay. You just can't be that obvious about it. They laughed together. Do you guys watch that show? Mindy asked, politely trying to draw them into the conversation. No, Ames said. We don't have a TV. Palmer said, with his head still back and his eyes still closed. Ames cringed a little and waited for the explosion. Mindy and Janelle exchanged wide-eyed stares. They tried to include Ames, but she just shrugged. The North Dakota winters were long and dark, and a TV would probably help, but there had never been cable this far out. Palmer's grandparents had a TV at one point when Palmer was still in high school, but when it broke, they didn't bother replacing it. She'd been over a few times when they'd watched hockey and maybe some college ball on the computer. Finally, Janelle said, a little hesitantly, how do you live without a TV? Mindy waved her hand. They probably watch stuff on their phones or computers. It's the way of the future, duh. Yes, but a big flat screen just can't be beat. Ames didn't comment. There was no point. I saw a show about people like that once. Janelle picked at her nails, then held her hand out, looking at her nails. I think I might have two, only that was West Virginia or something. I think you're right. They lived in little houses and there were lots of trees around. The host for that show was the same guy who got the lead in the action movie that's coming out on the 4th of July. Oh, I've seen the previews. He looks delicious. They need to cast him on Mary a Movie Star. I would poison people to get cast in his show. Ames wasn't entirely sure, but she thought Palmer was asleep. Let's go get a manicure. My nails are so awful. Mindy held her hands up. Even to Ames' trained eye, they looked perfect. You'll have to drive to Rockerton, Ames said. It's two hours away. The girls looked at each other. I thought you lived closer than that. I do, just 30 minutes away in Sweetwater. Maybe you'd like to go on in to my house and unpack? My nails are just awful as well. Janelle held her hand up. See, it's chipped. I think I might have done it when I was putting the lettuce in those sandwiches. It's driving me crazy. I need to go get a manicure. Is there anything to do in your town? Mindy asked. Ames thought that Mindy might actually have fun if she stayed long enough. 
she'd just never been exposed to the culture of rural America. There'll be a movie playing at seven. Ames figured there was no point in trying to drum up the virtues of her town. Even the bar closed at eight on weeknights, nine on Friday and Saturday. Janelle checked her watch. If we hurry, we can get our nails done and be back in time to catch it. She looked hopefully at Ames. I don't suppose it's the new one with the handsome hunk that hosted that Hicks show? Ames cringed at the casual way Janelle insulted the people on the show. She didn't mean to. They were both nice girls, just had never been exposed to any thoughts except the accepted mainstream ideas. Probably not, she said, glancing at Palmer, who hadn't moved. Well, we're here now. Let's make the best of it, Mindy said. We'll go get our nails done and be back in time to catch a movie. Would you like to come with us, Palmer? Palmer opened his eyes, slanting them at Mindy. I think I'll stay here. Thanks anyway. The girls stood and Palmer stood with them. Ames figured she had no choice but to go with her friends, as much as she hated to leave Palmer. Especially with her interview looming and with being that much closer to actually getting the job she wanted and moving away. You guys can follow me into town, then I'll drive to Rockerton, okay? We'll drive together and catch up, Ames said. That's fine, Janelle replied. I want to say a few words to Palmer, then I'll be right over to my car, Ames said. She waited while the girls stepped off the porch and walked down the sidewalk. I'm sorry about that. I wouldn't want anyone to lower themselves by marrying me. They don't know it took all your resources to pay for Pap's stroke. No, but I think if they knew I could be a billionaire, they'd be on it pretty quick. He ran a hand through his hair. I'm sorry about saying I was going with you to your interview. I couldn't stand the thought of spending a day with them talking about TV stars. I should be working now. I know there's tons to do. Yeah, I should be mowing hay. Weather's supposed to be nice until Monday. He looked out at the sky. I can rake it Monday morning once the dew dries, so you can start right in bailing. You putting it in round bales? Ames asked. Yeah, first cutting isn't as nice. I know, she bumped his shoulder. I have learned something over the years. I know you have. He pulled the braid that lay over her shoulder. All that info will serve you well in L.A. She snorted. Maybe I should have practiced a little harder when you were in your knife-throwing phase. His gaze lowered to hers and looked thoughtful. Yeah, I suppose it's illegal to have a gun in the city. I'd assume. He gave her a gentle shove. Go have fun with your friends. They're here for you. He shook his head. We're wasting their time. They might be tempted by the money, but they're not any more interested in living here than Katie. She was afraid he was right, but she couldn't give in, even if the idea of Palmer not liking her friends brought sunshine to her soul. Spend Sunday afternoon with us. You won't miss work, and you never know, something might click. He didn't look like he had hope about that, but he nodded. I'll plan on Sunday after church. Chapter 15 Palmer drove his pickup out to the river. Tella sat beside him. He'd invited Luis to come and bring along Graham and Pap, but she'd declined. He wasn't sure if it was because she truly didn't want to or if she thought she'd be in the way. Probably the first. She'd always been happier with a book in her hand. She'd always loved studying and graduated at the top of her class. Granted, it was a small class. She'd always claimed that Tella wasn't the reason she didn't go to college, but Palmer hadn't ever quite believed her. Tella sat beside him on the seat. Mindy sat next to her, gripping the door handle. If you wind your window down, it'd be cooler, he called over to Mindy. Why don't we just turn the A.C. on? Mindy shouted. Broke. 
he hadn't seen the point in fixing it. Nine months out of the year, he wished it were warmer. Seemed like he should appreciate the heat of summer, not minimize it with air conditioning. Ames flew past him on her four-wheeler. Janelle clung to her, squealing. Beside him, Tella snorted. He hadn't taken his ATV. He could have fit Mindy and Tella both on it, but he hadn't wanted to squish them, so he'd driven his pickup. After another mile or so, they came to the river and followed the trail along the edge until they came to the deeper spot where they usually fished and swam. Mindy's mouth hung open. This is where we're swimming? Yeah. He looked over at her, not sure what the issue was. The closest lake is a good hour away. This is much closer. I see. He got out and went around, opening her door. She barely glanced at him as she studied the river. You gonna dunk Aunt Ames again? Tella asked with a little giggle. He wanted to say he'd dunk Ames a hundred times if it would make her smile, but he didn't. Ames probably didn't mind. She'd always been a faster swimmer than him, and if she wanted to get away, she definitely could. But the less he touched Ames, the easier his life was. She probably won't want to come swim with us if we spend all our time dunking her. Tella shrugged. I think she liked it. She threw her towel on the wide, grassy bank and strolled toward the river, like she hadn't just rocked his world. Tella thought Ames liked him dunking her? Tella didn't talk much, but she did a lot of watching. Could she be right? And what exactly did like mean? Palmer tried to shake the words out of his head. He was so sweet on Ames, he was grasping at anything that might indicate she returned his feelings. Well, he kind of knew she returned his feelings. She hadn't slapped his face when he'd kissed her. But those feelings weren't as strong as his. Not strong enough to make her stay. Yours aren't strong enough to make you go. A little voice in his head chided as he kicked off his second boot and pulled his socks off. He couldn't deny the truth. He knew it, which is why he would never dream of asking her to stay. Race you to the other side, he called to Tella before running to the riverbank. He'd forgotten for a moment about his pulled hamstring, if that's what it was, and he ended up doing an odd one-step, two-hop run to the river. Thankfully, it wasn't far. Once he got knee-deep and dove into the water, the injury didn't hurt as much. By that time, Tella was three feet ahead of him. It might only be decent to swim a month or two out of the year, although they stretched it into three months and sometimes four. A little cold water never hurt anyone. But Tella was a fish. She beat him to the other bank by a second. Ames' hand reached up and slapped the edge of the bank just after his. Her head popped up next. Did I beat him? She asked Tella. Tella shook her head, grinning. Ha! Take that, Palmer said, splashing her with a light slap at the water. And back, she shouted before she twisted and dove. Tella laughed and dived, too. Palmer, knowing he'd never catch Ames, at least, pushed off as hard as he could with his good leg, diving below the surface and stretching forward with both hands. The water was cold, although the first shock was always the worst, and he was beyond that now. A slow current tugged at him, and he knew he'd be surfacing downstream just a bit from where they started. Sure enough, he popped up just behind Ames. Tella splashed in behind him. Come on, Mindy, Janelle, the water feels great. He called out with a grin at Tella. He thought they tried to hide their looks of horror. Janelle said, Oh, we're fine right here. You should put some suntan lotion on. Palmer looked at Tella. She splashed him. Mom put some on my face and ears. You'll be fine. He barely got the last word out before Ames jumped on his head, pushing him under. He went with it to give her a sense of security, then twisted, grabbing her foot and yanking. He smiled inside, keeping his mouth closed, since they were underwater. 
Managing to grab Tellus' foot and pull, he was off balance a little when Ames grabbed him and pushed him down to the river floor. They'd wrestled underwater for years on Sunday summer afternoons. Although he was strong, of course, she was better in the water and had more natural athleticism. Or maybe it was all the training she did for the Olympics. Whatever it was, with Tella working in tandem with her, they could hold their own pretty well. He held back a little because he'd never want to hurt either of them and was especially careful of Tella, but it was still fun and a great stress relief after working long, 12 or 14 hour days on the ranch. Twisting, he managed to reverse their position so she was under him, but Tella grabbed his leg, his bad leg like he'd ever had such a thing before, and the pain that shot through him made him flinch. Ames never let a weakness go unexploited, and she pulled out from under him. Tella already had a grip on his shoulder, and they flipped him, pushing him down to the river's bed. The rule was two seconds with both shoulders on the riverbed was a win for the other person. His lungs were about to burst, and he didn't have enough time to twist, so he locked her in a bear hug and threw his good leg as far behind him as he could, pushing them both up for air. He shook his head, throwing water right into her face, but it didn't dim her smile. His, either. Normally, they took a quick breath and he'd toss her backward, making for a show, for Tella's sake, for following her down. But since their kiss, he'd been extra sensitive to touching her, and this wasn't any different. His arms didn't let go like they were supposed to. Her wet body slid against his, and her hands were on the sides of his head, her elbows by his shoulders. Maybe it was just to anchor herself against the current, but her legs wrapped around his, and she pressed closer. Heat flashed into his body, and maybe she saw it in his eyes because her eyes widened. His lungs went in and out, needing big gasps of air, and not from holding his breath. The air seemed to sizzle around them as their eyes met and held. His arms finally loosened, but his hands gripped her back and waist, unwilling to let go. The water rolled lazily around them, gently slapping between them up to their chests. Her breath hit his face, and he wanted to open his mouth, drawing it in, wanting what had been hers. He couldn't draw his eyes away, couldn't make himself release or push her away like he should. But he waited with bated breath for her to decide the next move. The part of his mind that was functioning knew it needed to be her decision, as much as everything in him demanded he press forward. Her eyes lowered to his lips, and her tongue came out from between her teeth. He watched it the way he watched wheat ripple and undulate in the breeze, with a sense of awe that stirred the longing deep in his soul to be one with the land of his ancestors. Watching Ames, the same longing hit him hard and deep. Tella splashed somewhere behind Ames. Another child might have interrupted them, but Tella had always been observant, and looking back, she might even hold a secret wish that Ames and he would get together. He'd never considered what Tella thought, but now that he had, he'd ask. The seconds had ticked by. Ames could press her advantage now and dunk him. He saw that knowledge in her eyes and knew it was true. He was too besotted to fight. Suddenly, he understood why Samson had told Delilah the source of his power. Up until that point in his life, he'd considered Samson stupid. Samson wasn't stupid. He'd just been ruled by his emotions. Finally, Ames spoke. I'd better go sit with the girls. Her eyes swept over his face, and her voice came out in a hoarse whisper. Disappointment stabbed his chest, but he forced his arms to drop as her legs untangled from his. As soon as he was free, he turned and jumped, ignoring the shooting pain in his leg and swimming underwater, upriver, pushing against the current, swimming until his lungs felt like they would burst, and still pushing farther. It wasn't until black spots started shimmying in front of his eyes that he surfaced, 
whipping his head around to shake the water off and taking in a deep breath of the humid North Dakota air. The cleanest air in the nation, and the air he couldn't leave, not even for the woman he loved. He was a long distance away, but his eyes still sought her out, automatically, as he always did any time they were together. He was aware of her, where she was and what she was doing. Now wasn't any different. Only his heart beat in his chest like it would burst, and the longing in his soul had turned into a black sadness. She had been watching for him to surface. When their eyes met, she turned away, walking out of the water. Tella had followed him up, and he forced himself to grin, fighting away the hopelessness and despair rolling through him. They moved out into the current and floated down on their backs, like they usually did once they'd exhausted themselves wrestling. He wasn't exhausted. Far from it. But there wasn't any question he needed to stay away from Ames as much as he didn't want to. Did he really love her? Like a man loves a woman, love her? He opened his eyes and looked at the big blue sky. Somehow, he knew the L.A. sky wouldn't look the same. Of course, he understood that it was all atmosphere, but the land and sky of North Dakota tethered his soul just as surely as Ames held his heart. He couldn't marry someone else, not even if they knew it. He considered for a while the choices. As much as he hated to leave his ranch, hated to sell out his grandparents, it might be best for everyone involved. Pap would be better off with more care. Graham would adjust. Maybe Louise would meet someone and Tella would get a dad. As for him, he realized he couldn't let Ames walk away from him again. If that meant he sold the ranch and moved to L.A., it's what he'd do. So, yeah, that felt almost right in his chest. He loved this land, and his heart called out to it, but he didn't have to live here. He could love it from California. Maybe they'd get tired of city life eventually and move back. Maybe they'd love the milder climate, and heck, maybe he'd see the ocean and fall in love. It would be a great adventure, and Ames would be by his side. He couldn't think of it any other way. But he wouldn't say anything to her until her friends left. And he'd need to talk to Louise first, too. She had just as much say in the ranch as he did, although she always went with his decisions. He'd take care of that this week. Chapter 16 Monday morning after lunch, Ames drove her four-wheeler over the fields to the back pasture, looking for Palmer. After she'd practically thrown herself at him, then changed her mind at the last minute, and he'd swum away, underwater for so long she'd almost gone looking for him, he'd been all smiles. She felt rotten, frustrated, and angry with life in general for putting Palmer in her life, then giving her so many other amazing opportunities and making her choose. She would leave the choice up to fate. Or whatever. If she got the job in L.A., she'd assume that's where she was meant to be. If she didn't, she was moving back to Sweetwater, and she would pursue Palmer like she'd never pursued anything in her life. She didn't think he'd put up too much of a fight. Up ahead, she could see dust on the horizon. She should have brought the tractor out, but the only one left in the barn was the one she couldn't start, which was the same one she'd taken through the side of the barn at Christmas time five years ago. Usually, when she came back for a visit, Pap teased her about her ventilation installation skills, but he'd not been himself this year. So she didn't even try to mess with the battery charger and the vice grips, but hopped on the four-wheeler. Louise must be back helping Palmer, since both the newer tractors were gone and a blue sedan was parked next to the house. Probably the neighbor that helped watch Pap for them. Mindy and Janelle had left early. 
They'd said they'd decided to drive through South Dakota and see Mount Rushmore. But their knowing looks and smirks told Ames that maybe they knew Ames was interested in Palmer, and there was no point in hanging around. Ames couldn't even say she was sorry to see them go. She'd come home for the summer to help her parents, but mostly to be with Palmer. So far, she'd spent more time entertaining her friends than she had with him, which was her own fault since she'd had the colossally stupid idea to try to get her friends together with her bestie. She was so done with that. Palmer needed to get married to save his ranch, but Ames couldn't help him. She wanted him for herself. She was happy about the interview, but it was going to take even more time from the precious little she had left with him. So she'd barely sent Janelle and Mindy off after she'd gotten off her shift at the sea store and headed immediately out to the farm. When she got close enough, she could see that Louise was in the tractor with Tella running the round baler. Palmer had the wrapper hooked to the other tractor, and he was using the skid loader to move the bales from the field to the wrapper. He was doing two people's jobs since someone had to stand with the wrapper. So he'd wrap a bale, then go get another. Ames had run the wrapper before, and it wasn't complicated or dangerous, unlike some of the jobs he did. His face lit up when he saw her coming, and he gave a wave before moving the lever to shut the wrapper off. Tearing the plastic, he tucked the end in under the outer layer and hopped in the skid loader to lift it off. She parked out of the way while he set the wrapped bale to the side and drove out to the field to bring in another freshly dropped bale. Louise was way ahead of him, and there must have been fifteen bales ready to be wrapped sitting scattered throughout the field. Since he hadn't given her any directions, Ames assumed he'd want her helping him, and his thumbs up when he came back told her she'd guessed correctly. He set the bale in place and backed out watching her to be sure she remembered how to run the machine. She gave him a cheeky grin as the bale started to spin, the white plastic covering end to end in small segments. Palmer drove off to get another bale, and she kept the wrapper going until the two complete layers had been formed. That barrier would keep the moisture out, and the hay would not rot or spoil. They worked for a few hours into the afternoon. Ames' throat was dry and she wished she had thought to bring water out for everyone when she came. She should have thought to bring a hat, too. She could feel her cheeks getting hot. It had been a good four hours, and they hadn't stopped at all. After starting later than anyone else, Ames couldn't be the first to take a break, so she sucked it up and kept pushing on, even though her back was sore and her hands were getting blistered from yanking on the old handle but it stuck and wouldn't budge unless she grabbed it and pulled hard. Thankfully, they were getting low on plastic, and she'd never changed it herself, so they were going to have to stop soon. Just as she thought that, the last of the plastic ripped through the machine, the end flapping. She grabbed the lever to stop it. Palmer was bringing in another bale and saw what was going on. She didn't need to motion him. He parked the skid loader and came over beside her. Hey, girl. He lifted his hat up and fanned it for a minute before plunking it down on her head. It's a little sweaty, he said, but you need it. Your face is looking like the morning sky. That sounds kind of poetic. I didn't mean it that way. She snorted. Katie's not the only one that gets to wear your hat, huh? He stopped what he was doing, staring at her. She took it. I gave it to you. Oh. She tried to swallow, but her throat was parched. The air heated between them. Somehow, though, Palmer seemed more relaxed than he had been. At peace, maybe. Good for him, since she was tied up in knots over wanting him and wanting her job in L.A., too. She was happy he did not care. Really, she was. Never before had she felt like she could settle down and be happy. But since she had come back this time, she actually wanted to stay, maybe even more than she wanted to leave. Which was funny, 
since she was so close to landing the job of her dreams. He jerked his head. There's a jug of sweet tea over there on the shady side of my pickup. If I were a herd of cattle, you would have just caused a stampede. He laughed. You should have said something. She started walking away, saying over her shoulder, I couldn't show up late and be the first to take a break. <laughs> Louise and Tella have tea in the tractor. He laughed again. Actually, it's probably gone, and they'll be stopping for a bathroom break any time. Like his words caused it, the bailer spit out a bale almost directly across from where they were, and the tractor stopped. Louise and Tella hopped down and started walking across the field. They're going to be headed to the house if you need to go along. I'm too dry to have that problem. She walked around the truck and picked up the red, cooler-type jug. Ice cubes made muted clacking sounds as the liquid inside shook. Flipping the nozzle up, she drank, long and deep. There was something profoundly satisfying about a drink when a person was that thirsty. It certainly put other things in perspective. Maybe that's what she loved so much about being on the farm. It stripped life down to its utter simplicity. It didn't matter what shoes she wore or what the latest celebrity was doing or what coffee she drank or even what she drank, period. Palmer could have a bottle of unsweetened grapefruit juice, and if it were wet, she would have drunk it. Food, drink, and something to wear to protect her from the elements. Funny, but the work they were doing revolved around that, too. The hay would be food for the cattle this winter. Going even farther, the cattle would become food in due time. You must be thinking of something really deep. Palmer's voice at the end of the pickup startled her. Oh, I was, trust me. Yeah. He laughed and strutted over to her, taking the tea. You were probably wondering what those suits in L.A. were going to think of your sunburned face on Wednesday. He tilted the jug to his mouth, but she barely even noticed. Oh my gosh. Her hands went to her hot cheeks. I never even thought of it. She turned, trying to see her face in his side mirror. Are they that bad? She had put sunscreen on her face before she came out, but she couldn't remember if it was the good stuff or the cheap bottle she kept for occasional use. She'd been busy thinking about other things. Palmer came around and took both of her hands, moving them away from her face. I'm kidding. But your hat... I gave you my hat because I like seeing you in it. I teased you about your face because I knew it would get a rise out of you. And you're cute when you get all flustered. She narrowed her eyes at him and put one hand on her hip. I have no idea how Louise allowed you to survive childhood. It's because I'm younger and he was always bigger. Louise came around the side of the truck. We're going to borrow your four-wheeler, if you don't mind. Of course. It wasn't really hers. Not like she paid for it or anything. But Palmer always referred to it as hers, and so did Louise. And just like now, Louise asked before she hopped on it. Hi, Tella, Ames said when she saw Tella's head poke around the pickup. Even though they were bailing hay, Tella still wore the hockey jersey she loved. Hi, Aunt Ames. Okay, Tella, let's run down to the house so we can get back and work a little longer. Can I drive? Louise looked back at Ames with raised brows. Sure, if your mom says it's okay. Tella grinned. It should be. She let me drive Uncle Palmer's pickup out here. By yourself? Tella nodded. Wow, make sure you wear your seatbelt just in case the wheels fall off. Hey. Palmer put on a mock hurt expression and wrapped an arm around Ames' head like he was going to put her in a headlock. That wasn't nice. I don't say mean things like that about your car. The four-wheeler started and the motor faded slowly into the distance. Palmer's arm loosened and dropped to her shoulders. The weight of it there felt good and right. 
She straightened in his embrace. Maybe they'd never bail hay together again. She looked up into his clear blue eyes. Eyes that held no guile, just genuine honesty and admiration. You're beautiful, with or without sunburned cheeks. His arm tightened. What had simply been his arm around her shoulder became Palmer hugging her. Still maybe in line with friendship, but so close to more. She wanted more. But she wanted his friendship, too. Could she have both? Their kiss hadn't made anything awkward. She tossed her head, moving closer until they were touching. That was mean. If I didn't have an interview in two days, I wouldn't have cared. If you didn't have an interview in two days, it wouldn't have been as fun. His arms moved around her back. She glanced up at his eyes, crinkled at the corners, smiling back at her. Yeah, the same Palmer. Still grinning, still teasing. And now his strong arms were holding her. She put her hands around his waist, as natural as breathing. It didn't feel awkward that she was holding her best friend. It felt better that she was holding her best friend. Seeing his expression shift and watching heat flare in his eyes made the flame in her own chest glow. So, I've been thinking. Palmer took his hat off her head and set it on the hood of the truck. You're scaring me, she teased. His grin flashed like she'd known it would, and suddenly she wanted to burrow into him, having him hold her tight and never let her go. Not to her home, not to L.A., not anywhere but here. She blinked because the thought felt so right. Oh, Squeegee, don't be scared. Not until the smoke starts flying out of my ears. Then it's time to get a little worried. Spit out what you're thinking about, then we need to get back to work. Oh, now she's in a big rush to get to work. Funny she wasn't in such a rush at 4 a.m. this morning. Normal people do not get out of bed before the sun comes up. Normal people don't live in North Dakota. He raised his brows, but she wasn't going to disagree with that one. You can say that again. They grow them strange up here. He laughed. Do I need to remind you that you're a native too? No one ever accused me of being normal. Yeah, they just parade you around and hang medals on your neck. His face still looked relaxed and happy. He'd never been jealous or mean about her successes. I worked hard for those medals. Her hands wanted to move around his waist and hook around his back, but she forced them to rest gently just above his hips. I know you did, Squeegee. Speak to me, cowboy. Why should the work cease while I stand here and wait for you to spit out whatever you were going to say? You tell me to spit it out one more time, and I'm going to kiss you just to shut you up. Spit it out. They laughed together. That was an invitation if I ever heard one. Yeah, it's the North Dakota mating call. He laughed again. I'd get offended if you weren't more native than me. Would you just shut up and kiss me? Since when had it felt exactly right to demand that Palmer kiss her? and he seemed to take it in stride, too, like their normal exchange was just as regular when they were touching each other and talking about kissing. Bossy thing? She rolled her eyes and grabbed the back of his neck, pulling it down. He stopped just a centimeter from her lips. She tugged harder. He pushed back, laughing into her eyes. Palmer. Hey. Maybe I don't want to rush this. Maybe we only have one second kiss, and I want it to be perfect. Technically, this is our almost third kiss. His brow furrowed. So you'd rather argue than kiss? She nodded her brows like she was thinking about it and felt him relax against her hand. She took the opportunity to pull him down, 
pressing her lips to his, pulling him closer. He didn't try to pull back this time, but leaned into her, pressing her closer, picking her up. She wrapped her legs around him and moved her hands over his wide shoulders and up, threading them through his hair. He pressed her against the warm metal of the pickup, and her rocketing world had an anchor. Her heart pounded, spots danced before her eyes, and her fingers and toes curled. He pulled back slightly, pressing kisses to the side of her lips and her eyes, her forehead, and finally the top of her hair. Found something I love more than farming. What's that? She asked with a husky note in her voice that surprised her. Kissing you. Oh, she laughed. Well, you better get a hold of yourself and get this hay done. You have a flight to catch tomorrow. He jerked back, almost dropping her from the pickup. Huh? L.A., you and me. His face did not register understanding. You're going to L.A. with me, remember? Um, I was kind of kidding about that. She studied his face. He didn't seem upset or like he hated the idea, just like he was confused. I bought two tickets. She hadn't needed to ask him for his info for the airline. She knew his just as well as she knew her own. Oh, okay. She loved that about him, that he'd just roll with anything. It's my first time in L.A. Don't you think you ought to be there to help me out? I'm sorry, Squeegee, but me in L.A. would be help about as worthless as teats on a boar hog. She laughed. You're such a farmer. I am a rancher, he said, enunciating each word clearly. Get it right, city girl. Rancher. She raised an eyebrow at him and looked out over the fields of flax and wheat to their left. Hmm, looks like a farm to me. There are no hogs on this farm. Someone's opinion is duly noted. You do realize that you were talking to the same fellow that, three minutes ago, you were practically climbing up to get him to kiss you? She bit her lip. What are we going to do about that? Practice? He lowered his head. She laughed and swatted him. No, I mean you and me. What are we going to do about us? Is there any future for us? I think so. He stepped back, keeping his hands on her shoulders. But it's a beautiful day, and we have a field full of sweet-smelling hay, and we can worry about everything else tomorrow. Or better yet, next week. Okay. Part of her wanted to fix everything right now. But another part decided that it was foolish to worry about something today when she could worry about it just as well next week. That's a deal. Next Monday, I'm going to spend the whole day worrying about us and our future. No, that's too long. Give yourself 30 minutes, then find something else better to do. You're a wise man. Kiss this wise man. And bossy. That makes two of us. She almost kissed him then, but pulled back a fraction of an inch. Does this mean you're my boyfriend? His smile stretched the whole way across his tanned face. I can handle that title. Like it, actually. She kissed him then and resolved she wasn't going to worry about their future. After all, he was going with her to L.A. He might fall in love with the city. Chapter 17 he didn't love L.A. Palmer walked aimlessly down a sidewalk, wondering if Ames was done being interviewed. He looked at the phone in his hand. No, not yet, or she would have texted. They'd gotten in late last night. She'd been quiet on the trip to the airport and the plane ride, and he'd not bothered her. She wanted to do well. She was nervous. She needed to focus and prepare. He got it, 
and had tried to be there to support her, but not annoy her. He'd been out walking since she left. But the endless streets, the constant clanking noise, the busyness and bustle hadn't relaxed him. And they weren't even actually in L.A. They were northwest of the actual city. From his fifth-floor window in the hotel, he could look out and see downtown L.A. Not that he wanted to. He refused to think about home, though. Ames had said she'd bought him a ticket and wanted him to come, and he'd been excited, actually, because he'd already made the decision to sell the ranch if she got the job and move here with her. So, coming here today was supposed to be a good thing but it had just made him realize how big of a change it was going to be for him, someone who had barely been out of North Dakota. Oh, he'd been to the cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul. Twice. They were nothing like L.A. His restlessness and general discontent probably had more to do with him not having anything to do. He wasn't used to being idle. On the ranch, there was always work, or they had deliberately taken a break from the work to relax or to play. But there was never this idleness. People didn't smile or wave. They didn't even look you in the eye when they passed within six inches of you on the sidewalk. Hardly ever in Sweetwater was he this close to this many people, but he felt more alone here, in a city of millions, than he did in his hometown, population 500, give or take or on his ranch, where there were even less people. Maybe it was just a matter of getting to know people. So he'd tried to strike up several conversations with folks. Three different times he'd tried, and the last guy had actually said, if you don't quit talking to me, I'm going to call the cops. It was funny because in Sweetwater, people fell over themselves to help strangers out. They gave tons of unsolicited advice mentioned the festivals that were coming up and worship service times. Heck, there was a guest book on every corner. They wanted visitors, and they wanted a record of those visitors. Here, it was like people didn't want to be bothered. Odd. Why did people who were living on top of people not want to be bothered with people? He saw a restaurant in the distance. Ames hadn't been sure how long her interview would take, so their plane didn't leave until this evening. He could take her out for a nice meal. But he hadn't said anything to Louise about his plan for the ranch, so he couldn't say anything to Ames about his hopes for their future. She knew something had changed, though. She'd been occupied with her interview, but in the hayfield, she'd been okay with his embrace, his kiss. Heck, she'd kissed him. He was good with that. He was good with more. And that would make all this. He looked around at the concrete and the buildings and the people, cars and lights, worthwhile. He'd gotten closer to the restaurant, and it looked good, like a man might be able to get a steak there. He turned and looked for a street sign, wondering if he could find it again and if she'd want to walk this far. His phone rang. Ames. He swiped and answered. Hello? I'm pretty sure I aced the interview. Her voice was low, but it vibrated with excitement. Part of him was so very thrilled for her. Another part buried its head in its arms and cried. Of course. I'm sure you made a great impression. She let out a happy sigh. I'm in the restroom but I wanted to call and let you know. They want to take me out for lunch and talk about the job and what they would expect. He tried to keep the disappointment out of his voice. When do you start? We haven't gotten that far yet. This isn't a working lunch, it's just for information. They did interview four other people, but the secretary told me that I was the one they wanted. And I do think it's unusual for them to take the time to show me around and feed me if they're not really serious about me. They did say they'd drop me off at the airport, though. Can you find your own way? Sure. He fingered the two key cards in his pocket. Do you need me to pack your stuff? Actually, no. They're sending someone to do that, too. 
Although I guess I'd rather you do it if you don't mind. Not at all. I'll pack your stuff up and check your bag. Everything's pretty much packed. It shouldn't be hard. I'll meet you at the airport. I'll text you when I get there, okay? Yep. Palmer? For the first time, a note of uncertainty had crept into her voice. Palmer immediately wanted to reassure her. Squeegee? She laughed like he'd known she would. I know we were going out for dinner. They call it lunch here, he said. They do. I'm sorry. No problem. This is the opportunity you've been waiting for. I know. Again, her voice fell. If you want, I can cancel with them and go out with you like we planned. He was afraid she was worried about him. Maybe about making sure that he was okay or about him being upset that she was busy with other things and didn't have time for him. He didn't want to be the one to hold her back. He didn't want her to give up the opportunities she had because of him. He didn't want to stand in her way. For the first time, he wondered if he should even go with her when she moved to L.A. He'd seen it as being with the one he loved, but maybe that was selfish. Maybe Ames would be better off without him. The thought didn't sit well, and he pushed it aside. Nope, I'm fine. You go show those folks how amazing you truly are, and I'll meet you at the airport. Thanks, Palmer. Her voice was as sincere as it could be. He swiped off and kept walking, now thinking about lunch for one. The price of everything was so expensive. He knew he was being as cheap as his ancestors, but he had decided he'd rather be hungry than spend as much for a hamburger as a steak dinner for his entire family would cost him at home. His stomach rumbled, but he was almost back to the hotel when he noticed more horns than usual blaring. He craned his neck to see what was going on. A car with a flat tire blocked the right lane of traffic. A man in a business suit holding a phone to his ear stood beside it, looking annoyed. Palmer didn't have much experience with those fancy cars, but every car had a spare. He could get the guy off the road at least. He walked over and waited while the man talked. I can't wait two hours. I have a meeting in ten minutes. I need it fixed now. Palmer looked at the guy's eyes and waited for him to acknowledge him. The first time their eyes met, the guy looked away. The second time, a thoughtful look came over his face, and he stopped talking and let the phone drop to the side. His eyes went up and down Palmer's form noting the cowboy hat, the boots and jeans, the checkered shirt. Palmer had already figured out there might be a lot of people in L.A., but no one dressed like him. He'd have fit in better wearing his running clothes. You can change my tire? Palmer nodded. How much? How about a smile and a handshake? The guy grinned, but there were still tones of suspicion on his face. Palmer couldn't blame him. Just from his experience walking around this morning, he didn't figure anyone else would be stopping. Tell you what, Palmer said, I'll let you buy me a hamburger that costs as much as a side of beef where I come from. The man gave him another head-to-toe sweep. It's pretty obvious you're not from around here. Nope. Sounded like you're in a hurry. Want me to change it or not? The guy looked up and down the street as horns blared. Yes, please. Palmer dug out the flimsy little jack that didn't look like it could hold up a bicycle and the spare tire that would hopefully hold together to get the guy where he was going. The car was fairly new. The bolts loosened without too much trouble, and it took Palmer all of 15 minutes to change it. He lowered the jack and pulled it out. He put the tools away in the trunk of the car and closed it. The man stood beside him, his hand out, a smile on his face, and a hamburger in his left hand. Palmer grinned and shook his hand. Greg Butler, I work with the Olympic Committee. Palmer Olson. Unless this is some kind of fake meat, I grow this. He pointed at the beef in his burger. Oh, it's real. High dollar Angus. Palmer smiled. You know Ames Hansen? 
That name sounds familiar, but I don't think I know her personally. Just wondering, since you said Olympics, she had a couple of medals in the biathlon. I'm here with her. The man squinted a little and tilted his head. Hmm. Funny how things work. Let me get your number and I'll give you my card. Ames walked slowly down the wide but crowded airport hall. Over the heads of all the milling people, she could see the number for her terminal was just ahead. Her feet hurt, her head hurt, and all she wanted was to be with Palmer. He was waiting. She'd texted him. She saw him. Leaning against a post, his bag slung over his shoulder, his hat and boots making him stand out from the crowd. His pose was casual, but his eyes scanned in her direction, searching. They zeroed in on her, and as their gazes met, the noise of all the other people faded away, her aches disappeared, and a warmth filled her. It felt like home. The city, with its noise and dirt, crowds and bustle, had drained her. The stress of the interview and short tour probably hadn't helped, either but Palmer made all of that fade into nothing. She didn't think twice, but walked straight to him and wrapped her arms around him, taking in his warmth and energy. Even after two days in L.A., he still carried the scent of North Dakota, the wind and the sunshine. Fresh hay and working toughness. She breathed him in. His hands encircled her back, his big palms running down her tired muscles and back up before pulling her even closer. His lips nuzzled her hair, and she tucked her head under his chin, leaning into his solid strength. They stood like that for a long time as the stress of the day eased from her body. She finally drew back. I'm so glad you're here. That bad? Actually, it was great. Way better than I'd thought or hoped. It was just a lot. And all day, I was conscious that I needed to make a good impression. I'm ready to decompress. I hope you can do that on an airplane. It's past time to board. She held on to his biceps and looked up into his eyes, waiting until he looked down, making sure he saw the sincerity on her face. Thank you for being here. I know we didn't even really do anything together. They'd gotten in late last night and gone directly to their separate hotel rooms, and she'd left this morning for her interview after just a small bite to eat. But knowing you were here with me gave me confidence. Like it didn't matter what happened today. I knew when it was over, you'd welcome me back, even if I were the biggest failure in the world. You can't be the biggest failure in the world. You've already accomplished more than most people accomplish in their lifetimes. She grunted and pressed back into his chest. His arms came around her immediately. She wasn't sure exactly when it had started feeling natural to hold her best friend, pressing into him and feeling her heart beat strong and steady against her cheek, but she knew she didn't want to lose the right to hold Palmer. His wife, when he got one, probably wouldn't appreciate Ames holding on to her husband, breathing his scent and taking his comfort. There was a solution to that. Ames knew it. But it would mean giving up everything she'd been shown today. As exciting as all of that was, she also knew that some people spent their lives searching for a man like Palmer. She wasn't 100% sure, but she was almost certain if she told him she'd marry him and stay in North Dakota, he'd stop at the church house on the way home. But Palmer could never live in L.A., she would have to be the one to stay in North Dakota. Even after all the glitz and potential fame that she glimpsed today, she wasn't sure that it was what she really wanted. It was everything she'd worked for her whole life, but maybe the elusive satisfaction she'd been scrambling for had been under her nose the whole time. The thought shocked her so much, Palmer felt it. What? he asked. I have a lot to think about, she said. The loudspeaker said last call for boarding, and she and Palmer turned toward the opening. Palmer's hand slid into hers, his calloused strength hard and rough against her softness. She closed her eyes at how right it felt, 
standing beside him, tall and confident, knowing he'd protect and care for her, having nothing but her best interests at heart. If he really cared for you, he'd give up his farm. The insidious voice inside her head cackled at her revulsion. She would never ask that of him, knowing how he loved it. She'd always known it would have to be her moving to North Dakota. Did she really want to be a rancher's wife, stuck on the farm for the rest of her life? The warmth from Palmer's hand traveled up her arm. Did she never want to feel this again? His thumb brushed over the skin of her wrist. She looked up. Her heart flipped at the satisfied smile on his face. He squeezed her hand, and words flowed between them without them having to speak. They'd been friends for years. They'd even kissed. But they stood together now, waiting to board, with their hands clasped together like... like they were a couple. It wasn't awkward. She didn't want to pull away. In fact, she wanted to be closer. She squeezed his hand back. He smiled bigger, and her heart expanded. In that moment, their relationship shifted. More than the kisses they'd shared, more than his tender embrace, more than being best friends, it felt like they belonged together. Maybe she'd have to give some, maybe he would, but somehow, she knew everything would work out. They were on their way home from the regional airport in North Dakota, driving in his pickup down a deserted I-29 when the text message came. Palmer drove with one hand on the wheel, one hand still holding hers on the seat between them. She felt the vibration of his phone. One side of his mouth pulled up as he looked at her. I don't want to let go. She smiled back, feeling the newness of the change in their relationship. Her grin turned sassy, despite their tiredness in the late hour. I'll get it. If it's one of your other girls, I'm telling them you're taken. She reached over and pulled the phone out from where he'd shoved it under his leg. None of my other girls have phones. They should be bedded down in the pasture about now, ruminating. Well, at least I'm skinnier than they are. I have that going for me. Oh, is that an asset? I'll have to read the livestock report. Maybe I've been doing it wrong this whole time. The livestock report is not where you should be getting advice on women. Hmm. He tugged on her hand. Why don't you scoot a little closer and tell me exactly where I should be getting my advice? I don't want to miss a word. I finally caught the eye of the one I want. I don't want to lose her. Finally? She unhooked her belt and slid across the bench seat, buckling the lap belt in the middle. I didn't know you were trying. You weren't around long enough. She laughed. I haven't been around any longer this summer. Less, actually. I've only been back for a couple of weeks. Okay, so it wasn't me that caught your eye. It was you that finally came to your senses. I've never had the threat of you getting married to someone else hanging over my head. His arms tightened around her shoulders, and he pulled her even closer to him. I never knew if you were going to come back with someone else or even if you would come back. She tilted her head, eyeing him, wondering how long he felt that way. I'm sorry, she whispered. He shook his head as though answering the question she hadn't had to ask. I don't even know how long it's mattered. Maybe longer than I realized because I would fight anything that I felt stronger than friendship, since I didn't want to lose you, Squeegee. Okay, cowboy. She leaned her head back on his arm, her head turned. I don't know either. I guess I'm the same. You were the standard. What? No other guy was ever as fun. You were taller. You were more handsome. They didn't have your love of the land, your work ethic, your sense of adventure, your devotion to family. They didn't understand me the way you did. They didn't push my buttons, and they couldn't give me a stupid nickname like Squeegee and make it sound like the most tender endearment. You couldn't talk them into jumping from the top barn beam? She snorted. <laughs> that too. They didn't quit talking to you when you broke their leg? I did not break your leg. You... 
His phone buzzed again, and she'd remembered that she'd never looked at it to begin with. She held it up. It's from your sister. Half of the message was cut off, so she pressed the button and entered his password. It was the same as hers, Tella's birth date. They'd gotten their first phones about the same time she was born. Ames still remembered sitting in the hospital waiting to go in to see Louise and Tella, Palmer and her trying to figure out the newfangled technology together, wondering what a good password would be. She'd had three or four phones since. Palmer hadn't been around when she'd gotten any of them, and now she used her thumbprint to open it most of the time, but her numerical passcode had stayed the same on all of them. Palmer's phone opened. Apparently, his had, too. She pulled Louise's text up and read it out loud. Pap fell. He's coherent but wobbly. I think he might have had another stroke. I'm taking him to the hospital in Rockerton. Graham and Teller are with me. The stock is fed for tonight, but the waterer in the far corner pasture is leaking. Palmer's jaw set. His finger tapped the steering wheel. Ames set his phone down and put her hand on his leg. He jumped a little and his mouth turned up, despite the worried look on his face. That slow grin that made her heart do cartwheels spread across his face. I can get used to this, Palmer said, looking at her hand before focusing back on the road. The tapping had stopped and his jaw relaxed. Aren't you worried? she asked. No point. Another thing she loved about him. He just took life the way it came. She had a tendency to want to grab it by the horns and wrestle it into what she wanted. What are you going to do? she asked. About what? Pap. She supposed she could have said, about us, but Pap's situation was more pressing. She was pretty sure the last time he'd been in the hospital, it had taken all of the ranch's savings. Surely he was worried, not only about that, but about Pap surviving. Don't you want to be with him? Somebody has to be there to feed the stock in the morning. If I absolutely had to be away, Sawyer would do it. And if we had to, we could take turns covering each other's daily chores, but we haven't gotten to that point yet. I know how to feed. I might be able to fix the water, too. At the very least, I can make sure the trough is full and they all get a drink. His hand tightened on her shoulder. He waited until they passed the oncoming semi before he looked over at her. Are you sure? Yes, she said with confidence. I'll take you up on that. Can you text Louise and see where we can meet? We should pass her at some point. You mind driving this old thing home? Not at all. She'd driven it around the farm without him beside her, but never off it. Suddenly, she realized this was what her life would be like if she were with Palmer. It might not always be new and glamorous, but life on the ranch was busy every day. Always something to do. Always new problems and challenges to face. Wouldn't it be better to face life with an honest man who loved her by her side than reaching for glory and glamour on her own? She texted Louise and set up their meeting place. We're about 30 minutes away, she figured. That works, he said, watching the road while he passed a slow-moving car. The wind had picked up and it buffeted the truck. Ames felt a little sliver of anxiety at the idea of driving by herself in the dark and wind. To take her mind off it, she moved her hand a little on his hard thigh. What's going to happen to us? We're going to meet Louise. You're going to take the truck home. I'm going... No, I mean us. You and me. What's going to happen to us? He bent over and kissed her forehead without taking his eyes off the road. What do you want? She sighed. She wanted him. Was that enough? Her finger made little circles on his jeans. How about we just enjoy what we have today? Tomorrow will take care of itself. Typical Palmer. She wanted everything worked out. She wanted a plan. She wanted to know how the story ended. But life didn't always work out that way. She leaned her head on his shoulder. Okay. 
Chapter 18 The faint beeping of a hospital monitor drifted in Pap's darkened room. He'd been moved to an actual room less than an hour ago. Louise and Tella had gone to get a hotel room. Graham sat in the chair beside Pap's bed, holding his hand, her head back, and her eyes closed. This was part of Graham's journey, and she walked this leg the same way she'd walked the earlier, easier parts, with strength and dignity. A smile. A kiss on the forehead of her husband and best friend while they gripped hands and continued on, together. Palmer studied his grandparents, him in the hospital bed, her beside him, their hands clasped between them. They'd weathered the brutal North Dakota winters together, the volatile beef market, the lean years of drought, rejoiced in the years of plenty. Through it all, he'd never heard them say they were going to quit, seldom heard them complain, never saw them lie or cheat or steal, never heard them beg. No matter how little they had, there was always a handout to help someone else. They'd never refused a neighbor who'd asked to borrow, and they always showed up when someone needed a hand. They never quit working, never quit believing in each other. They'd been faithful to their work, to their family, to their town and community, to each other. His grandparents were his heroes. He wanted to look back at his life like that. Was there any better thing than a man be found faithful? He sighed, shoving his hands into his pockets and pacing to the window. The orange light of dawn hadn't yet appeared, but the lightning sky promised it was coming. Ames would be up now, just like Palmer was almost every morning of his life. In the barn, on the tractor counting cows, checking the fence, watering, feeding, fixing. The work never ended, and he loved every minute of it. What a blessing to look up at the sky and see the colors change, to watch the snow come down, to feel the wind on his face, to walk the same path his ancestors had walked, fight the same fight. The choices he had, the decisions he had to make, they all ran through his head. Could he sell the ranch? What would Graham and Pap say? He'd already decided he couldn't marry a stranger and hope she stuck with him. It would solve his immediate money problems, but he might end up worse in the long run, and he'd have to let Ames go. Could he go with her if Pap were in bad shape? Could he watch Ames walk away again? Could he live his life without her? Did he want to? Maybe his want to's didn't factor in. He still needed to discuss this with Louise. But the decision he'd made before still seemed like the best one, even if it meant giving up the life he thought he'd been born to live. Even if it meant leaving Graham and Pap. You should get some sleep. Graham's whispered words seemed loud after the silence, and he startled. I thought you were asleep. He went over and knelt beside her chair. After you have kids, you learn to sleep with one eye open. He snorted. Kids might not be in the future for him either. He and Ames had done a lot of things together, talked about a lot of stuff but kids had never really entered their conversations. It's a good skill, he offered. You'll know what I mean someday. He grunted, unwilling to contradict her. Graham ran her thumb over the back of Pap's hand, watching their skin slide together. Finally, she said, What's holding you back? From what? From Ames, you're not going to try to pretend to me that your feelings haven't grown into something more than friendship. He put his hand over top of Graham's other hand. If I want to be with Ames, I'm going to have to leave the ranch. You're going to have to sell it anyway, to pay these bills. He blinked at Graham's matter-of-fact tone. She wasn't crying and she wasn't blaming. 
He supposed he should have expected that she'd know what needed to be done and face it like she'd faced everything else over the years. He didn't know why he thought he'd need to shoulder it alone. You have the power of attorney. I assumed you'd talk with Louise, but I don't see any other way. There actually is another option, he said softly, studying the difference between his hand, young and strong, and hers, old and translucent. No. Yes, there is. You don't. I saw the letter. You did? I did. There's not too much that goes on around the ranch that I'm not privy to. She narrowed her eyes thoughtfully. There might even be more going on than what you think. Really? But it's not my place to tell. Okay. But that's not an option. Ames has her heart set on L.A. You have your heart set on Ames. Maybe if we hadn't had the medical bills to pay, you could just farm during the summer, sell the cows, and live in L.A. during the winter. That might work, although a relationship needs to be rock solid in order to endure separation like that. Ames is rock solid. You are too, son. It made his chest swell with all the good feelings to hear that praise from his grandmother. Lavish praise for a Norwegian. Thank you. She twisted her hand in his and patted his. If you didn't have Ames, I might say take a chance on someone else. I thought I loved your grandfather when we got married, but I didn't have a clue what love was then. It's a lot less about the tingly feelings and a lot more about finding someone with character who won't quit on you. He had the tingly feelings down. Ames was the only one who gave him those. He knew there wasn't any quit in her. He didn't have much himself. She patted his hand again. Sell the ranch, Palmer. Don't worry about the money. You can make it, you can lose it, but you can't buy a girl like Ames. I know you're right, Graham, but I love the land too. Maybe you'll come back to it. It wouldn't be quite the same not walking into the house his ancestors had walked in, looking out at the same view, farming the same fields. You have ancestors all over this state. It doesn't have to be one little patch of ground. Choose in order of importance. Of course, leave it to Graham to boil it down. Ames first, land second. Heck, maybe I have relatives in L.A., not everyone stayed in North Dakota. There's appeal there, too. Forget about the city. Look at the ocean. There's still sky, stars. The same moon shines down on L.A. You're right. Listen to your grandmother, son. She's usually right. Pap's voice came from the bed. Palmer stood, his knees protesting after being on the hard floor so long. I didn't realize you were awake, Pap. How are you feeling? I was feeling fine to begin with, just a little confused because I wasn't completely awake. Louise had told him that Pap had gotten up in the night to go to the bathroom and had fallen because he hadn't woken anyone up to help him. I see, Palmer said. How much of their conversation had Pap heard? Maybe his question showed on his face because Pap said, your gram is right. If you need to sell the farm to pay the bills and be with Ames, that's what you need to do. He pulled Graham's hand to his mouth and kissed it. We've had a lot of good years together. They weren't all years with a lot of money, but a lot of money doesn't make you happy. You think it will, but it's just an illusion. He gave a little chuckle. It's better to hitch up to a good partner. You can look back on your own life. The best times are the times we spent together. Palmer knew they were right. I need to talk to Louise. You do that. Palmer was waiting for Louise when she walked off the elevator shortly after noon. 
After greeting them and giving them the rundown on the little that had happened since they left, he looked at Tella. Graham and Pap are in his room waiting for you. I need to talk to your mom. She gave her mom a worried look. Okay. Palmer wanted to reassure her that it was nothing serious, but it actually was, so he didn't give her false platitudes. He waited until she disappeared in the right room. Louise had deep furrows between her eyes, and her forehead was crinkled. He hated seeing his sister so worried. She'd already had a harder life than she deserved. The waiting room is empty. He put his hand on the knob. Do you mind? No, but you're scaring me. Stop with the drama already. He started speaking before the door had closed. I talked to Graham and Pap a little about the ranch and the money situation, along with the hospital bills. He took a deep breath. How do you feel about selling the ranch? Her eyes grew wide, like the thought had never occurred to her before. The longer she stared at him, the more like a heel he felt. Her mouth opened and closed, then she crossed her arms over her chest and walked to the big window at the end of the room. He had a feeling she wasn't seeing anything when she stared outside. All the choices he could make ran through his head again. He was making the best decision for himself. Selling the ranch. That would give him aims. But it would mean Louise and Tella would lose their home. There would be money left over from the sale. They'd be set up nicely in town. Once the outstanding bills were paid and Graham and Pap were settled in their care facility, Louise might not even have to work. Finally, she turned around. Her face looked resolute, her lips pressed together, her jaw set. How about I take the ranch over? He lifted his brows, not having expected her to say this. It's not that you can't. Don't be ridiculous. Of course I can't. Not by myself. Her eyes focused on a spot behind his head. His stomach twisted. Paul Perot and I have been talking about getting married. Paul? He couldn't stop his mouth. He did manage to shut it after that one word. He's a hardworking man. He doesn't know much about ranching, but he'd be willing to work the farm after you left. We still need to pay the hospital bills. He... She looked down at her fingers like she'd suddenly grown an eleventh one. If we got married, we'd have some money, and we'd use it to pay the medical bills. There would be enough and more. You've already talked about this? Where had he been? Had he really been so wrapped up in Ames that he'd not noticed things happening with Louise? If you're so in love with Paul, why hasn't he been out to the house? She didn't answer for several slow, agonizing heartbeats. I never said I was in love with him. He ran a hand through his hair. That's a relief. Her brows went up. Palmer recognized her warning look. Hey, Palmer said. If I had pulled something like this out of left field, you'd be giving me a hard time too. If you had told me that you were marrying, say, Katie... He closed the distance between them in several quick strides, drilling into her eyes. That's different. She tilted her head. Palmer, I'm an adult. I understand you love Ames and want to be with her. He'd never said he loved Ames, but Louise didn't wait for his protest. She continued. I would never ask you to stay if you need to go. But you would. I know you would if you thought it was best for everyone. This decision is mine. I can save the ranch, and I want to. Paul is not a bad man. He hangs out at the bar on Friday night. Lots of people do. Maybe he'd stay home if he had a wife and child. He doesn't get drunk. He just hangs out there. He's got a wandering eye. Louise's eyes didn't drop. I'm not pretending to love him. He knows it. He's getting something good out of the bargain, and so am I. Plus, he's good with Tella, and she likes him. Palmer's lips pressed together, but he didn't argue with that. 
Paul was good with children. Before he and his brother sold their ranch, they lost 20 good cows because Paul was too lazy to get his butt out of bed and move them before the blizzard struck. We've lost cows too. Not because I was lying in bed instead of out working. A hand touched his back. He didn't have to turn to know it was Ames. She has a right to make her decision, the same as you do. It's a bad one, he said, turning to her and burying his face in her hair. It's not the first bad decision I've made. Louise gave Palmer a challenging look. And I've lived with the consequences. All of them. Her expression eased. Palmer, I know you feel like you need to defend and take care of me, but this is my decision. Ames spoke softly. I don't want to interrupt your conversation, but on my way, the studio in Los Angeles called and offered me the job. They've met all my demands, including being able to work on their Olympic media team. It's a better offer than I ever imagined. I can't turn it down. Palmer felt like his chest was exploding. He couldn't let Ames walk away, but he couldn't let Louise sacrifice herself for the ranch. Wasn't there something he could do? I need to think about this, he finally said. Louise jerked her head. I'm going to see Pap. She walked out, still determined. Stubbornness was her biggest vice. Palmer was afraid it was too late to change her mind. Chapter 19 The door closed behind Louise. A light finally went on in Ames' head. Wait a minute. You said you want to sell the ranch? Yep. That meant... She shook her head. You can't. If you're going to be in L.A., I'm going to be in L.A. too. His words sent waves of thrilling happiness rolling through her. But what are you going to do in L.A.? You know, I thought about that yesterday. She felt so bad for leaving him alone all day after practically forcing him to go. She'd imagined them strolling the city together, seeing the sights. It could have been romantic. I'm sorry, you had a lot of time to think. I did, and I decided I was going to be a movie star. Ames jerked back. Dark horror welled up inside of her. Not Palmer. He was the salt of the earth. Hollywood would ruin him. I'm kidding. She laughed, a belly laugh that filled the room. From relief more than humor. I actually made a contact of my own. That didn't surprise her. Not at all. Of course, you've never met a stranger, even in L.A. Actually, people there aren't very friendly. Hmm. Guilt pooled in her stomach. She could picture Palmer walking down the sidewalk, smiling and waving, tipping his hat to ladies, just like he'd do on the streets of Sweetwater. He'd get a vastly different reaction from the folks in L.A. She should have been there with him. I changed a guy's tire. He gave me his number, and we'll see. With the cost of everything in L.A., I'll have to work, too. But that's why we're going. That's right. He was leaving his farm and giving up a billion dollars to go to the city that he'd always claimed to hate with her. Yeah, I'm going to have a pretty good salary, actually. And I don't think we'll need to live right in the city. Whatever. You really don't care? Graham said it really well this morning. He put his finger on her nose. You're first. Location second. He shrugged, removing his finger and kissing her nose. Everything else comes after that. Ames could hardly move. The man, Palmer, her best friend, was literally giving up everything in his life, leaving a fortune behind just to be with her. She couldn't wrap her head around it. Seriously? He wasn't resentful, wasn't begging her to stay, wasn't annoyed. Heck, the only thing that bothered him was that his sister didn't want to sell the ranch. Was everything okay at home? He asked Ames, 
putting his arm around her. She melted into his solid strength and absolute confidence. Yes, she barely thought about what she was saying. I couldn't fix the leaking water hose, so I filled the tank up three times while they drank. Perfect. He nuzzled her hair and ran his hands down her back. She shivered. I brought my car in, and you can take it back if you need to. I think I will. Did you sleep? She asked, knowing he probably hadn't. No. You should. I think you care about me. She tilted her head up, searching eyes as blue as the North Dakota sky. A little smile played around her mouth. I love you, cowboy. His eyes widened, then squeezed, and he pulled her tighter. I love you too, squeegee. He lowered his head, their lips mere inches apart. She had to speak. I know you do. You wouldn't be giving up so much. He put his finger over her lips. It's not about what I'm giving up. It's about what I'm gaining. Something passed over his face, and he leaned back. I was going to do this yesterday. He took both of her hands. I might be getting ahead of myself a little here, so no pressure or anything, and I'll move to L.A. and we can rent separate spaces. If I can't afford rent, I'll sleep in your garage or in a tent in the park. She opened her mouth to say that he would never need to sleep in the park, that he was being ridiculous, but he put a finger over her lips. I'm only going to do this once in my life. It's not going exactly as planned, but at least let me try to do a good job. What was he talking about? Something in his face caused pinpricks of nerves to push out from her stomach. I know it hasn't been very long since we've been more than friends. His thumbs ran over the back of her hands. But we've known each other and been best friends since high school. This was an easy decision for me, but I understand if you need time. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. All I know is, I want to be with you. He dropped her right hand and reached into his pocket. Her eyes opened wide, and her heart catapulted into her chest when he dropped to one knee and held up a golden band with a pearl inset surrounded by tiny diamonds. This was my great-great-grandmother's wedding band. He swallowed, his eyes never leaving hers. His words came out slowly. I thought you might be willing to wear it as an engagement ring. Ames, will you marry me? Her knees felt weak, and for some reason, tears pricked her eyes. Why did seeing him kneeling in front of her, asking her to share her life with him, make her feel so amazed? Yes, she squealed, then clamped a hand over her mouth when she remembered where they were. She dropped to her knees in front of him while he tried to slip the band on her finger, but her hands were shaking so hard it made it almost impossible. Just kiss me, she said. I'm getting my ring on your finger first. The ring was a little snug over her knuckle, but it fit loosely on her finger. I just have big knuckles, she said after he slid it on. She held it out, admiring. It's so beautiful. My great-grandmother gave it to me shortly after I moved here. She gave her own ring to Louise and her husband's mother's ring to Sawyer. I don't know how long they've been in the family, but it doesn't matter. If you don't like it, if you want something newer or bigger, no, it's perfect. It's part of your heritage. Just like the ranch. The thought slipped in, unbidden. It seemed like she was getting everything she wanted and everyone around her was sacrificing. Louise, Palmer, Graham, and Pap. Palmer took her chin in his fingers and tilted it up. What? You seem sad. Squeegee, if you don't want to marry me, if you don't want me in L.A., if you... Shut up! He stood and pulled him off the floor before someone came in and thought they were crazy. Have you ever known me not to speak my mind? Have you ever been able to get me to do something I didn't want to do? It's me that makes you do what you don't want to. 
I'm the one that always gets my way. As she said it, she knew it was true. She got what she wanted every time. Sure, she worked hard for things, but she also wasn't afraid to speak up and go for it. Look happy then, because you look like I just fed you a lemon rather than gave you my great-great-grandmother's engagement ring. She laughed and kept the smile on her face. Let's go see Pap. Pap was released from the hospital later that day. The tests all came back clear, and the doctor only said he needed to make sure he was completely awake and preferably have someone helping him when he needed to move around in the night. Ames understood Palmer's dilemma because they really needed to hire someone to help with Pap. Louise and Palmer couldn't do it all. Ames knew that Graham and Pap had said to sell the farm, but it made her sad to think of them in a care facility, especially knowing she could prevent it. Palmer had left earlier with Tella so he could tend the stock. Ames rode home with Louise and Graham and Pap. They dropped her off at her house on their way through town. It was about nine in the evening. The sea store light went out as she strode up the walk, so she waited at the kitchen table for her parents to come home. She'd never been terribly close to them, helping out when she was home, but spending all the time she could at the ranch. She'd called them earlier and told them she'd gotten the job, but her parents were Norwegian to the core and did not get excited about anything. Or maybe the way they showed excitement wasn't as effusive as the rest of the world. It didn't matter. She loved them anyway, but she'd always been independent, and they'd seemed okay with that. Hey, Mom, Dad, she said as they walked in the door. Her mother smiled, her blue eyes tired but happy. Her dad nodded. Made it home safe. Good. She held up her hand. Palmer asked me to marry him. Her mother nodded knowingly. It's about time you said yes. Yep. You saw you're going to run the farm while he goes to L.A. with you? Her dad asked. Ames twisted the ring on her finger. Why did he assume Palmer was going to L.A.? Maybe because she just got the job offer and she'd just told him about it that morning? Even though that's what they'd planned, she said, I haven't accepted the job yet. But of course you're going to. Her mother shut the refrigerator door, a Diet Coke in hand. You've worked hard for this. It's what you want. Was it? She didn't really want to settle in L.A. That's where the job was, but it's not where she wanted to be. She wanted to be here, in North Dakota, where people were friendly, where the community gathered around and supported each other, where the man she loved made a living on the land of his ancestors and protected and provided for his family. But she didn't want to give up everything she'd worked for. Or did she even want that anymore? Ames, her mother said softly, that boy has been waiting a long time for you. He'll still be here when you've done what you want in L.A. The kid ain't ever gonna leave his farm. It's not like some girl's gonna come in and snatch him anyway. When you're ready, he'll be waiting, her dad said. The words would have shocked her any other time, but her dad really seemed to have taken what Palmer said to heart and had a complete change of attitude. In the meantime, you might find someone better in L.A. She grunted. Not likely. Thanks, Mom and Dad. I think I'll take a walk before heading to bed. I can open in the morning if you need me to. That would be wonderful. Her mother took a sip of her pop. When are you leaving? I have to tell them by next Friday if I'm taking the job. They'll let me know then when they want me to start. Great. Let us know, her dad said. I will. Ames walked over and kissed her dad on the cheek. She hugged her mom. Good night. Palmer was disappointed when Ames didn't come home with Louise. He helped get their grandparents in and settled, then stood out on the porch a while and watched the first lightning bugs of the season. Louise came out, closing the door softly behind her. Why don't you go to her? He snorted. <laughs> that obvious? 
You're staring down the road in the direction of her house. When we came home without her, I thought you were going to ignore us all and hop in your truck right away. I have to get up and feed in the morning. I can do it. He turned to her. I wish, shh, she said. We can't wish our lives away. We just need to do the best we can with what we have. That's what I'm going to do. He closed his mouth. I'll let you then. Thanks. He almost snorted again because Louise was going to do what she wanted whether he let her or not. He moved toward the steps. I'll be late. Just keep an ear out for Graham and Pap in the morning after I leave the house. I'll take Tella with me. She loves to feed. He suddenly understood. You want her to grow up on the ranch. There isn't a better place in the world to raise a child. I already kept her from having the family she deserves. Growing up on the ranch will help make it up to her. He nodded and walked over to his sister. They were Norwegian all the way through, and they were not demonstrative. But he hugged her. I love you. Love you too, bro. Get going. Thirty minutes later, he pulled up along the street in front of Ames' house. He realized as he put the truck in park that he'd neglected to tell her he was coming in his haste to get there. But just as he got his phone out to text, he saw her leaning against the tree in her front yard, the spot where he'd waited for her after the festival. He smiled at the memory and got out. How'd you know I was thinking about you, cowboy? I'd hope you were thinking about the guy you just promised to marry today. He opened the gate and walked through, not stopping until he had her in his arms and kissed her like he hadn't seen her in months or years. Never again. He'd never again be parted from her for so long. I don't want to spend a night apart, he said, his voice sounding hoarse as he lifted his mouth from her lips. Better marry me quick, he laughed. After we're married, I don't want to spend a night apart. Me either. She took a deep breath. And I don't want to spend more than a couple of nights a year in any state but North Dakota. He'd been running his fingers through her hair, but her comments stopped him cold like a stampeding cow hitting the fence. But your job, L.A., how? She put both hands on either side of his face. I don't want it. Yes, you do. No, I don't. I don't want to live in L.A. All the things I've done, all the places I've been, I've never considered them permanent. Here, this is permanent. You, us, we're permanent. I was never ready to be permanent, but I knew, somehow, if I ever was ready, I wanted to plant my roots here, and always with you, on your ranch. She bit her lip. If that's okay with you, and Louise, and Tella, Pamp, and Graham, they'll be thrilled. I promise. He ran everything she'd said through his mind. But you love adventure and excitement. You like to be on the go. She put her hands on her hips. Have we ever been bored on the ranch? He shook his head slowly. There's always something to do. Someone coming or going. Challenges that need to be faced. She tilted her head. Maybe it was seeing your pap in the hospital, with Graham sitting beside him, holding his hand, and I thought about their years together. The good and the bad. The cold, the heat the bugs, the work, and all the fun they've always had together through it all. His heart filled and his throat thickened. He couldn't speak. She swallowed. Palmer, I want that to be us. I want the challenge of making a home that is filled with love and laughter. I want the excitement of welcoming people into our lives and sharing what we have with them. I want the satisfaction of working beside the man I love, making a living from the land we love, and raising a family and being a part of a close-knit community that stands together. I'm proud of where I come from, and I'm proud of the people who've traveled this way before me. 
She bit her lip. It's not glamorous, and it's not something that will draw applause or fame, but those aren't things that I admire or even want. I just want everything I have with you and everything we can have together. He kissed her then, since he couldn't speak, knowing she had spoken from her heart. Knowing she wasn't feeling like she was giving up anything for him. Rather, they were putting down roots. Together. Epilogue Louise stood at the front of the sanctuary. There was no air conditioning, and despite the ceiling fans that blew on high, the heat and the crowd of wedding guests made the small church stifling. Ames stood next to her, in a long white gown, her back to Louise. Palmer held both of Ames' hands in his, and he stared into his new bride's eyes with such love and tenderness that it almost made Louise tear up. The preacher spoke the last words that would join them together for life. On the other side, behind Palmer, Sawyer stood, his shoulders broad but his suit almost hung on his bony frame. He couldn't keep working the way he was, but Louise wasn't going to worry about him today. She and Sawyer were the only attendants. Ames' parents sat in the front row. Louise had been surprised that her parents had made the trip up to see Palmer get married, since they'd been absent for so much of their children's lives, but there they were in the row opposite. They looked a little bored, but Graham and Pap beside them just beamed. Ames had been like a daughter to them over the years, and everyone was thrilled they were finally getting together. I now pronounce you man and wife. Pastor Hoop grinned. You may kiss your bride. Palmer leaned down and spent an embarrassingly long time kissing Ames. The guests whistled and shouted, and barely calmed when the pastor said, I now present to you Mr. and Mrs. Palmer and Ames Olson. More shouts erupted. Palmer and Ames just smiled into each other's eyes. Louise was happy for them, thrilled. Palmer and Ames belonged together more than anyone she knew. But it did make her a little sad. She glanced at Tella in the front row between Louise's parents and grandparents. She'd never have a love like that because she needed to make decisions based on what was best for Tella. Even though the ranch's finances would be taken care of and their grandparents too, Tella and Louise would make a crowd in the house with newlyweds. If she married Paul, they'd buy their own ranch with the money she inherited. Maybe more than that, though, Tella needed a father. Palmer and Sawyer were doing their best, and Louise loved her brothers beyond words for their efforts but Sawyer was killing himself trying to turn the rundown ranch he'd bought into something profitable, and now that Palmer was married, he'd be having children of his own. Study after study showed that a child did best in a home with a mother and a father. She didn't want Tella to spend the rest of her life paying for Louise's mistake. It hadn't felt like a mistake at the time. Louise smiled, remembering she was standing in front of the guests and this was a happy occasion, and adjusted Ames' train. The reception was going to be held just outside on the church grounds. Her stomach growled as the smell of ground beef casserole and roasted potatoes and corn wafted through the window. She kept the corners of her mouth lifted up and stood through the many pictures. Then she helped Ames out and got her settled with her dress hooked up so it wouldn't drag and get ruined. Paul came over to her as she finally filled her plate. The serving line was empty and so were a lot of the dishes. Still, she found enough to fill her belly. I'm sitting over there, he pointed to a place. There's enough room for you to sit beside me. Tella was eating with her grandparents, and Louise's parents were helping Graham and Pap, so Louise nodded. She supposed if she were going to marry Paul, she needed to get used to sitting with him. People would talk, but that was a small town. She had just sat down and was trying to force herself to pay attention to Paul when a man, larger than anyone else at the wedding, walked by. There was a stirring and murmuring in his wake. Louise's heart pitched to her throat, 
and she struggled to keep her expression politely interested in whatever Paul was saying. Allowing herself two full seconds to take a look, she swallowed a gasp and turned immediately back to Paul. He never looked in her eyes when he spoke anyway, so he didn't suspect anything was amiss. Ty was back in town. She longed to look for Tella to make sure she was okay. She longed even more to let herself look at the man who had met her by the river and promised to call and visit after he left for college. It had all been a lie, of course. In the few visits he'd made back to Sweetwater in the last nine years, none of them had involved doing anything aside from visiting his mother and siblings for a day or two before taking off again. He'd never searched her out, never called, and she'd not seen him anywhere but on TV. Sweetwater's own big hockey star. Tella's father. And no one knew. No one was going to know. She focused on Paul, glad he wasn't on his phone as he almost always was. Not long after, everyone had taken their forks and started hitting their cups. Louise looked ahead in time to see Palmer kissing Ames, his big hand holding her face, dark and tanned against her light brown hair. Ames had been a stunning bride. She had wanted simplicity and comfortableness over show and bling. The casual atmosphere of her wedding, combined with the smiling and jovial nature of the guests, told Louise that Ames had gotten her wish. Anyone who left the wedding would remember the radiance of the bride, or, more likely, how much in love Palmer and Ames seemed. Even though her heart hurt to think it would never be her, Louise was happy for her brother and Ames. And even more thrilled when they told her last night that Palmer had made a contact in L.A. who wanted to build an Olympic training facility for biathlon athletes just 45 minutes east of Sweetwater. More exciting was they wanted to hire Ames to be a coach. Everything was falling into place for Palmer and Ames, and Louise was thrilled for them. While her own life seemed to be about to explode, she heard a deep laugh. Familiar and beloved, it sent a buzzing shock down her spine. Even after all these years, she recognized his laugh. They'd laughed a lot together. Purposefully shoving any thoughts of Ty out of her head, not even allowing herself a glance around to see where he was, Louise focused on Paul. Whatever reason Ty was home, it wasn't for her. She wasn't under any grand delusions that he'd all of a sudden remembered about her or decided he couldn't live without her. Paul was her future. She was going to make the best of it. Hi, this is Jay, and thanks for listening. If you're ready for another great audiobook, here's one we think you might like. Or check out the playlist with all our latest releases. Don't forget to subscribe to Say With Jay, give this video a thumbs up, and tell us what you liked in the comments.